Dear speakers, excellencies, dear photo scholars, guests, partners and friends here in Hamburg and also virtually, um, welcome to Hamburg. Welcome to FOTA, the future of transatlantic relations. My name is Elizabeth Winter. I'm the program director, global markets and social justice at the Bundeskanzler Helmut Schmidt Stiftung. And um, I'm today's program chair. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the third FOTA conference, the future of transatlantic relations, on behalf of the Europa Kolleg Hamburg and the Bundeskanzler Helmut Schmidt Stiftung. Every two years, the Europa Kolleg Hamburg and the Bundeskanzler Helmut Schmidt Stiftung team up to organize a conference in a truly transatlantic spirit. Our aim is to bring together decision makers, academics, civil society and business representatives to, from both sides of the Atlantic to debate current trends and future scenarios of the transatlantic partnership. Today, we focus on the changing politics of transatlantic trade relations. Trade is a cornerstone of the transatlantic partnership. But as global supply chains are suffering from the after pains of the pandemic, Russia's attack on Ukraine and the intensing rivalry between the United States and China, international trade is no longer just about economic integration. The international dependencies around the uh, created by globalization have become political. Only this week, EU and US policymakers have met to find solutions to the looming transatlantic trade war, but without much su success. Today, we therefore want to discuss how the transatlantic trade partnership can contribute to the socio-economic transformation of the global economic system. Marlene Out will kick off the debate with a keynote about how transatlantic partners can embed human rights in their global value chains. And with more than 20 years of experience in the field of human rights and sustainable development, we could not have a better expert with us today. So let me just give you a br some highlights from her impressive professional life. Marlene is the director of the Stockholm office of the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law, where she heads the China program and, work and leads the work on business and human rights. From 2001 to 2009, she was based in Beijing as the director of the Royal Wallenbergs Institute there. She's also a member of the advisory boards of the Mercator Institute for China Studies in Berlin, and um, she will give the keynote lecture today to us. But before I hand over to her, let me say a few words of thanks. First of all, I would like to thank the teams of the Europa Kolleg Hamburg and the Bundeskanzler Helmut Schmidt Foundation for putting together this conference. I know about the many hours of hard work, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> and second, I would like to thank Hamburg's Ministry for Finance, Research, Equality and Districts for its generous funding, which makes this conference possible in the first place. <laughs> so without further ado, Marlene, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, I'm just going to get my things in order here, including my glasses, without which I can't see. <coughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and <coughs> thank you to the Bundeskanzler Helmut Schmidt Stiftung and the Europa, Europa Kolleg Hamburg, sorry, my, my German is, is not very good, uh, for the invitation to this wonderful conference. Uh, it's the first time I attend. Uh, it's my second time in Hamburg. It's lovely to be here. Uh, and it's a great honor to speak with you uh, today in the form of this brief keynote, and I really look forward to our discussions throughout the day. So my task is to set the tone and lay out some of the topics for today's discussion. The overall theme, uh, as Elizabeth uh, also uh, described uh, of our discussion today, is changing politics of transatlantic trade relations. Uh, 
there is renewed attention to the politics of international trade. Already more than 20 years ago, uh, the former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan cautioned at the World Economic Forum in Davos that without business respect for human rights, for decent labor and environmental standards, the global economy will be fragile and vulnerable. Vulnerable to the backlash from all the isms of our post-Cold War world. The isms are protectionism, populism, nationalism, ethnic chauvinism, fanaticism and terrorism. 20 years later, uh, Kofi Annan's words ring very true for our time. In these times of great power competition, US-China competition, of securitization and weaponization of trade, it's really good to have this opportunity today to go beyond simple binaries and try to tackle these issues in an integrated manner from different perspectives in all their complexity. As we all know in this room, there are no simple solutions or quick fixes to the complex, multifaceted, multidimensional dilemmas and difficult choices we are facing in our increasingly uh, multipolar global economy, including our dependencies and possible ethical trade-offs involved in doing business with countries with dismal human rights records. Our relationships with Russia and China is at the center of this debate. But if Russia was the storm, China is climate change in terms of how integrated and dependent we are on China in the global economy. Asia represents 60% of global GDP. The world is connected, interdependent, globalized, for good and for bad. So, the topic I have been asked to talk about today is a human face for trade, human rights and global trade. How can transatlantic partners in the public and private sectors embed human rights in their global supply chains? Some historical perspective is useful. While globalization is only a few decades old, trade and human rights have had a turbulent interaction for centuries. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, the East India Company relied on slave labor and exploitative labor practices. But global trade and business can and has also created job opportunities and lifted millions out of poverty. At the same time, forced labor, dispossession, and modern-day slavery practices continue to, to persist today. There's been some important progress in the past two decades. The UN Guiding Principles on Human Rights, adopted in 2011, have provided a common framework for all stakeholders in managing business-related human rights risks and impacts. Corporate respect for human rights has gained momentum and important supply chain and due diligence legislation is in the pipeline to ensure a level playing field and harmonization across international standards. At the same time, the 2022 Corporate Human Rights Benchmark published just a couple of weeks ago show that less than 5% of business involve affected stakeholders when doing their human rights due diligence and impact assessments. So while progress has been made, considerable challenges remain. These include making human rights a core element of green transitions and sustainable development strategies, the just transitions that we've been hearing about uh, a lot lately, including at the recent COP, and enhancing collective action to tackle systemic challenges. One way of doing that is, of course, uh, by doing human rights impact assessments of trade agreements. The three panels we have 
ahead of us today address three of these systemic and complex challenges, namely social inequality, technology, and digital transformations, and the need for climate action. In all these areas, we need an integrated approach to people and planet, addressing both human rights and the environment. And we need alliances between a multitude of actors across the Atlantic, but also, and importantly, beyond the transatlantic, involving the Global South. This issue uh, came to the fore just yesterday with the announcement by the US government of green subsidies, the IRA. I'm sure that will come up in discussion uh, later today. <laughs> Our American colleagues are laughing. Um, I want to highlight uh, three things that I think can be done to better embed human rights in global value chains. First of all, I think we need to do much more work on prevention and mitigation of negative human rights impacts instead of just putting out fires and dealing with issues in crisis mode, which is how most companies have dealt with human rights issues in both Russia and China and in other parts of the world, Myanmar. The examples are numerous. Beijing's treatment of the Uyghur Muslim minority in the Xinjiang region and the clampdown on the democracy movement in Hong Kong has received a lot of attention in the last couple of years, at least until Russia invaded Ukraine. But these are not new issues that suddenly transpired three years ago. These problems are of a systemic nature and the realities of China's political system and systemic human rights abuses and lack of rule of law have always been there, certainly during the last three decades that we have been doing uh, trade uh, and business in China and with China. I've spent uh, almost, well, 30 years actually, studying and working in and with China. Uh, so I've seen the wishful thinking underpinning Wandel durch Handel up close. Of course, it's easy now to call out the hubris and hypocrisy that underpinned uh, Wandel durch Handel. We certainly overestimated in Europe and in the US our power to change China and underestimated China's ambitions to shape the world and to shape global norms. We realize now that there's no automatic relationship between trade and democratization. But if we don't reflect properly on past mistakes and self-reflect, we are doomed to repeat them. We did allow rather narrow business interests to dictate our relationships with both China and Russia. Now politicians like to say that there's been an end of naivety, but now what? Calling out hypocrisy will not suffice. We need a positive agenda for change. Also, I think it's important to point out that exit, leaving China or leaving Russia or leaving Myanmar is not always the most responsible course of action. I think there's a false choice presented to us between doing business as usual or exiting uh, markets. I think there's a broad range of possible alternatives to improve business practices between business as usual and leaving these complicated and difficult markets. After all, the whole world is a rather complicated market. And besides, China is everywhere, not just over there. So business and governments need to have a global China strategy or even better, a global business and human rights strategy. Secondly, I believe that it is of central importance that we rescue the international human rights law system that we have built up since the Second World War. The past 20 years have seen not just China's rise as a global power, 
but also a gradual global democratic decline and erosion of the established international human rights system and norms. As we all know now, 1989 was not the end of history uh, for all of the world. In Beijing, the year 1989 had completely different connotations and historical significance. It was, as you know, the year of the brutal crackdown on demonstrators on Tiananmen Square. And while in 1948 we declared never again and adopted the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, mass atrocities have been happening over and over again in all parts of the world since. If we don't counter this erosion of hard-won universal values and standards that are now under attack, the next generation risk having fewer human rights protections than the generation before them. I have um, elaborated a bit on uh, 10 principles for a human rights-centered approach in a paper uh, published earlier this year uh, with the German uh, Marshall Fund. And I'll briefly touch upon these 10 principles uh, that I think uh, could better embed human rights in European and US, US uh, China policy, but also pro policy more broadly. So the first principle is that we need to base our policies on internationally agreed human rights standards and principles, including both economic and social and cultural rights, as well as civil and political rights. Unfortunately, since the Cold War, and still today, there's this division uh, Cold War division between economic social rights on the one hand and civil and political rights on the other hand with um, the, um, the West backing civil and political rights but not signing up to economic and social rights and parts of the global south and China uh, vice versa. We need to end that. Uh, all countries need to ratify all human rights. We also need to base our uh, policies and our engagement with China and other um, important but difficult markets on human rights language and not vague euphemisms. Thirdly, uh, Europe and the US uh, should lead by example uh, and back their words with action. Fourthly, we need to set specific and model uh, modest goals uh, and not engage in wishful thinking like Wandel durch Handel. Uh, and then uh, fifthly, we need coherence and coordination and all of government approach instead of working in silos uh, or in a com compartmentalized fashion where we do trade and business on Monday and then raise human rights on Tuesday. Uh, I think this needs to be integrated in a much uh, better way. And then principle number six, we need transparency and accountability. Seven, we need to do no harm, uh, first and foremost, before we consider doing good. I think that's a very important advice for business who want to do good and who especially like to um, uh, talk about doing good in their public uh, communication. Uh, I think first the basis needs to be to ensure that they do no human rights harm. And then principle eight, uh, we need to use our voice responsibly. Um, and if you want to uh, see a few um, cases where we have not used our voice very responsibly in relation to China. Uh, you can see in my paper, I have some examples both of, of German and, and uh, Swedish and other uh, business in, in my paper. But finally, the two principles are um, principle number nine, uh, human rights change can only happen from within China. That is very important. It's not our role to change China. Uh, we can support um, actors in China who are working very hard uh, to improve law and human rights protection in China. And then finally, we need to base our engagement on knowledge and empathy. 
I think uh, human rights leadership should be should be uh, curious, compassionate, and uh, courageous. That was the 10 principles. So that was point number two, 10 principles. And now I come to my uh, third and final point, uh, which is that in terms of our supply chain management and due diligence, uh, human rights due diligence, we need to take a much more collaborative and capacity building uh, approach and not just rely on policing supply chains with audits and punitive sanctions. The costs for sanctions and for a punitive approach often is borne by workers and local communities, not by the government or corporations. In our big, high-level geopolitical and geoeconomic debates, we often lose sight of the people that the debate is supposedly about. As my uh, very good friend, uh, who is a leader of um, a labor rights organization in China, said, um, audits leave workers in China with a feeling of being pandas at a zoo. Uh, when Western audit firms arrive and do, do an audit and, and then leave. So we need to move away or at least complement the auditing approach with a more collaborative and capacity building approach that empowers and builds capacity uh, among workers in, in China and, and beyond. Uh, as another very um, eloquent Chinese um, scholar expressed it. Uh, her name is uh, Yang Yang Tung. She said about China and the China debate in the US, she said, to the corporate elite, China is a market to be mined. To the security expert, China is a threat to be addressed. To the politicians and pundits, China is a problem to be solved. The lives and well-being of Chinese people affected by the policies, rhetoric, and business deals barely register in these discussions. So we need to place people again at the center of our debate on how we should deal with China and with Russia. And while I don't think we are seeing the end of globalization, as some people put it these days, I worry about a human decoupling uh, that's been accelerated also due to uh, COVID-19. About the growing um, binaries between us and them, about protectionism and racism. So that is why it is so crucial and important to put a human face at the center of trade. And on that note, I hand over to Elizabeth. <laughs> Thank you. So, thank you very much, Marlene. Maybe we could just have both a seat here. Um, here. So, um, let me start with um, a little bit of the procedure. So, I will have a conversation with Marlene, but I also will invite you to ask questions, of course, as well. So. Um, uh, please keep that in mind, uh, and then as soon as we start with the Q&A, raise your hands. And I also want to alert everyone that at <coughs> 11 a.m. we will have an emergency alert all over Germany. And I don't know what actually will happen, but it's just <laughs> that everyone knows of you that uh, don't be scared if all our phones and maybe also some sirens here, I don't know, will kick off immediately at 11 a.m., but this is also our signal that our panel is over. And <laughs> <laughs> very so clear yeah, signal. <laughs> very, very clear <laughs> signal, and uh, make sure that we are on time. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, thank you for your keynote, first of all. Um, and I wanted to um, actually start with what you said at the end, that you also agree that we see a deglobalization, um, but a decoupling um, of the people. And um, 
I, I found that very interesting because I think it's a huge debate whether we are um, actually see a deglobalization or not, or whether we see rather a, a reshaping of globalization, and that this actually gives us the chance to give trade and globalization a more human face. So um, my question would be: Do you, what are the factors where you see the deglobalization, and whether you think that this makes uh, maybe give us a chance to actually shape, uh, reshape trade? Mm. Well, I think, I, I don't think we're, uh, I think what we are seeing now is a realization that we've had some um, dependencies, some problematic dependencies uh, on both Russia and China. And that's where the debate is now to identify which crucial sectors uh, do we need to um, to diversify uh, and divest uh, away um, in order to, to uh, decrease our, our dependencies. Uh, but uh, I absolutely don't think we're seeing the end of, of globalization. I don't think we're seeing a, a full decoupling. Um, and uh, neither from, from China or from the US, there is uh, actually a desire to decouple fully. Uh, I think that's mainly political rhetoric, but in practice we are, uh, there are some uh, good aspects, some important aspects also uh, coming from our mutual dependencies. Uh, so, so I don't think we should sort of throw out the, the baby with the bathwater uh, now. Um, it is, however, very good that we are uh, doing some self-reflection uh, about our assumptions about the relationship between uh, trade and, and democracy and these things, and maybe um, having more realistic um, expectations, but also hopefully uh, it will also lead to some improvements yeah. uh, when it comes to how uh, we mitigate and prevent negative uh, human rights impacts. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you already mentioned it, that you would not advise to decouple, <coughs> actually, and that you also don't see it um, being the, the real strategy, um, even not in the United States. Um, but, of course, there's also the discussion about uh, French shoring, for instance, uh, that uh, global supply chains should rather shift um, to more... Um, to other democracies, and this also touches upon, I think, the other point you mentioned, um, uh, about this uh, um, confrontation and uh, the discussion about how the West or democracies and um, autocracies on the other side. So um, um, my interest would be, uh, my question, how, how can we then um, trade, still trade with countries where we see human rights um, uh, f uh, violations, even though we don't no longer accept the idea of Wandel durch Handel? Mm. Um, that's a lot of questions in, <laughs> in one question. Uh, yes, some businesses are uh, divesting. Uh, Apple is a recent example. Uh, they are moving some of their production uh, to um, yeah, uh, other countries than, than China. But I don't think um, it's possible to decouple from China in that sense, uh, because China is a central, is a global actor, uh, China is global, so uh, even if you decide to move uh, some production out of China, you will e encounter China also in other parts of the world. So as a business, you encounter China in Cambodia, you encounter China in Kenya, all, yeah. all across the world. Uh, so I think rather than focusing on sort of uh, running away from the problem or we need to uh, do proper human rights due diligence, mm -hmm. proper human rights impacts. And it is also important to recognize that there is a difference between um, state obligations to protect human rights uh, and to provide uh, proper legislation mm -hmm. uh, to regulate companies and then the corporate uh, responsibility to respect human rights within your value chains. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, 
Yeah, I, I think these different actors have different roles, different responsibilities, uh, and they need to um, uh, work much uh, better uh, together instead of, of uh, having this compartmentalized approach mm -hmm. that we've seen where uh, businesses have always said that, uh, you know, that's human rights, that's not, uh, we don't engage in politics, um, and that I think that uh, era has ended, uh, mm -hmm. definitely, because I think these days no business can or should be able to say that human rights is not uh, their business, um, although they still try, some, <laughs> some major <laughs> companies still try uh, to take that approach. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, after Russia invaded Ukraine, we've seen a lot of American firms, a lot of European firms, um, they're very actively pulling out of Russia mm. and being very political. So uh, do you see that this is also something that might have further consequences when it comes to human rights issues? Yeah, but I think we need to um, differentiate also a bit between different issues. Everything isn't human rights. I mean, the reason why some companies uh, left Russia wasn't because they were directly involved in, it was because there were sanctions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we shouldn't draw too many parallels between mm -hmm. Russia as an example for how we may uh, deal with, uh, with other countries. Um, I think each country has, uh, yeah, is each uh, country's situation is, is very unique. Mm -hmm. um, and I think businesses who and governments who try to um, adopt this approach of, of exiting markets to find somewhere else, to find a democratic country, will find that actually the world is very complex. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not static either, so the situation uh, can evolve and change very quickly, especially in post-conflict countries. Um, uh, so, businesses need to do continuous human rights due diligence to find out uh, whether uh, they are at risk of having a negative impact in, in their uh, operations. Yeah. And it will look very different for different sectors. Uh, and, uh, yeah, there can't be sort of a one-size-fits-all or one approach. Mm -hmm. um, the only... Um, I think uh, common guideline is to work uh, based on, on uh, the do no harm and human rights due diligence approach. And I think it's very good that we are putting in place now, uh, both in Europe and in the United States, um, uh, supply chain legislation and due diligence in, in order to harmonize our practices mm -hmm. and create a level playing field. I think that's uh, a very, very important development. Yeah. So do you think that there are um, additional measures transatlantic partners could take to, to really make sure that it's not a, a European legislation and a American legislation or so that you really have like a more broader international engagement and to support also businesses to actually um, be available to this, um, do this due diligence reports? Yeah. They can definitely, and that's exactly what the debate is about now when it comes to uh, recent legislation being developed within the EU, that it needs to align to the international standards. And that's also why I emphasized the international human rights mm -hmm. framework before, because we can't have a situation where uh, countries, like the same problem we've had with the whole audit industry, where, you know, uh, factories in, in whether it's in China or Bangladesh or, or India have had to deal with different standards and codes of conducts and auditing schemes from multiple uh, businesses. Yeah. So the same applies to legislation. We need to have uh, an alignment with the international standard. And the international standard now is the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and the OECD guidelines. So European and American legislation need to align with, with those standards. Mm -hmm. So would this also be an example for leading by practice or leading by example? 
or can you give us, because you mentioned it in your 10 um, uh, guidelines or your 10 yes. principles. So can you give us a concrete example how transatlantic partners could lead by example? Yeah, I think leadership has been pretty dismal mm. <laughs> uh, in, in recent years. Uh, I think one concrete example is also what I alluded to before, that uh, several countries in Europe and in the United States, uh, the United States, have not ratified all the core human rights conventions. I think that would be an extremely important first step to take in order to build your own credibility to ask other countries to comply with uh, international human rights uh, yeah. standards. So I think that's very basic. Of course, uh, Biden has undone some of the damage uh, done by Trump when mm -hmm. Trump pulled out of the Human Rights Council and of several other international uh, institutions and processes. Um, that's the op so, so I think... Uh, Trump's leadership, of course, as we all know, was the opposite of, of <laughs> leading by example. Mm -hmm. um, and it was also uh, rather um, pathetic to see how Xinjiang suddenly became a concern for Trump um, when, um, when the trade war started uh, really between uh, China and the US. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden then, uh, the time was ripe to, um, to impose sanctions. Uh, and human rights, in only a year before mm -hmm. uh, those sanctions were put in place, uh, Trump actually complimented uh, Xi Jinping for uh, how he had dealt with uh, the situation in Xinjiang. So mm -hmm. I think that type of, I mean, hypocrisy, mm -hmm. of course, is extremely problematic. But but uh, someone also said that uh, um, international relations in general is a form of organized hypocrisy. So, of course, I mean, we have rules and, of course, uh, the reality is complex and there will be a level of hypocrisy in mm -hmm. our international relations, but at least we can try and minimize, uh, minimize that yeah. uh, hypocrisy and, and try and minimize the application of double standards. Mm -hmm. So do you think that um, platforms like the TTC, the Transatlantic Trade and Technology uh, Partnership or Council, I mean, it also has uh, some of the working groups are focusing more on social issues as well and um, also on human rights. And in Germany, we already had the idea of might, might there be a chance of, for a TTIP 2.0, not calling it TTIP, of course, but doing another trade agreement that this, if this is um, really focusing more on sustainability issues, equi equity, that this might also be a chance of leading by example? Do you yes. see there any chances? Or do you think also that such a trade agreement might be leading by example, or wouldn't it be rather for um, third parties, countries in the global south, more like, okay, now you're again doing a transatlantic approach instead of a multilateral approach? Uh, I think both. <laughs> I, I think, I think yeah. it is an important uh, opportunity to include mm -hmm. uh, mandatory, uh, like to include a proper human rights impact assessment uh, in, in that uh, trade agreement. Um, but I also think it's really, really crucial that we don't, that we aren't seen to be ganging up against the rest. Mm -hmm. uh, and the rest is actually a, a, a very significant part of the world. Yeah. Uh, and much of the so-called global south are not going to choose between China and the US. Uh, they, you know, they base their international relations and their trade relations just like we on, on their own interests. Mm -hmm. And it's not in their interest to choose between uh, China and the US. Uh, they will, they have complex relationships and some countries really benefit from uh, Chinese investments, yeah. uh, China as a development partner in the Asian region. So I think, I, I don't think the, the rhetoric uh, or the approach that forcing the rest of the world to sort of uh, team up on, mm -hmm. on, on our side uh, against China or against, uh, uh, even against Russia is going to work that well. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
So um, I'm going to ask my last question, and then I will open up the floor to you. Um, but I mean, of course, you know about the discussion in Germany about the China strategy, a mm -hmm. new, na not a new, it's the first China strategy Germany is discussing right now. And you already mentioned that we um, actually need not a China strategy, but a global uh, human rights and business strategy. And I wonder um, what, uh, Yeah, what your comments or your remarks on the German discussion uh, would be, because I mean, when we think about um, many discussions on the um, investments by Costco, uh, the Chinese um, company here in Hamburg, for instance, mm -hmm. not even the German government had one approach within Europe with the European Union. We had not this one approach. Very European, many European partners were very surprised about the German decision. And our transatlantic partners were very surprised about the decision as well. Mm. So um, that pr makes me wonder, um, where are we actually with such a strategy? And is it even possible to have uh, such a global strategy? Mm. Um, I don't think it's possible to have a... I think it is possible and useful to have a German China strategy. Mm -hmm. I think it's more difficult to have a European China strategy. I think it's quite impossible to have a transatlantic China <laughs> strategy yeah. uh, because we, uh, as I said before, uh, all countries are very in a very different position and relationship uh, in, in relation to China. So between uh, the US and China, there is a great power competition and that really Uh, sets the tone for the U.S. Uh, for good reasons for the U.S. approach to China. Uh, but the U.S. approach to China is very different to almost all other countries in the world, uh, mm -hmm. including uh, the EU. So uh, I think we need to be realistic about that, that we all uh, depart from our own interests mm -hmm. and it is difficult to have a coordinated approach. Um, I understand that the China strategy, the German China strategy uh, is sort of phased to first this development of a security strategy and then a China strategy. So maybe an even better way of doing it would be to secure a security strategy and a business and human rights strategy mm -hmm. and then a China strategy and yeah, for that matter, mm -hmm. uh, also, also other country strategies. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's been, um, there's been a debate for Uh, well over five years in, in Europe about mm -hmm. our approach to China. Uh, I think it's been a really uh, useful and important debate. I think we have. Uh, the debate has at least improved. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much more realistic uh, now. And um, uh, I think we're also, after a couple of years, I think it was... Three years ago, uh, the European China strategy defined China as uh, mm -hmm. uh, like the, uh, an important uh, um, cooperation partner, competitor, mm -hmm. and systemic rival. Mm -hmm. I think next we need to um, not sort of work with China in, in that kind of siloed approach where we believe that, oh, on, on climate we should cooperate and then on Uh, technology, we should compete, and on human rights, we're systemic rivals. But I think these relationships actually go across all different sectors. So, yeah, um, yeah I th but I think it's good that the debate has become much more nuanced mm -hmm. uh, and, um, yeah, has definitely improved. I mean, if I compare my frustration, because I've been following the... China discussion for yeah for many many years uh, and to me it was always frustrating sitting in Sweden uh, where there was a lot of awareness about the challenge and potential threat that Russia posed but China was only seen as a golden economic opportunity and uh, you know an economic miracle and so uh, I think we we have become more Uh, nuanced and realistic, mm -hmm. uh, but it's now very important that that doesn't sort of the pendulum doesn't swing over to only seeing China as as a big threat, uh, mm -hmm. because that's yeah that would be equally problematic. Yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so are there any questions? Yeah. So you should get a microphone. I think it's already on its way, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for that excellent keynote. And I would like to address two, two points and to raise two questions. I think you outlined quite convincingly that the Handel durch Wandel hypocrisy is uh, way too simplistic and also very naive uh, because the relationship between trade and democracy is not a relationship that trade automatically will lead to democracy. I think also if we historically look at authoritarian countries. It might be to some extent the other way around. You know, if trade helps to stabilize the economy and the well being of the people and prosperity, you are, you know, rather face historically societies that people are willing to accept authoritarian regimes if they can, you know, live well, if they have job opportunities, if they have business opportunities. If you look, you know, in the history of the 20th century, also the 21st, that's the quite clear. But on the other side, I think there is also some kind of interaction between trade and democracy in the broader kind of, you know, normative power context, which also the European Union claims to be, because there is a strong belief that you can have some kind of, you know, regulatory instruments and also some kind of chain, exchange of ideas. But of course, you need to institutionalize that and make that work. And I think we were very way too naive to believe it would automatically happen and, and use that handle durch wandel thing as a kind of window dressing and therefore mm. I'd be interested if you know you could make handle durch wandel to some extent work if you have kind of you know standards parameters uh, goals you want to enforce also via trade policies and that brings me to the second question you raised which I also find so interesting in your different points you said that capacity building in the very countries is a very important issue capacity building for the workforce that they can claim their human rights standards and everything and that capacity building thing I think is sometimes uh, extremely problematic because you need quite a lot of money for that and you need trained people to really do that and, and from a global north perspective sometimes it might be very naive to believe okay we give you some money and then there is a chance for capacity building and you do it there and, mm -hmm. and that doesn't work because, you know, money might not be used in that way and there might be also a lack of other infrastructure. And I'd be very interested, you know, what kind of chances you see or maybe also what kind of responsibilities of the so-called global north of the highly industrialized countries to help to make that capacity building really possible also from perspective of a sufficient infrastructure. Thank you very much. Should we take one more? Or sure. Um, so you gave you had here a question, yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Also, but for the very inspiring uh, speech, listening to it, I couldn't help thinking. Also, you referring to Kofi Annan's warning 20 years ago, and the China scholar you quoted. If uh, the key problem you addressed with the decoupling of the people can be uh, helped when starting to listen to the right people. So my question would be, can the current climate with uh, Russia and Ukraine, with China and Taiwan, be a driving force to you know, more acceptance uh, from the people to listening to the truth and therefore drive a real change? Or do you think that the people uh, tend to forget such things if they are resolved rather easily and go back to normal? Thank you. We take one more and then you, you answer the question? Yes, or? yeah, let's do that. Okay. Yeah, let's take one more question and then we answer it, yeah. And then the signal will yeah. blast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. My name is Henry Ries and I'm currently Secretary General of the French uh, uh, NGO Energie Franco Monde. But m many decades ago, when I was studying here, I was on the board of the America Gesellschaft which was over there in a building uh, called the America House with a separate uh, American consul. Um, and the American Gesellschaft doesn't exist anymore. 
Um, so my question is, uh, do we do enough? Uh, enough? Um, I think you've heard it was the um, Finnish Prime Minister, Sanne Marin, who this week or last week said, without the Americans we cannot do it. And I think when I studied here there was a lot of anti-Americanism um, and I think the young politicians have also forgotten that it is difficult. Uh, Sandman is very young. She has understood. So, do we do en enough? I mean, Trump, forget it. Biden, fortunately, is so old in politics that he knows this. But from our side, do we know know how um, important America is? Probably here, yes. But do our politicians know that? Since uh, sweatshops and and these things became a a big uh, uh, issue. Um, so I am definitely not supportive of the narrative now going around that, you know, oh, everything failed, uh, engagement with China failed, uh, we should just uh, pack up and leave. I, I mean, I, that's not true. That's not true. Uh, a lot of things um, were also improved, uh, not because we improved them, but, but because we had, you know, important relationships, not just trade relationships and business relationships, but the 90s and the 2000s, uh, up until um, 10 years ago, uh, there was a lot of important uh, collaboration and exchange between China and the rest of the world, uh, including between academics, civil society organizations, and so forth. Um, so so I, I believe that trade can definitely contribute to that. Uh, I'm not against trade. Also, I'm not, I don't think all businesses are bad <laughs> at all. I've seen also a lot of, including German companies, who in you know a low-key way respect human rights on a daily basis in china and and try to contribute um, i also know wonderful uh, people in china who work very hard to improve uh, rule of law uh, in china and they still do that uh, we don't hear so much about it these days because under the current uh, general secretary uh, of the communist party xi jinping uh, there's been a, a, a very thorough closing down of civic space in China. So that brings me to sort of um, opportunities for capac capacity building that you were talking about. It has really become very difficult. Uh, there's, it's not uh, allowed to um, organize uh, as, you know, in labor rights organizations, environmental rights organizations, women's rights organizations that were actually flourishing um, in, in the, from the mid-1990s until the early 2000s have been uh, more or less closed down uh, in China. So, so I think one thing business can do is to raise the importance uh, for their uh, CSR for their business um, of rule of law and, and human rights. And actually, the, both the European Chamber of Commerce and the American Chamber of Commerce have um, spoken up uh, against uh, repressive legislation, uh, um, NGO legislation in China. So I think that's an example of, of things that uh, we can do. Uh, so I'm, I'm not in favor of, as I said before, throwing out the baby with, with the bathwater. Uh, I'm in favor of more nuanced approaches, more humble approaches also about our role. Um, and yeah. Um, and then <clears throat> your question on uh, uh, can sort of Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine, will that lead to uh, awareness? And um, can you co yeah, repeat your question, please?
Do you mean people here in Europe or in China or more generally? Yeah, no, I, I think um, in general, if I speak just for Sweden <laughs> uh, and maybe a little bit for China as well, because I, I work there so much. Oh, here oh, we go. Okay, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It wasn't I that don't know bad. how long. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's okay. So let's see how long it goes. <laughs> Okay, interesting. <laughs> oh yeah, we have phone is also ringing. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Wow. That's uh <laughs> Okay, and when will it stop? Pretty impressive. Uh, yeah. Oh, it stops if you Yeah. Oh yeah. Here we go. <coughs> <laughs> yeah. Chimney arrives in the 21st century. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> so <laughs> but do, do you think it's also the building or is it only the phones we can hear it's, it's hard to tell isn't yeah, it yeah it's very hard to tell but I think it's calming down yeah <coughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, it could be over. Now everyone is alerted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we should wrap up. As yeah, well. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but so I can just say two mm -hmm. words and then yeah. we can. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, yeah, mine said Miriam. So it seems that everyone has to uh, somehow do something on the phone so that they stop. So maybe everyone should check uh, his or her phone yeah. and make sure that they stop making <coughs> these noises. <laughs> oh, <laughs> silence. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, Malene will just wrap yes, up. Yes, I'll um, just say <laughs> a, a few words in response to these two gentlemen's questions. Um, I think, yes, there is, uh, you know, increased awareness uh, and, and about uh, the vulnerabilities of our democracies and the need to build uh, democratic resilience. Uh, but I think our perspectives on um, Russia's invasion in Ukraine and our perspectives on uh, China's uh, potential or existing aggressions uh, in the Taiwan Strait really differ from where you sit in the world. Uh, so, of course, in Sweden, we are very aware now about uh, Russia and about the importance of, of the United States. Uh, but in uh, uh, Indonesia or India, I mean, you view these conflicts in a very different way. Uh, and we don't have time to go into detail, but I, I find it absolutely essential and very interesting to travel and to speak with policymakers in Singapore, in Kenya. Uh, to find out how they view the world, uh, because we, we do have a very, sometimes a very provincial perspective or, or Europe-centric perspective uh, here. Uh, so I think that is important. But I think if I should speak on a sort of in a very general world terms, I think, yes, uh, it has done something with um, uh, the world's population in general. Uh, and and created awareness about um, human rights and, and democracy and the importance of rule of law and the importance of the established international order. Uh, but even that term, the rules-based order and the liberal order, I mean, other parts of the world have a very different perspective on that. So I think that is also very important to realize. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you very much. And I think this also hints a little bit on the point that you said that change can only come from within as well. And um, it might be interesting also to see how when we talk about transatlantic relations, it's not just about like how can we cooperate, but also uh, support others and work together with other partners. And um, so I think that's uh, a good start for the day. And um, to continue the discussion in the three panels we are um, having today. And so I will just hand over to the first panel on uh, transatlantic trade and social inequality. And uh, thank you very much, Marlene. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Free choice of chairs, sir. Okay. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all to the first panel of the 2022 FOTA conference, which will deal with issues of good trade policy and how to combine economic and social challenges. But first to our guests here today, and um, before I introduce our two guests here on the panel today, um, I have to say that unfortunately, Laurie Wallach and Svenja Hahn were not able to join us today because of flight problems and illness. Um, but the more uh, happy I am that um, I may warmly welcome Matthew Das. He's a visiting scholar at Carnegie Endowment for International uh, Peace, and he was president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace and a senior policy analysis, uh, analyst um, at the Center for American Progress. Welcome, Matthew. Matthew. Also, I want to warmly welcome Madita Stanke Erdmann. She is policy advisor for advocacy and dialogue of the Women's Seven Project team and in the National Council of German Women's Organizations. My name is Andreas Grimmel, and I'm research director at the Europa Kolleg Hamburg Institute for European Integration. And I would like to start by uh, talking about the title of our panel actually first, because it links two things that seem to be at least classically, I would say, rather opposed to each other. Um, at least economics and trade on the one hand, and social equality, fairness, inclusiveness, distributive justice, and social values, other social values, on the other hand, have not always been two sides of the same coin, I would say, <laughs> in international relations and also not in transnational, uh, transatlantic politics so far. Um, so my question, and I would like to address this question in a brief opening round, so to speak, to, to both our panelists here, because I'm curious to hear about your different perspectives on the topic. My question is, if both economic trade on the one side, social values on the other side, can be reconciled with each other, how could this be achieved? And which actors, actors structures, um, uh, will play a major role here. Matt, maybe you want to start? Sure, thank you. First, let me just say thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's a great privilege. Um, I also want to just uh, thank Malene for the great remarks just now. I thought there was, there was so much in there, and some of which I would very much like to uh, uh, respond to. But to, to address your question first, I think, Yes, in some ways, those two things, trade versus values, trade versus social equality, have been at odds, but that's in large part because I think we have accepted that premise, which is a, um, you know, a kind of international uh, trade and system of economics and institutions that were built um, uh, effectively to insulate global trade from democracy, uh, from populism, from social needs. Um, now, there are some decent reasons for that. I mean, obviously, democracy is messy, um, um, as we are, we are finding out. But also, I mean, democracy, as we all understand, is the way that people kind of express their values and their needs and, and, and build governments that are responsive to those needs. So I think um, we found out, and there have been warnings all along the way, 
Uh, I think that this understanding of keeping you know, trade and economics isolated or insulated uh, from the popular will uh, was not working out. I think we have failed uh, to acknowledge those warnings. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, when I'm looking, if I'm, you know, just speaking as an American, um, we are still very much working out, and I know our colleagues um, across the ocean and elsewhere are still watching us work out the, the kind of implications of 2016. Um, but I think 2016 was important in a lot of ways because it really showed that so many of the basic assumptions and what was, you know, called the shared consensus around a whole bunch of areas of policy um, were actually not shared by the American people. Um, so I think with regard to what Malene said, you know, not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, um, I agree, but we are still very much in the process of determining what is baby and what is bathwater. Um, you know, what parts of this international system we want to preserve, for example, can international law with regard to human rights norms, a very important, I think, um, uh, set of norms that, um, you know, U.S. and Europeans and others work to set up in the, in the wake of World War II. There are other things that I, I don't think should be preserved, like the insulation of <laughs> global trade from the popular will. Um, so I think kind of integrating these two things um, and, and not seeing them as mutually exclusive or in kind of competition um, is really part of the project we face. Matita, what, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me today and also for inviting the Women 7 Project. Maybe a couple of words what the Women 7 Project is before I start answering your question. Um, the project has been accompanying the G7 presidency of the German government over the last year as a so-called engagement group, and it's been a dialogue with a lot of activists, feminists, and women's political activists um, from all over the world, so not, not just from G7 countries, but also from um, other countries, and um, we've debated heavily um, these questions that you were actually you just actually just raised um, with with the activists from all over the world over the last year obviously you know looking at the world um, as it is at the moment right it's um, we're looking at multiple crises where we don't really know where to start to tackle all of these crises um, and there the question of does trade um, come in as a as a handy or, or necessary tool to 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 you know um, to to ensure social equality or does it not as something that from a feminist perspective or a women's political perspective is a really um, crucial one I would say because um, we all know that um, social equality and social inequality especially affects women right especially affects. Uh, marginalized communities all over the world. There's a huge dif difference between um, what, w you know, for looking at it from a so-called Western perspective. I, uh, you know, all of these words are hev heavily loaded with, with, with meaning, but I'm just going to use them now. So Western or Eurocentric perspectives, um, and then also looking at it from a so-called Global South perspective, which I obviously can't do because of my positionality. Um, but I think what is important is to understand that there are approaches to trade and to economic cooperation that can be inclusive. It just requires us to transform economies massively, also with looking at what crises we're, we're facing at the moment. Um, and this does not only entail the war on Ukraine right now, but it entails the climate crisis, the pandemic, um, biodiversity crisis and so on and so on. I think there's a lot, a lot to say about that. Um, but I think the, the positive thing here, which I would like to underline is that with, so, so social, social equality can be achieved through trade probably, but we need to transform the system heavily um, to do so. Yeah, thank you very much for, for these uh, initial impressions. Um, I would like now to put a spotlight on or to, to zoom in, so to speak, on three major transatlantic trade initiatives of the last year. First, Build Back Better World, B3W mm -hmm. by the G7 or Joe Biden's um, idea of Build Back Better. The Global Gateway, that's the second one of the European Union and the Trade and Technology Council, TTC. Um, 
from my perspective, all three of these, all three seem to be part of a new global governance architecture in a way that aim to address also social and human rights standards as well, tr trying to bring those in explicitly. And from your perspective, Matt, how do these three models differ from each other on one side with regards to addressing socio-economic challenges and what can we also expect from these different mm. initiatives? Yeah, well, I think, you know, in turn, I appreciate you zooming out here, but I think to answer the question, I need to zoom in a little bit on understanding, at least from the U.S. perspective, what Biden feels he has to do with foreign policy. And here it gives me an opportunity to plug a, a, a report that came from my organization. Before I joined them, I just joined Carnegie about a month ago. Um, but in uh, 2019 and 2020, the Carnegie Endowment put out a series of reports called Foreign Policy for the Middle Class, which was in part spurred on by the events of 2016, the understanding that American foreign policy, the practice of American foreign policy, security policy, trade policy had become disconnected from the lived reality of many Americans. Many Americans had very deep and legitimate questions about whether these approaches were benefiting them and their communities. They see um, deindustrialized communities. They see communities that were dealing with crime, dealing with drug abuse. They saw jobs fleeing the country, traveling abroad. Um, I think this is understood, but I think what was less understood is that how angry a lot of Americans were at the failures, what they saw quite, I think, quite understandably and reasonably of their fail the failure of their government uh, to, deliver, to deliver on promises. So that report went into um, communities, you know, outside the Beltway, outside the coasts, in a number of places inside the United States to do, a no do surveys with Americans about how they perceived their relationship to foreign policy. Um, and I think if you look at the, you know, when, when President Biden or President-elect Biden announced his first picks of foreign policy nominees, including Secretary of Defense and State and National Security Advisor, um, Jake Sullivan, who is now the National Security Advisor, um, who was also played a key part in these reports at Carnegie, laid this all out. This is the kind of foundational theory of the Biden administration's approach to foreign policy, is that everything they have to do, everything they do, every decision that is taken in some way needs to be justified in terms of this is going to deliver for the American people. This is benefiting American communities. Um, and if you are saying that, well, that sounds like America first a little, you're not wrong. Um, I think, you know, I think Trump quite rightly himself recognized and exploited this same discontent. Um, in a similar way, uh, my former boss, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, did as well. Now, in my view, I think Senator Sanders offered a much more unifying and positive and constructive way of addressing these concerns versus Trump's much more destructive and divisive way. But I think to Biden's credit and to his team's credit, they understood that this divide is very real. So to get to your question, these series of agreements, you know, we have Build Back Better, the Build Back Better in the United States. Um, that bill was passed in the House. It did not pass in the Senate. Portions of it were included in the IRA, which I'm sure uh, we're going to talk to at some point on this panel, given some of the concerns about it that have been raised uh, between the U.S. And, and, and EU over the past weeks. Um, but I think the way to understand each of these different initiatives, um, at least from the, from the U.S. perspective, is you have an administration that is very clearly deeply committed to America's continuing global role and particularly to the transatlantic relationship. They continue to understand that it is foundational <laughs> to kind of our shared global security concept um, while at the same time looking for opportunities um, to bring in the global south to a much more prominent role, not just around the table but in the kitchen. And I do want to make that distinction too. It's one thing to kind of allow people to partake of the food that you have cooked, but I think that is not even enough. I mean, what we're hearing from colleagues um, in, so, in some of these other countries, particularly in the Global South, is that they're no longer satisfied in simply participating within a set of rules that, that have been determined by the victors of World War II. And they have put it very explicitly in those terms, that they very much want to be engaged in writing, reforming those rules for the future. And so I think in, in some ways, the, you know, the three, the three initiatives you mentioned need to be understood in those terms as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now, interestingly, um, with the three models, Build Back Better, Global Gateway, Trade and Technology Council, different perspectives have been formulated, while at the same time, I would say the question arises, 
how they can coexist and maybe also how they can be interlinked with each other. And of course, mm -hmm. also China's Belt and Road Initiative mm -hmm. is also in the room, and uh, right. we heard a lot about uh, about that as well. And, and mm -hmm. some of these initiatives are reactions on mm -hmm. China's Belt and Road Initiatives, which is already in the field since right. 2013. Um, Matthew, an another question uh, back to put it another way. Isn't the multiplicity of different models also a danger in a way, especially since those models have a rather regional or maybe interregional, if we talk about transatlantic relations, and um, also keep in mind that China has another project um, 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 invented uh, in, in, in the field. If these regional or interregional models um, um, couldn't this be a problem um, because um, this also means less multilateral action and problem solving mm -hmm. in a way? I mean, aren't we in an era where yeah. we, we're going back to interregionalism or regionalism and a very regional thinking and um, that this substitutes in a way mm -hmm. the more multilateral agenda that we, we had a couple of yeah. years or one or two decades ago? Right. No, it's a very good question. A very, um, and I think the answer is probably yes, but I think this is not new. I think we've had a number of kind of overlapping multilateral organizations, whether it's the WTO, you know, you know the World Bank, IMF, the UN, um, that, you know, whose actual functions and decisions in some ways um, were at odds with each other. Um, I think, you know, the administration is committed to UN reform. Clearly, they've re-engaged in a whole, you know, bunch of committees, the UN Human Rights Committee uh, among them. But I think they also recognize that there's a role for these smaller regional arrangements. The road is going to be bumpy, as we all found out during AUKUS, for example. Um, I know that they are they're putting good effort into trying to manage those bumps. Um, but they also, I mean, their theory of the case is that, you know, strengthening at every possible level um, the U.S.'s, you know, multilateral and regional um, um, kind of interactions is, is beneficial. Okay. Madita, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has recently said that the EU's global gateway strategy, and I want to, to put a focus on, on, on that now, is a way to redesign, I, I quote here, to redesign how we connect the world to build forward better. And this is also, I think, uh, a world play with uh, build back better world, maybe in a way, maybe the European version of it. Um, Madita, what chances do you currently see to implement such a program, uh, the global gateway strategy, um, uh, and where do you see the most, significant, pr the most signif significant problems in implementing this global gateway strategy? Well, um, as, you know, as, as civil society, it's always, um, the role of civil, civil society is always to ask and question um, what do these initiatives, what do these ideas, what do they entail, right? Um, looking at the, you know, if we, if we look at, at um, initiatives like those or the three ones that you mentioned before um, in this G7 context, I think um, it's important to understand that um, we, we look at those things on, on the one hand from a national perspective, from a multilateral perspective, um, but also from a people's perspective, right? Um, and I think what is what is what was important f for 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 the organization that I that I represent here today is to understand what are they trying to you know what 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 will come out of it in terms of bettering the situation of people as I said before um, that have come out of crises or are still entangled with crises and are really. Um, you know, have, have to work hard and have to, um, and are, are kind of hitting their, their, the, the limits of what they can actually do to, to sustain a living, right? Um, and then if we look at the publications that have been put out by the G7 where it says that um, the G7 are going to focus or going to focus their trade policies, their development policies, their foreign policies in a feminist spirit, then obviously we, we look at this and sit there and so what are, how are you going to fill that with content, right? What does that mean? We've been talking about women's economic empowerment for a really, really long time and now all of a sudden it's about feminist policies? What, what does that mean, right? 
if we look at the, the you, were, you were mentioning the, um, the, the so-called uh, Silk Road Initiative, right, that's put forward by the, the Belt and Road one from, by China. Um, look at what the G7 have done now. They've, they're investing $600 billion into an infrastructure initiative, which is obviously a counter project to that, right? And for, for civil society, for women, civil society, it's important, where does that, that money go to, right? It, we, we've been advocating for a 2% a, a of a country's GDP to go into social infrastructure. But there's nothing about that, right? There's, 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 so what, 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 I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is that as, as long as these initiatives, the ones that you mentioned before, the, the, the European Union one and so on, as long as they don't keep the pe people's needs in mind, right, if they, as long as they're not needs-based, and as long as they don't understand that trade policies have intersectional impact and affect people intersectionally in terms of differently, right, and that they reproduce social inequalities on a as of now, the, how the world is structured right now, um, in s global supply chains, but also through these initiatives themselves, I don't see a lot of chance for, for these, these initiatives to make significant change in terms of how that affects people on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Because we have to understand that these policies, they affect people on the ground. It's not just something that, the, you know, and then on the other hand, these treaties or some of the initiatives, they're not binding, right? That, that's one of the other issues. A lot of these agreements, um, either they're not implemented, like the ILO um, C-190 against violence at the, in the workplace, or um, the CEDAW initiative, for example, um, against, you know, all discrimination against women. They're out there, we have the tools, right? But they're not being um, implemented in a way that we can hold countries, and we're just talking about government actors right now, that we can hold them accountable. We haven't really touched upon private or corporate actors yet, right? Which we might do in a bit, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you very much. And that's very interesting, and I understand that you're quite skeptic about these, these initiatives. And mm, let me uh, quote one, one word, one term that shows up over and over again, um, especially also in what the European Union representatives are saying, is the term or the, the concept of a level playing field. Level playing field is, should be established, right? And um, which means basically to ensure equal and fair conditions of competition for all participants of a global market or a local market uh, embedded in a global uh, trade architecture. Um, Madita, what do you think would be important then to ensure such a level and fair playing field for all market participants and to establish something like more social equality? I mean, if we, yeah, um, could, 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 I mean, uh, what would be important from your point um, of view to, 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 to improve these initiatives in a way? Uh, and in your opinion, what concrete measures would have to be taken um, by the European Union, by the G7, um, yeah, by, by transatlantic partnerships to, to do so, to improve this? Um, yeah, sure, uh, thanks for the question. Um, a network of civil society organizations um, in Germany has recently published a, a paper on um, how to approach a feminist foreign policy, um, which un under which trade policies also run. Um, and they've kind of defined five points um, on how policies could be transformed in order for them to be um, less harmful or, you know, doing good. Um, I think, first of all, um, that entails putting human security at the center of these policies, right? That the humans who are responsible for uh, either products or whatever is being produced, the things that are traded, basically, um, that they are in the center. Then we need fair wages, we need minimum wages, and we need wages that are where people, you know, th which also allows people to, to, um, to join unions, for example, right? Unions are, I think, a, a really important part of this. Decent work needs to be amplified, and there needs to be an acknowledgement of underpaid work and also unpaid care work. I think this is very important when we look at the pandemic. Um, and then the other thing, the fifth point, is that caretaking and care infrastructures um, have to be of high quality. Um, and, you know, we, when we talk about this, so how does that have to do anything with um, 
with trade, right? It has a lot to do with trade, especially when we look at multinational corporations who are responsible for applying either through outsourcing or through secondary and third parties, uh, partners um, in other countries, that they can be held accountable for that, right? Um, if we look at the textile industry, for example, um, there's heavy exploitation taking place right now. Supply chains need to um, be it, it needs to be, you know, people or actors have to be held accountable at every stage. And I think if we follow these five points, which are, I know, very hard to implement, right? I think this could, this could, this could at least serve for 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 a transformative approach to it. So, I would say um, that these are some some core points. Um, but maybe my fellow panelists would like to yeah, add yeah, something no, to I, that. I, just, yeah. I, I only wanted to just expand a little bit and agree wholeheartedly with the point about. Um, you know, unpaid for, uh, unpaid work like care and just I think basic healthcare education. Some of these broader kind of social benefits that I think got a, a lot of our colleagues in Europe um, take for granted because they should because this is what I think a modern society can and should provide for its people. And yet my country cannot. So when we talk about a level playing field. I think it is, you know, we often, that's often used, okay, who are we taxing, how much tax, how much investments and incentives are created for these multinational, you know, corporations to enable them to continue to make billions of dollars. But um, I think it needs to be a much broader conception of what we are talking about to include what does that mean for workers and communities, right? In the United States, you know, we have a healthcare system where, you know, you are essentially chained to your employer for the priv privilege of continuing to pay thousands of dollars in co-pays or, or deductibles or whatever. Uh, we have a system in which, you know, a, a family can go into lifelong medical debt simply by a woman having a baby, let alone, for, let alone a very serious illness um, or, or even a child getting into an accident. I mean, it's, it's, it's outrageous. Um, you know, and just to go a step deeper, um, and you know, I think since we are talking about, you know, the, the theme of the, of the conference here is the politics of trade policy. Um, I think this, all of this really goes to what I started saying at the beginning, is just a sense, a growing sense, um, not just among Americans, uh, I think in, in a lot of communities, but again, from a U.S. perspective, um, is just the idea that, you know, these, these policies have been sold to us year after decade after decade that rising tide lifts all boats, and yet, and yet, th what is happening in my community? What is happening, you know, my, you know, my uncle works his whole, um, you know, speaking personally here, my uncle has driven a truck for his entire career. Um, he's finally having to retire just because he's no longer physically capable of doing it. And he's struggled to put food on the table for his entire career. Um, you know, this is, this is, I think, someone who, the, you know, the, the, the American promise has not been kept. Expand that, multiply that by many millions, and I think you start to understand um, what the concerns are that are driving this. But so just kind of to draw it back, I think, you know, we have to take into account what, what services are and are not being provided to the labor force. What are they being expected to do for free? Um, and that includes time spent on the phone with the health insurance company uh, to try and get the basic promised care. Um, because at some level, and again, this is something that is, I think, very much um, uh, an, an American problem. Um, you know, if we are, you know, I, one thing I'll add here about to the way the, the Biden administration has approached foreign policy is that they have elevated global anti-corruption to a kind of a core national security priority. But my kind of argument to them has and continues to be that unless we focus on America's domestic political corruption, um, which is to say the way we run our politics, we're really only taking a half step toward really confronting some of this, which is, you know, you have huge donor corporations that essentially continue to enjoy massive influence over our politics. And that has, um, I think, an, uh, enormous implications for the US-EU trade relations um, and for our relations with the rest of the world. I think that's a very interesting point because it, um, it goes directly to the question of how important is political will as well. Eh? Mm -hmm. So. Um, isn't there also the possibility that we create more and more forums? And I mean, that's already positive, yeah. I would say, that we're addressing these questions, that we're talking about these questions, that we're able to, to, to uh, find consent mm -hmm. on, on, on such questions and build institutions. But um, isn't the core of the problem, to put it differently, rather a lack 
of political will, will to really implement something like trade for good or trading for yeah. good uh, instead of um, uh, a lack of suitable structures. So my impression is that we create more and more structures that are quite nice. Uh, it's, it's all very nice to read. Uh, yeah. The, the um, TTC is yeah. nice to read. Um, it's also the Build Back Better World <laughs> strategy. Yeah. It's all very nice to right. read, right? right. But isn't the core problem not a lack of political and maybe also economic will uh, to implement these things? Because, I mean, I think there are two rationalities clashing here with, with each other. Uh, the economic rational and the political rational also maybe b being able to take on board social values, right? But isn't the problem a lack of political will? What would you say, Martin? Then I would say it's it's maybe as well. the lack of political will or another way of saying it, the lack of, you know, political possibility because our politics is so constrained right now. I mean, let's just look at some of, you know, I think it's important that, you know, the U.S. Congress working with the administration was finally able to deliver a set of, of bills. I mean, initially coming in, Biden passed the, you know, the rescue plan, you know, COVID, dealing with COVID. Eventually in, in August, they finally were able to deliver um, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, but even that, was a fraction <laughs> of what was initially proposed. Um, and I think, you know, the focus was all on people like Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema in the Democratic Party, finally bringing them around to pass uh, these bills through a very kind of uh, arcane and complicated process in the Senate because our, our Congress is, is needlessly complicated. But let's not forget that the Republican Party was entirely opposed to any of this stuff. You know, and, and, and the reason for that is going back to what I was just saying before. I mean, these, so many of these leaders um, uh, and members are, are, are dominated by corporate interests. So breaking through that and actually enabling um, our elected leaders to mobilize around what I think are extremely popular policies um, is going to, you know, require dealing with some of these, this core problem of, I think, uh, political influence uh, and political corruption. Very much. Madita, what's your opinion on that? I would, yeah, I, I think the, the point of political will is an important one. Um, I would like to pull in the issue of climate change and or the climate crisis and, you know, achieving climate justice um, here. If we look at what measurements are being taken to either, um, you know, s slow down climate change or um, either, you know, just to slow down climate change, I'd say that I think progress is very slow. I think political will for that is really slow. And that obviously also relates to the structural issues of how our world is organized at the moment. Um, over the last years through globalization, um, trade, economic, um, you know, just uh, economics in themselves have been liberalized heavily, right? Um, and that that's been at the, the the disadvantage of of a lot of um, of a lot of groups of society. Um, but but those are not really taken into account, right? And if we look at how how desperate all of a sudden we all got when COVID hit us, right? There was there was a lot of political pressure there. There was a lot of economic and fiscal pressure pressure as well to actually put certain measures into place, which were not perfect. You know, we can spend hours and hours talking about how those measures um, actually affected people. Um, but I think what, what it shows is that if the pressure is high enough, you know, there, there, there is pol not only political will, there is political necessity to act, right? And I think this is something that we're com missing completely when looking at, at climate justice, for example. Um, so I think yes, political will, but also let's you know let's not forget what Matt was just saying. Where, what, what kind of structures are we in, right? If we look at the European Union, and certain policy fields that also relate to trade and 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 and, and, and production, um, we, we we're kind of in a deadlock in some in some um, in, in some fields, right? Um, so if we only look at that political system in itself, then we look at the national ones and so on, and. Um, it's, I, th I think there's a, what we need is a democratization of trade policies, basically, you know, making them, um, I don't know, approachable or at least um, participatory in their nature. Um, and then that might actually uh, get us somewhere where, where political pressure is higher than it is right now. Because these are, I think Matt was saying this before, that there's, there's a, 
there's the tendency to dislocate or to, to dislodge ec economics from politics, right? Um, kind of this neoliberal idea that those two things do not, do not relate to one another. But I think if we shift that back into to that, to, to making it more political or politicize it again, the pressure might, might get higher and actually change might, or transformation might actually come, come around. But I always think of, you know, if we, if we debate, is there political will or not? I think there are, there are examples that show us where we're not acting, mm -hmm. where we're lazy, mm -hmm. where we don't care maybe also care th about the effects that certain crises have on other people's lives, all, right? From a Eurocentric or a Western perspective. Um, and I think this, yeah, this, it's a complex issue, but I, I always wanna, 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 wanna highlight the structures that we're in um, from, from our organization's perspective. That's patriarchy, that's capitalism, and it's also, um, colonial structures or neo-colonial structures that we're facing. So I think this is, yeah, this is just something that we need to keep in mind. Yeah. L let me try to, to um, look for a constructive twist in all that. I see sure. that the, the, we the perspectives are... No, 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 I'm not saying that. Um, but, but what role could non-governmental organizations, social initiatives, and maybe also association, interest groups, um, play in this, and play in this on the ground, uh, locally, in implementing more global justice, maybe also building up pressure. Um, how can they do this? Where can we tackle those problems that you're, uh, you, that you, that you're um, um, announcing here, or um, putting your finger on here? And what role do they have to play within the framework, for example, of these initiatives that we have been, been talking about, Global Gateway, uh, Build Back Better World, um, for, for those to be a success? Uh, how, can we, how can we deal with these, with these critical issues that, yeah. that you, I think, rightly put your, your finger on? Uh, Matita, maybe you want to start. Yeah. Um, well, I think dialogue is really important. I think, you know, going to making space, politically making space for um, civil society unions and so on and so on to being part, you know, to be part of the conversation. If you open those doors, if you open those windows, I think there's a lot of space um, for, for perspectives, for the needs, for understanding who's affected by what, right? And I know it's it's uncomfortable. It's a very complex. That's the problem. You know, if you get more voices into the room, it gets more complicated. I think the, the equation is pretty simple. But I think that the role of civil society, first of all, civil society needs to be strengthened, right? Because we see with, be it gender backlash or um, anti-feminist movements, um, racism going up, um, all of these things, I think we see that the space for civil society actors is actually going back or getting smaller. Um, and, but if, we, if, if, there's, if there's enough willingness, now I'm back at the political will point, um, to, to create space and to open dialogue, I think we were, we're already, you know, set quite well, I would say, but there's not, there's not enough dialogue, right? And I'm not only talking about high level political dialogue like that, that the Women's Seven Project has been doing right now, you know, talking to ministries and with the German government, um, and then it being, being part of this very, um, of this G7 process, but it's also about, um, for example, um, I don't know, um, going to to countries where uh, specific produce is produced, right? Um, how do how do workers or how what what do they need? What do they want, basically, in order for their their lives to be bettered? Um, and I think if we if we factor those in and then you know feed those back into the policy, we have a lot of best practice examples on how this could work, right? It's not like it's, this is not working. There just needs to be the room. Um, and again, I was talking about this before, a democratization of, of these policies. Um, also maybe in, you know, th that, 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 and I think the, um, there are some, some, some fields in which this is being done better than in others. If we look at the, the whole production of military goods of 
small arms, rifles, and all of, all of that stuff, right? There's, there's basically no dialogue about this, and there's also nothing, there's, there, there are very small mechanisms to hold actors accountable, actually, on what, what they're doing. So, yeah, I would say dialogue opening up is one point of many that we, you know, that civil society should be doing, yeah. Matt. Yeah, I would just, I mean, I would add to that, and you know, here I'm just to acknowledge how I, how I miss having my, my friend Lori Wallach, um, because she's be really been at the center of so much of this work in Washington for a very long time, and um, you know, I worked closely with her and her coalition while I was in the Senate. But I would just say, I mean, so a lot of this dialogue and, and effort at coordination, mobilization, has been going on for quite some time. Um, here I would refer back to the, you know, the, the, the global justice movement of late 90s and early 2000s. Um, you know, which kicked off, at least in the global north in 1999, in no November 1999 in Seattle with the protests against the WTO, but that was not as much a start of something as it was a global south driven movement finally breaking through in the global north. This is what I'm referring to when I talk about the warnings that have been sent up time and time again for decades about the actual impacts of some of these decisions that have been made in these boardrooms and conference spaces over many years um, from, by the people who've been experiencing their impacts most acutely and negatively. Um, those conversations has, have, have continued to go on, but I also s think it's, it's worth noting that these same concerns show up you know, time after time since then. Whether we're talking about the, um, you know, the Arab awakening, I don't want to characterize it as simply an anti-corruption movement, but let's remember that movement kicked off with a fruit vendor in Tunisia who was angry about corruption. You know, Mohamed Bazizi set himself on fire to protest the petty corruption that he dealt with, but we were talking about what spread across that region was an anger at elite capture, at about elite self-dealing, about the fact that these governments were simply not delivering for their own people. Um, we saw an aspect of this certainly in the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, in 2011. Um, we can, there was a wave of global protest happening in 2019 and 2020 from Argentina to Chile to Haiti to you know, Lebanon to Iraq to Hong Kong, literally around the world. So many of these protesters, yes, there were specific local drivers for these protest movements, but there were a, a core set of very shared demands around corruption, about lack of accountability, about government simply failing to deliver. Um, you know, I think we, we participated in some of this, and again, this is something I worked with Lori on, which was, you know, the Global South Driven Movement for the TRIPS waiver at the WTO about vaccines on, you know, li temporary lifting patents to enable the production um, of generic vaccines, um, mainly in the Global South. We finally were able to, and again, something Senator Sanders took the lead on from the Senate, finally got the Biden administration to endorse it, at least in theory. Um, unfortunately, in the year and a half since they came out in support of it, they've, there's been very little movement on that in the WTO, again, because these systems are not responding to people's actual needs. Now, um, I think part of what we lack is the ability to create political costs for this lack of movement, because again, if we talk about the global trade system having been designed to insulate, you know, kind of global trade from democracy, uh, unfortunately, part of what we deal with in the United States and elsewhere um, is, you know, political leaders who have likewise been able to in insulate themselves um, from costs for, for those decisions. Um, but I think the answer to this is yes, continued dialogue, but continuing to push these voices into the actual decision-making spaces. I think we've seen some good effort from that, from the Biden administration. Um, but again, they've been, for, for so long, it's been su such a fight to actually get a hearing that there's so much more to do. I just wanted to add one more point. I think it's, um, it's let's say, government actors' responsibility to also protect those who are standing up against inequalities, right? I think um, if we look at, if, if we want civil society to play a role, there has to be a, some sort of protection and, you know, um, I think guarantee that those actors are being protected. There's a really um, great um, organization which is based in DC, I think in Washington DC, Crude Accountability. And they've been looking at um, the the what what is what is happening to activists who are fighting climate justice, and how and their their reports they put out reports every year talking about how many a climate activists are being killed, 
um, how many climate activists are actually being prosecuted or, or you know need to leave their 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 homes basically and I think this is a really good example where um, you know if we if, if, if actors stand up for for things that are not right um, that that they need to be protected and I think this is this is a this is a huge point as well because if there is if there's not space for civil society actors or for activists to act on certain things um, then this will just in turn rep reinforce the this the structural and social inequality so I think protection and prevention is a really important point um, and I've and the same thing goes for activists for example from who consider you know who see themselves as part of the LGBTIQ community for example right um, this is also really really important um, so yeah just protection protect those those activists I think uh, mm -hmm. this is necessary yeah um, I do want to come back to a specific issue um, that I think you raised a couple of minutes ago namely supply chains um, and in Germany the supply chain act the Lieferkettengesetz in German has recently attracted attracted attention and in short it's about binding companies to certain kinds of human rights standards environmental standards making them accountable for 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 the action uh, locally on the ground um, and that's true for the entire supply chain of a product right so um, uh, and the criticism about the Supply Chain Act, um, as far as I can see it, is mainly directed as question, at questions of feasibility and implementation of the Supply Chain Act. That they can they always say, well, you know, smaller or middle-sized uh, companies are not able to, um, yeah, to, to, to ensure that the, the entire supply chain is, is fine with social rights and so on and so forth. It's uh, just too difficult because they are buying, I don't know, raw products somewhere in the world and they're not able to, to control this. Um, Madita, how do you assess the feasibility of the Supply Chain Act or, um, or the control of supply chain since this is directly going to, to the local level? Um, and could it maybe also serve as a model, maybe the Supply Chain Act, mm -hmm. which of course is only the, the, the starting point in addressing these issues for other, um, you know, let's say, it's states or international organizations. What do you think? Um, I think the German case is really interesting because um, the government has, you know, with the, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, that Lieferkettengesetz was put in place before the government actually, the new government took over, right? Or at least it was advertised. And I th um, the, the idea behind it was that um, companies that are um, from the from the start of 3,000 employees or are, are have to have to abide by those rules, right? But that was not, that was below the standard that the EU had actually put up. Mm -hmm. So. From I think from the first of January, this uh, Lieferkettengesetz will now come uh, come in, come into force, um, and there's been a lot of going back and forth between the EU level and the national level um, on on how how to hold companies accountable. I think there's a lot there's a chance in that in in, in these kinds of laws or provisions. I think, but the the key to it is or to those are holding every single actor accountable for what they're doing along the line. And I've been talking, I've, I've mentioned this before, um, you know, corporate actors or actors that are, that are involved in where we do not have a lot of um, provisions internationally or multilaterally to control what they're actually doing, right? Um, it's, a, it's a highly complex issue, I would argue. Um, and this probably touches upon the question of feasibility, right? Can we do this or not? Yes, but um, if if we don't, then I, I I don't think we have any other chance than to 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 go down that road. I think as long as we have accountability mechanisms internationally, but also nationally, and that we also have sanctions that are put upon actors who do not abide by those rules, right? This could be a step forward, but as long as we don't have them, um, we will have to see how, how these are implemented at the end of the day. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe that, that would be a good, good step forward, but then it also comes with 
a checking, you know, like the, the checking our human rights actually being followed, right? And we need, we need, we need good instruments for that. Those need to be developed um, in order to, to track that. And then the other thing is that um, budgeting, for example, has to be, or budget has to be allocated to those, to those tools as well. It takes, it takes staff, it takes people to do this, the, this human rights checkup, right? So if we don't, we, if we don't have those, um, those resources for that, it's what you said before, it's nice to have these things on paper, right? But how, how do they translate into the real world? How does they, uh, yeah, and how, how do we know when something is achieved, right? Um, yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. Matt, what do you think about the feasibility of an implementation of such a supply chain act or Right, I mean, I, know, I, I, I think it's feasible, but again, it's, it's going to be messy and it gives partly, yeah. you know, going back to what we were talking about at the beginning, and to build in, you know, what we've learned, especially, you know, post-COVID, um, is that we need to build in resiliency to supply chains, mm -hmm. and that means building in redundancy, and that is heretical to the, the religious faith of neoliberalism, which is that efficiency is one of the highest goods, um, and, that and redundancy is something that raises costs, um, and ultimately that means that, you know, someone might have to pay, you know, $8 instead of $5 for cargo shorts at Old Navy, um, among other things. But ultimately that's what we're talking about, is making clear that, you know, these, you know, you are not entitled to these cheap goods. Let's understand the actual cost to communities around the world for these cheap goods that um, we have been told are, are right. For uh, questions from the audience in a minute, but before I want to ask you one last question with, um, uh, yeah, with very short answers maybe, uh, so that we have uh, enough time for, for the, the, the plenary discussion as well. Uh, and my question would be, where do you see the most potential to improve transatlantic uh, cooperation on a particular level, on a particular level or in a particular field um, to fight social inequality? Matthew, maybe sure, I mean, I would say right now, um, strengthening ties between labor movements and trade unions mm. is, I mean, I will, the revival of American labor is one of the most exciting things to me happening right now in American politics. Um, I would say the same for what's happening in UK. I mean, you know, I think a lot of our European colleagues, you know, in, you know there are strong, very much stronger labor movements um, in these societies, but I got the chance to travel to, um, I know it's not part of the EU anymore, but <laughs> to uh, London with uh, Senator Sanders back in, in, in August, and he was able to speak at a rally for the transportation workers who were striking. Um, and the excitement um, of that, and I think the kind of increased conversation that has been going on um, between US and UK movements and, and elsewhere, um, I think is hugely important. And again, understanding that we absolutely need to build in, and uh, you know, Medita talked about protections, labor protections, um, not just in developed countries, but especially in developing countries, because protecting the rights of workers um, is absolutely essential um, to social, to building social equality. Medita, where do you see room for improvement for transatlantic cooperation to, um, yeah, to, to cope with social inequality? Yeah, I would like to second what um, Matt was just saying and add maybe the issue of responsibility that taking responsibility um, for, for economically you know important and powerful and maybe also dominating um, countries such as the one that we're sitting in right now or um, the US for example I think responsibility for workers rights um, for human rights for um, gender equality um, and for everything that comes along the way, along these lines, right, is absolutely necessary um, when implementing um, trade policies. Um, and I think the, the approach does not, should not be gender equal, it has to be gender transformative, basically, with all the points that I mentioned before, the five ones, right, um, to, 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 to look out for those. I think responsibility and uh, acknowledging that also um, globally, what the so-called global north has towards the global south in terms of how production is being um, done these days or has been done over, over the last decades, if not centuries, right? That there has to be a historical responsibility and a current responsibility for 
for the ways that economic, um, I would, okay, I'll call it economic um, cooperation. We could obviously also label it differently and trade has been pursued. Um, and I think this is part of a feminist approach to trade policies and especially foreign policies. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, the panel is open for questions from the audience. Please feel free to raise your hand and I do my very best to keep track of the, the right order. I see a hand over here in the front and then Florian Koma over there, yes. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Shaukat Alum. I'm actually a professor of law at Macquarie University, Australia. Um, fascinating discussions and uh, from the keynote speech to these sort of panel discussions, a couple of themes um, emerged. And I think when we discuss the, whether trade will have human face, you know, it's, this is age old debate and, and, and questions, you know. And, um, and the keynote speech actually pointed out some of those uh, hypocrisies within the international. Um, policy space and also the, uh, the practices that we can see from different institutions and governance frameworks. But also, Matt, you also mentioned that you know, some of this we can see that um, these impacts um, are happening not only in the global south but also in the global north. We can see that how there are resistance coming um, from within that these institutions are not delivering. So looking at um, those global institutions, we are talking about the human rights framework, institutional framework, we have, we're talking about the trade frameworks, you know. Um, and we now see the, the other actors uh, emerging, like, you know, civil society, you know, non-state actors who are working in that space. That makes it really complicated. My question here, um, actually from the Global South perspective, one is we talked about that we also need to now implement, you know, corporate due diligence, you know, through the Supply Chain Act. Um, how can we actually monitor that? And how can we implement it? Uh, because traditionally we have seen that the trade is being used, you know, for protectionist purposes. What actually gives us the guarantee that these new initiatives will not be again you know, taken away and, and used for as a protectionist tool. And to what extent we can actually expect it, the global supply chains, particularly in the global south, within their current uh, regulatory institutional constraints and problems with their capacity constraints, uh, how they can comply mm -hmm. and, and uh, how we can make a real difference. So this is uh, the one question. And second question is, do you think that we can make any difference without actually changing those sort of regimes and you know, a fundamental the premises or values or objectives like WTO. You know, when you mentioned that is, there is a disconnect, you know, um, they are not working in, in, in vacuum. They are working in the social context and must, they must integrate human rights and sustainability in their you know, um, uh, agreements and, and frameworks, but there is no, at the moment, we don't see anything that there is um, human rights impact assessment in the trade agreements. Uh, and, and particularly when we see so many bilateral and, and regional treaties happening outside the WTO. So what is the solution? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, should we directly, I think we have some, some more time left, so I think we, we can directly take one at a time at the moment. Who wants to start? start? Um, no? If you want to take the first one, I'll take the, I can take the second one first. Okay. If all right. That's all right. Um, I think your question is the, about, you know, the WTO in particular, but not just the WTO, about the entire trade regime of which the WTO is one part. Um, because, you know, again, as I said at the beginning, I think these institutions were created with a very clear set of assumptions. And that was to facilitate the smooth movement of goods and finance um, with relatively little concern for the impacts or movement of people um, to say nothing of rights. You know, with the, another assumption being like once you get these things moving and insulate these things from the vicissitudes of, you know, <laughs> um, of, you know, essentially democracy, then, you know, the rising tide will lift all boats, yada, yada, yada. And we've seen for decades that this has, has not worked. And yet 
they persist. Um, you know, so to answer your question, is it reformable? At this point, I, I, I can't say that I imagine it is. Um, but the, the, the challenge is building an actual international consensus toward you know, new institutions that, that do work to do this. And I think we have all the evidence we need of how absolutely vital this is. But what we lack, um, and again, like we lack, you know, just you know, from an American perspective, we lack right now a shared concept of what the American political project is. The challenge of coming up with a shared concept of an international project is many times greater, but again, this is the work. So recognize the challenge in the national and international context, but what is there to do but to continue to kind of articulate these ideas and try to mobilize people behind them? I, I hope that's not avoiding the question. It's recognizing the challenge of, of answering it. Matita. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think it's a similarly difficult one, right? How can we assure change? Um, because, of course, um, if we, you know, look at the formulations of policy time and again, how they are supposed to strengthen economic cooperation between partners and how they're s being considered, you know, eye to eye on the same level and so on and so on. I think it's kind of deflecting from the fact that historically a lot of dependencies have grown, right, financially, economically, and so on. Um, especially, as I was pointing out before, between countries who have, um, who have held monopolies over certain industries um, or, or who, who have been able, through historically grown dependencies, to exploit certain industries a lot in the Global South, right? Um, I'm obviously, you know, as a European white woman, I'm not in the position to say um, how this would, you know, bring about change um, in the global south, right, or, or what is basically needed. But I think if, um, if, if, we, can, if we take seriously the dependencies, um, I, I, always, I always think of the, the, um, the, the currency the, the, the currency that is uh, still used in a lot of Francophone African countries, um, the CFR, I think it's called, um, then we, we look at how, you know, exchange rates and so on um, actually impact the, 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 the economic s the situation of, of those Francophone countries. And if we, th if we just very precisely, if we break up those dependencies that have historically grown in post-colonial times, right, um, then this, that, that would be a chance on a, let's say, on a more m macro level. On a micro level, as I said before, there, there's a need for responsibility to be taken, right? Um, and then there's also the need for, for certain actors to being taken seriously. And again, I can, only, I can only underscore that from the exchange I've had with activists from countries like Senegal, um, in, in our project, um, or South Sudan, that it really is necessary to talk to the people and take their, you know, take their perspective seriously because otherwise change won't come into place, right? Um, and this is unfortunately not something we can influence that, but we can obviously as civil society cannot um, enforce that, right? Yeah, thank you very much. Florian Komma, I think, is next, then Eric Maldonado, and we had a hand over here as well. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Florian Komma. Um, I'm a FOTAR scholarship holder, mostly working on European politics for a German MP. Um, I would like to pick up on your last question on the transatlantic uh, relationship and the current uh, status and ask uh, Matt Das. Because I think what is really one big topic, you already mentioned it, uh, for transatlantic relations is the um, Inflation Reduction Act, um, which is actually a great success. It's really something like a small Green New Deal. It brings quite a lot of investment in green technology. Um, at the same time, with the local content clause, it caused quite some anger in Europe, and I was wondering what you would recommend, how should the European Union react 
yeah. to the a Inflation Reduction Act and yeah. what would you seem appropriate from an American perspective? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. And um, <laughs> for lack of a better answer, my, my, my first answer would be just cut it out. You know, I mean, <laughs> yes, I understand you have concerns with them, but, you know, as, you know, someone on the left who, you know, supports the, strongly supports, you know, the US-EU relationship, the EU project and so many of its aspects, I think colleagues on the left especially to see this kind of reaction, first of all, which, you know, the IRA represents a tiny step, a significant yet relatively small step toward the United States finally meeting its international commitments on climate and becoming a, and taking its commitment seriously toward moving toward renewable energy. Um, and to see, you know, these kinds of complaints, um, this kinds of response from, you know, M Macron when he came to meet with the president um, is surprising, disappointing. Um, you know, again, we understand um, the concerns from kind of the, the, the subsidies standpoint and, and stuff like that. But there really has to be a way to, to manage this because it, this is going to keep going. I mean, this problem is not going to, way, going to go away. You know, the, the administ as I said at the beginning, um, Biden's number one priority, probably one through five, is showing that the decisions this administration is making with regard to foreign policy and trade policy is actually producing goods in American communities. Um, and if the reaction that we've gotten on these subsidies is an indicator of what's coming, this is going to be a real problem. And it's going to create serious political problems um, amongst Americans for their, their view of the U.S.-Europe relationship. Um, so what I would just encourage us all um, to try and find some more constructive ways to, to deal with this. Eric Madonanas, thanks, I think. My, qu My question was just answered. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we had a hand over here and then our colleague from there as well. Thank you very much. Um, let me pour some water into the wine because I'm lacking a bit of voice by so heavily criticized institutions and governments. And I'm a representative of a government. I'm uh, working with the German Minister of Economic uh, Affairs and uh, I'm the head of the directorate for North America. So we are in charge of IRA as well as TTC. And uh, this is why I'm not going to ask a question, but uh, this is why I'm a bit criticizing that there is no voice by institutions here because of course I'm a bit diverging from what uh, has, said, has been said so far. First of all, the due diligence supply chains laws, they have some heavy design flaws. And there's something we should bear in mind. And one fundamental design flaw is that, take the example of Bangladesh, there's a lot of laws about labor rights and everything, but there's a very weak government. So the fundamental question is, if we should replace the job of domestic governments um, to enforce certain laws by private companies from outside. This is the basic uh, approach of these due diligence laws and this answer, there has been no answer thus far. And the second point is also that, um, and there was a very interesting um, discussion about that, that in principle these kind of laws will hinder us from diversifying because it's easy for big companies to follow on these laws. It's much more difficult for small and medium-sized companies. So it will add co to concentration. And of course, it will lead companies to avoid any supply chain, which is a bit more complicated. Now, what supply chains are complicated? If you are trading with a con country which is not so transparent, not so well organized, etc., etc., so then you tend to uh, trade or have a supply chain with US, with Canada, with well-developed uh, countries and not so much with Africa or with the Middle East or Central Asia. So we should all bear this all in mind. This is what I meant by design flaws. So it's, it's a good intention, but we will see how it will work in practice. The second point, I bring, which brings me back to Andreas Grimmel and what he has said about all these initiatives. I mean, all these initiatives, be it the Global Gateway, be it Blue Dot Network, be it Belt and Road Initiative, they are all about big infrastructure. So what does it mean in bringing it down to substance? It's about conditionality. How could we handle anti-corruption? How could we handle sustainability? It's about exerting influence. It's about market access. And it's about communication data control. So, and also we should bear in mind the sequencing of these initiatives. The first was Belt and Road Initiative led by China. And we all know what happened in Sri Lanka. 
uh, to give you an example. Then, of course, there was a reaction by the US, uh, Blue Dot Network, which is now renamed uh, Build Bad Be Better, but it's US-led, which, of course, is not very comfortable for us if it's only US-led. So the European answer was the global gateway. And then, of course, we have the TTC with the US and uh, Europe together. The interesting thing with the TTC is that's also about data uh, communication initiatives. So we have started an initiative in Kenya and Jamaica for a good reason, because it's also about a competition about global data control. And this is where there's a high potential for transatlantic cooperation. And this is also uh, where we see a future. And uh, when you talk about all these initiatives, you have to bear in mind that when you talk about conditionality, China is following a completely different approach from what is uh, followed by the US and by the EU. And you and US uh, also diverge in many points regarding how to cope with China. And this all has to do with how institutions, how governments are acting, also the WTO. So I'm a bit hesitating when I have listened to you how much you're criticizing institutions. Um, and, and I had really missed a voice by institutions in your discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Do you want to react or? Um, no, I'm just, thank you for bringing that up. Okay. I, I hear your criticism. Um, if I could just respond to that, and I also just want to add a little bit more to my response to your question. And I, again, I didn't mean to be flip. Um, you know, I think from the US, you know, again, speaking humbly, the United States has certainly never been shy about making its own prerogatives and preferences clear <laughs> on a whole range of issues. If I want to recognize that. I want to say that the approach this administration is taking is understanding that a new approach needs to be, that more attention needs to be paid to actual impacts to America's working communities to prevent a replay of what we saw for the previous four years. And I do think that is a very, very clear <laughs> preference for probably most of the people in this room. Um, and so even though I think this adjustment is going to be rocky, even if it's handled as, as well as possible, I think um, you know, a, a, there is a, a very strong shared um, desire to, you know, provide a, an alternative to, I think, some of the, the, the really the right wing nationalist populism that we certainly saw under Trump and that we're seeing across a lot of developed democracies. And I think the Biden administration's theory of the case on how to prevent that is sound. Um, I guess I'll just stop there. Maybe I could add just one or two sentences. I think I would like to reiterate that critique obviously should not only be directed at the institutions, but the way that they're drafted, right, of, of th those policies or, or those, those provisions. Um, and I think we haven't really touched upon this on this panel, what um, the role of corporate actors or transnational capital really plays in here and how, how that can be controlled, or not controlled, but how that can be held, held accountable for, for its effects. Um, so I think this would be something um, we could we, ha we would have to discuss more and which has to be taken into account more in these, um, in, in these policies, also looking at the ways in which, for example, Germany is organizing, uh, reorganizing its um, economic cooperation and development policy right now under the label feminist, right, a feminist development policy. Um, the, 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 the money that comes in for, for a lot of the money that comes in f for, for these initiatives is actually from third parties. Um, and how, how, how do we, or, or how, how are they going to be held accountable for, for what they're, what they're doing? So I think this is, this is a really important, really important point that you've raised. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. We had a hand over there and then also over there. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Jinghui Wu uh, from Taiwan, uh, currently visiting our European in, uh, Institute. Um, I, uh, I have a quick question. Uh, this morning in the, uh, during the keynote speech, I was struck by uh, the keynote speaker. Uh, she mentioned that, uh, um, okay, uh, European Union or, uh, uh, from her perspective, um, uh, EU or European countries is not, is not going to transform uh, China, but it, uh, she expect uh, China would uh, the change would be uh, or transformation of China has to be happen within the country. So it goes back uh, uh, based on this point. I, my question to Matita in particular: 
would be, uh, you mentioned about uh, it's a responsibility for the governments uh, in US, in DC, and in Brussels or other countries to protect these um, activists uh, in, the, uh, in the country. So my question would be, is it possible or, uh, or is it feasible for you, I mean, to envisage this uh, transformation uh, from within, given uh, these uh, Australian countries? And if there's no such a uh, 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 possibility, then how should the governments of European countries or uh, uh, the US to open up such a uh, possibility for this authoritarian country to have such tiny possibility to turn forward with them? And what would be the policy instruments, such as uh, you mentioned about sanctions or preference, in addition to this, what would be the what would be the policy instrument to open up such a possibility for transform within? My impression is that uh, for since uh, 1989, European countries, especially those people in Brussels, they haven't done anything in the case of China. And if we try, we, if we, t um, until recently, we heard something about Uyghur and Xinjiang. And I think this is really late development. And this morning we heard the drill or the, or the siren. I think it's a wake up call for European countries. Uh, sorry to say that. But again, if you compare to uh, China with the so-called global south, I think we have, to com we have to distinguish Russia, China on the one, one hand, and other global south countries on the other hand. And because we, met, when we heard again, we heard our uh, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, but it takes 30 years for EU to take up with China. We have to face with this. And this is again, go back to the hyper, uh, hypocritical element of European Union. And this is my uh, quick question to Matita in particular. Okay, I heard a lot of questions in that. Um, I think I would like to pass the, the expertise on China to our keynote speakers if you'd like to address them, because I'm not an expert on China, right? Um, uh, if you'd like to, to address your, the keynote speaker later on about that. Um, I think the question about what can be done to protect people is a really important one um, and something that is not eas easily answerable, especially if you um, think about protection um, of civil rights um, from afar, right? I think this is, or, or the support of, 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 of specific movements from afar. Um, I think the situation in Iran is a really um, uh, relevant issue here, or a good example for that as well. Um, we see the Kurdish movements and the women's movements right now on the streets, and Germany is having a hard time in supporting or, or finding a strategy of supporting the, 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 the movement over there because Germany is Iran's most important economic partner in the EU, right? This is one of, one of the reasons. So I think it's always the question of um, balancing, right? How, and, and, and it, it, unfortunately, it often boils down to, to, to probably also national interest, right? Um, I think there's not enough out there coming back to the question of protection, there are not enough mechanisms to protect um, civil rights movements and, and, and activists. And I would also like to maybe throw in the question of how these movements actually protect themselves, right? It's about um, transnational solidarity also across these movements. I think this is something that we should not neglect when thinking about this um, because the you know governments and states they only have so much ability and power to 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 ex nor, uh, ability to exhort power in that way and I think I would I would also like to um, to to shift the the focus of how much power lies within these movements as well um, on on how they're protecting themselves but then again 
there are actors who are threatening those movements which are not easily controlled. And again, I'm coming back to transnational capital and corporate actors because money obviously is here the, the, the key issue that fuels certain um, movements that hinder civil society um, actors and activists to, to raise their voices, basically. So I think we need more mechanisms that protect them, but we should also strengthen and, and understand and acknowledge that there's a lot of power and, and ability to protect themselves within these movements and then think about ways how to support them, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question. I already saw a hand over there. Maybe we can hand a microphone over here, yeah? <laughs> Um, thanks a lot. My name is Geza Kubek. I'm assistant professor in European law at the University of Groningen and also um, a photo scholar of this year. And I have a question for um, Madita. My question was more, it centers a bit more on this um, recent initiative of create, sort of designing trade and gender chapters in free trade agreements. We haven't seen that so much in the EU, but I know it's in, in the discussion about the front right runner is here, really Canada, um, who has done that with um, Chile, I think also with the recent agreement with Israel. Um, and so far, I think the, the main novelty of these type of chapters is basically just reintegrating existing agreements, for instance, the one in the ILO that you mentioned in the framework of those trade agreements, which I don't want to downplay in that way. It, it, it subjects existing commitments to new type of monitor, monitoring oversight mechanism. But of course, that's something like a new, it is a new development in Germany, you would say, steckt in den Kinder schon. No? And the, the big discussion that we have more is now, should there also be substantive, cha substantive commitments in those chapters? And if so, which ones? Bec also from sort of a feasibility implementation perspective. And I just wondered if you have a take on that. Yeah, I mean, it's always, you know, it's always interesting when you see that the, the, the factor, you know, if you look at it from a quant, quant perspective, the factor of gender is being added to some sort of policy or provision, right? And it, um, it's just used as a marker of, okay, we tick those boxes and now we're, we're moving on to the next point, right? Um, the example f of Canada, I, I recently read a chapter um, on Canadian trade initiatives and how they're trying to, you know, how they've actually been trying to make those more feminist um, over the last years. And the chapter really outlines in how far Canada has actually um, abided by what they set, they, they set themselves. Um, I think um, it comes, you know, it, it, the, the, the adding of those, of, of those um, factors um, or, or markers of gender is, is limited in themselves, um, but it, it, it might also give us a chance actually to push forward to, um, you know, to, 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 to look at or to have, um, to have the language basically um, for, for thinking about what does it mean to putting gender equality um, in, onto the table because it's obviously something that is that is new, right? Um, also in other in other policy fields, also in the fields of peace negotiations or, um, or 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 cooperation in general, I think it has been. We have seen that adding women to the table, no matter in what fora, does not really is not enough, right? We need the acknowledgement of the structures that. Um, that oppress certain groups in society in the first place, um, and then, and then talking about whether certain markers are being achieved or not in trade policies is might be a good step forward. But again, I, I said this before. I think we need mechanisms um, that hold actors accountable, um, and where we can actually see an input in gender budgeting, for example, is a very good way um, or first initial step. Um, to, to, to achieve that. But I probably share your skepticism of the impact um, or, or the, the, uh, yeah, the impact that, that, that adding gender to these provisions can, can, can really have. But I think watching Canada here is a good thing um, to do because there's a lot of scholarship 
that is, you know, there's being an invest a scholarship is being is, has been looking in that for a long time, and they have a little bit more experience than some actors here um, in Europe, for example, and on 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 pu pushing for that. So I would probably look at Canada for more answers in this. Yeah. Since we started a little bit later, I think we have uh, time for one more question. And I saw that our keynote speaker, Amelie Nood, has raised her hand. So please, Marlene. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to maybe rephrase or reframe the question posed by uh, about China so that you can answer it. <laughs> um, and it relates uh, both to, I mean, how can we in Europe, in the United States, support change within China? Uh, but it also relates to Madita's points about the need for transnational solidarity and the question about uh, solidarity between labor movements in Europe and the United States. So what I want to ask is how do you see that we in Europe and in the United States can make sure we don't pit different groups against each other, like what we've seen in the United States, where you know there's maybe a growing labor movement, but it's always at the, it's not very solidaric than with, with workers in China, for example, or in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So how do we address that? And then <clears throat> the other question, uh, maybe to you, Madita, how can we? strengthen solidarity between the feminist movement and the labor rights movement or the trade union movement, which hasn't, to be very frank, in Sweden, it's not been terribly mm -hmm. strong. Uh, um, so yeah, that's what I'm, I'm interested in. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Matt, you may first, and I have to ask you for, for short answers, of course, because sure. of time constraints. But yeah, thank no, you. Um, glad to address this, and thank you that. Thank you for the question, and thank you for framing it. I mean, I think as you said in your remarks, like um, you know, restoring and building and strengthening, you know, the kind of international human rights set of hu international human rights norms um, is is really important. And I will note that over the past 20 years, those norms have been undermined in countless ways, um, by among other things, but probably most egregiously through the global war on terror. Um, you know, the United States took the lead in this. And in fact, as we, we saw a few uh, years ago from um, leaked documents from the Chinese government, they specifically referenced justifications that the Bush administration gave around terrorism for what they were trying to do uh, in Xinjiang. That's not a justification of it at all. It's only to recognize that, you know, the United States and its partners played a role in setting up these institutions and kind of promulgating these norms. Um, we need to recognize the role that we have played uh, in undermining them. And if we are going to like ask other countries uh, to follow them and honor them, we need to start taking a much more consistent approach to them ourselves. You know, for instance, that means, you know, it's very difficult to see you know, condemnations of, of Vladimir Putin, and then, um, sorry, I gotta go, I gotta go have my meeting with Mohammed bin Salman. You know, you know, like, let's, getting away from this, that we have this strange deal where I gotta go work with this corrupt petrostate dictator over here to help fight this corrupt petrostate <laughs> petro dictator over here, I think, um, breaking that, you know, breaking, breaking out of that, that, uh, that tension is going to be a challenge too. But I think to, to try to wrap this up quickly, um, it's, there is, a, you know, there's the question of what governments can do. And I think your point about sanctions is, was really important because broad-based sectoral sanctions tend to just hurt working people while, you know, the government actors, they're supposedly supposed to influence are completely insulated from them. And in fact, it helps entrench and consolidate the power of these actors. If we're talking about specific sanctions, I think, focused on officials um, implicated in human rights abuses, um, you know, cutting off their ability to travel, their ability to, you know, to access money. I think there's some evidence that those have a better impact, um, even though it is mild, but on the other hand, it does not hurt um, the mass population. But I think another role the government also has is to help lift up, create space for the civil society work that is ongoing. Um, there's a great group that we do work with in the United States called Justice is Global. Um, they are focused on building these relationships between uh, Chinese workers and workers in the West. And I think, you know, 
creating and protecting space for that kind of solidarity work going on. It's not something that is going to require a UN resolution. Um, it's something that, that, that's a bit more complex from a government perspective. Um, but you know, creating space at the civil society level, I think, is very key. Thanks. Um, concerning your question, how can there be, can, can we establish connection or, or more solidarity between the feminist movement and the labor movement, right? Um, I think we're, we, we might be running the risk of thinking in silos a lot, right? Um, that w w what does, and, and when, we, when we say that, we don't really, we haven't really talked about what does the feminist movement mean, right? There is no such thing as the feminist movement because it's so diverse. There's so many inner feminist conflicts, right? Um, but I think that, you know, thinking, trying to, trying to break up those silos and understanding a little bit more how all of the crises that we're, we're currently facing are interconnected, which I think a lot of actors are doing, but are also, to be honest, pretty overwhelmed with. And a lot of labor, a, a, lot, of, a lot of the labor that is in, in, in labor uh, movements and also in feminist movements is unpaid voluntary work, right? This is something that we need to be aware of. A lot of political power is being lost because people have day, jo day jobs and then after that they go home and maybe, you know, have care jobs but also try to change the world, right? Um, so I think building connections is, is a matter of both mo both movements, if we, if we want to hold it very simplistic, to understand that where we've been We've been there once, I think, where there, has, there was more dialogue between these two movements, but that we have to open the room again and talk to one another. And I think um, since the, the civil society has been diversified a lot over the last years, also with Fridays for Future, for example, um, I think more dialogue should be, should be sought and also should be fostered among these, these actors. How exactly that is being done one of the, I, I, I said before, one of the issue is, is unpaid work here, but the other thing I think is also funding, and I haven't mentioned this at all today, but funding is a very key issue in making civil society sustainable and, you know, making, letting the work come, come into place or, 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 or have an impact, really. Um, so I would, I, would, I would say that, and then it, it comes down to the actors, whether they want to talk to each other uh, or not, um, if, if there are more materialistic analyses that we need between feminist actors and the labor movement, um, again, and understanding what the, the, the common fights are, the common, the common challenges, but also the differences in there. But polit politics is a very messy business, right? So. Um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult question, but I think funding and um, thinking outside of silos is, might be a first step. Yeah. Thank you very much. Many thanks to our panelists, Matthew Das and uh, Madita Stanke Erdmann. Um, it's now my pleasure to declare the buffet open. <laughs> we have the lunch break uh, for one hour and from 12.30 until 1.30. And then we will continue with the second panel of today on the race for technology, building resilient transatlantic trade relations. And of course, we hope that you stay here and will listen to, to the other panels as well. So enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
Kevin. Nein, noch nicht. Ich freue mich, Frau Friedländer. Freut mich. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had a nice uh, lunch and a good break to chat. Um, for the second panel of the day, we're going to move over to the discussion of trade and technology. So the um, formal title is The Race for Technology, Building Resilient Transatlantic Trade Relations. And we have um, an excellent panel here, a good transatlantic panel, some uh, colleagues who have come from Washington, names I've recognized from my um, my former haunts. So um, I'm just going to say, just introduce them very briefly. We have Adam Hirsch, who's se senior economist at the Economic Policy Institute in Washington. Uh, Bernd Dieckmann, who is the head of division of USA, Canada, Mexico at uh, BNBK, the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy, right to my right. James Lewis, Senior Vice President and Program Director at the Strategic uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies. I just say CSIS, so I can't even say the, the long word. Um, and Natalie Schneller from SAP, who's the Director for Global Government Affairs and Business Development. Last but not least, to my far right, we have Tim Ruling, uh, who is the Research Fellow in the Technology and Foreign Affairs Program at the German Council on Foreign Relations in Berlin. Uh, I myself am Julia Friedlander. I am the CEO of the Atlantic Brücke in Berlin as well, um, but I also spent uh, 15 years prior to this in Washington working on some of these issues. So I'm very happy to be here, uh, very grateful for, uh, for the invitation and look forward to the conversation. Um, I think uh, just to open up, um, this is a question I sometimes ask because I am actually a former intelligence analyst. I worked at the CIA for five years, and the first question we always asked when we thought about what, how do countries think about specific issues is to say, what is the source of the problem? What's the reading of the problem? How do we scale the risk? So um, I'd like to go from uh, left, my left to right here and ask each of my colleagues if you're looking at the growing um, growing international uh, tensions in the f fields of trade and technology. Um, wh what, is your, uh, what, what is your reading of the problem, setting the base, um, base sort of intelligence assessment, so to speak, of, uh, of what we're dealing with? Adam, I'll start with you. Thank you. Uh, let me start by uh, thanking the organizers of this. I'm really happy to be here to have uh, and share in this important conversation today. Uh, so, uh, thank you. It's my first time to be able to be in Hamburg. Uh, maybe it was an earlier version of the description of this panel but, uh, that I received. It, it started off with something like, how do, who, how do we win the race uh, for technology? And I think if we start uh, from that framing right away, we're already losing. There's a lot of ways that uh, many, many ways that we can lose uh, the situation and very few ways that, uh, that we can win it. Uh, and to win it means recognizing that we're all in this together. Europe, the United States, China, everybody. Uh, how do we make, uh, by making technology uh, rivalrous, uh, we create the divisions uh, that are, are driving us apart. And uh, from an economics perspective, knowledge is supposed to be non-rivalrous, meaning that everyone can benefit from it. Uh, it doesn't take anything away from you. If I use the knowledge, it doesn't cost anything to share that knowledge uh, between us. Uh, and so we need to find a way to reduce the rivalry by figuring out how to better share knowledge and technology uh, amongst us. And I'm not so idealistic that I don't recognize there are things that are going to be rivalrous where we don't want to share those technologies. We're going to want to control them, uh, their dissemination. Uh, but as a first principle, I think the way that we uh, get out of this uh, tension that we're having is figure out ways uh, where we can turn rivalries into non-rivalrous uh, 
uh, relationships. Mm. But how would you describe the initial problem setting? What is what are the what are the what's the what are the fundamental questions that we are asking ourselves right now? Well, I think the fundamental questions we're asking is how we, I mean we have multiple crises coming at us uh, all at once. Uh, these crises, you know, there's the public health crisis of the pandemic. There's the climate crisis, uh, both existential crises. Uh, we have uh, crises of, of structural inequality and discrimination. Uh, these crises, these problems, all I see, all, them all coming from uh, the system of international economic order that we've built up in, in the post-war era. Uh, this has been built uh, from narrow perspectives uh, representing the interests of, of narrow, powerful elite groups. Uh, and it hasn't been, it hasn't been uh, created in a way to spread the benefits or to enable the participation uh, of everyone in uh, governance of this system. And we're having these problems because we have undemocratic, non-participatory uh, rulemaking for, for the international order. So I think to get from where we'd like to go from here, we have to think about how are we going to uh, reform, revise, uh, the international system that we've inherited. Thank you. And um, first of all, I'd also like to say how excited I am to be here. Some of you already know um, this conference is kind of closing a loop for me as I used to work at the American consulate here in Hamburg during the TTIP negotiations. Um, now I'm at SAP, uh, Europe's largest technology company. Um, not everyone may have heard of it because it's not producing end consumer solutions, but it's a um, company uh, developing software for business. Um, so we are basically digitizing day-to-day um, -day business activities within and between companies. We are present in um, 160 countries. Um, we are a global company, so naturally um, geopolitical developments have an impact on how we can do business. Um, and I think for multinational corporations at large, developing, um, monitoring geopolitical trends and uh, risks has become um, a growingly um, important risk mitigation strategy. Um, also within business associations, we see um, this being a um, growing topic in, in working groups. Um, but, yeah, we are not only looking at it um, uh, from our corporate perspective, but serving over 400,000 companies um, in the world, they are also expecting us to help them with our technology to uh, mitigate some of those risks, um, especially if we look at how they impact supply chains, you know, um, increasingly vol volatile supply chains. Um, and we do that by providing digital platforms that connect uh, suppliers and buyers, for example, that include uh, due diligence analysis on a range of uh, human rights and environmental risks. So um, not only are sort of political uh, risk um, management activities increasing, um, but we also see these developments impacting um, our, our products and um, the solutions that provide to other companies. And um, for us concretely, um, growing international tensions uh, translate into a fragmentation of the regulatory landscape, um, which is um, making a doing global business more difficult as we have to adjust um, to, you know, single market requirements. And of course, we prefer uh, global alignment on, on standards. Thank you. And from industry to government. Yes, thank you very much. <coughs> as I'm in uh, charge of both TTC and uh, IRA uh, for the German government, I would like to directly refer to the TTC and what it's all about. Now, to put it briefly, it's about who is dominating in the area of cutting-edge technology. 
That's the core question. And to break it down further, it's about availability and collection of data. It's about who dominates communication systems. It's about intangibles, because these are the prerequisites for any further development of cutting edge technology. What adds, adds to that, and this is very <coughs> sorry, important if you think about how the US is acting, is that uh, in all these areas, as you have rightly pointed out, uh, network effects are very, very important. So the first mover advantage <coughs> is key because it's unlimited in principle. So there's a high incentive to exclude competitors in these areas. The main competitor being China. And this is where European Union and <coughs> the United States agree. But there are also considerable divergences in views uh, between the European Union and Germany and, and the US. And this goes to the often quoted role of China as a partner, rival, and competitor. Now, we see China as a competitor, also unfair competitor in many regards. We see China as a partner. We see China in certain areas as a rival, but we don't see China as a geopolitical rival. Not because we neglect this factor, but because the European Union and Germany are not competing uh, in, in a geopolitical sense with the China. This is only the US that who is doing that. And so when it comes down to the topics we are discussing in the TTC, it's, and I will be very concrete on that, it's standards and norms, it's about artificial intelligence, it's about quantum computing, um, so a lot of technical, and it's, of, it's about data. And there's also a very important difference between the US and uh, the European Union when it comes to data. The US see data foremost as a, another, say, good that can be traded. So they, they took an economic perspective, and only if there's misuse, of course, um, uh, the government comes in and there's a lot of penalties and all that. Whereas the European Union first see data as something private, which has be, can be protected, which should be protected, and from there, if it is within this protective environment, we are ready to trade it, I mean, to put it very simple, and we see it as an economic good. From there follows a lot of divergent views. Think about the privacy shield, which is not a topic in TTC, but it's, it's always around. And the second point, which is always around in TTC, is China. And US is very China-concentrated in the TTC. We see China as one topic, but it's not the only one. So the core goal in TTC is to improve our, say, common standards. And that is not, in, in a very technical sense, it's not about harmonizing standards, but it's about mutual recognition, it's about conformity assessment, all that, in order to create a transatlantic marketplace in technologies, which then is big enough to compete with China, or which sets the global standards. So we don't want to uh, leave it to China to set global standards, which is their strategy. So this is a bit, and I leave it with that, <coughs> what is all about the TTC and also a lot of other talks we are having with the United States government. Jim? Great, thank you. It's nice, uh, my family's from Bavaria, so it's nice to be here in the sunny north. And I thank the organizers for <coughs> inviting me. Um, a couple quick points. We had a little, some of us had a discussion uh, before lunch about the audiences after lunch tend to be sleepy, so we thought we'd be a little provocative. I hope we can live up to that. The US is a little obsessed with China and China and technology, and we can talk about why that is. I would say being the victims of the world's largest espionage campaign, Pace, Edward Snowden, uh, is one thing that makes the US a bit hostile. But this is not a great power contest, right? This is a contest over values, right? It's not that we are a power and they're a power and we don't want them to be a power. We don't care if they're a power, right? But we do care when they try and impose their rules on us, when they try and impose Marxist-Leninist rules on us. It's a contest over values. It's not a great power contest. Second, we had some discussion this morning about the, will the US be able to force the rest of the world to make a choice? I don't care. People didn't make a choice in the Cold War, right? The majority of the world was not on our side. In fact, I was telling someone that in 1958, there's notes from an Eisenhower, <coughs> pardon me, from an Eisenhower National Security Council meeting where Eisenhower is complaining, why do all these countries not want to support us, right? It was true 70 years ago, it's true today. We will do what we need to do with or without other countries, right? And that's one luxury of being a big power. It'd be, it's better, of course, to have other countries on your side. This has implications for the discussion we'll have over multilateral versus 
unilateral. And multilateral export controls are much more effective depending on the technology. But at the end of the day, it's not going to be a make or break issue. Um, what, now comes the inflammatory part. Uh, when the US does something, it's protectionist. Uh, when the European Union does it, it's protecting sovereignty. No, um, there's gotta be some equivalence here, right? And so one of the issues that I hope we can talk about and where I think the conference has been very useful is how do we get a 21st century negotiating agenda, transatlantic negotiating agenda? I note that the thing is called trade and technology. It's not a trade negotiation, it's trade and technology. So we need to figure out what are the issues in this 21st century negotiation. You've heard from some of my colleagues what they might be. We need to figure out what the trades are. And if you're a negotiator, a trade is what concessions am I willing to make? What concessions do I want from you? And it's that intersection that tells us what the negotiation would look like. Given the commonalities and the long history of partnership on the transatlantic basis, we should be able to do this, but we need to maybe accelerate things a little bit, right? Um, I think intangibles are a good example, but for me, one of the things that's most worrisome is the European approach to technology uh, kills growth, right? Or harms growth, that might be a little more, a little less inflammatory. How do we get that to change? And there are differences on some issues. Uh, the second one is how do we deal with the need for regulation? Very different regulatory cultures, a clear need for regulation, at the same time regulation is not the goal in itself. The goal is to make our societies better and stronger. And on a final note, you know, you hear some countries in Europe say they want sovereignty, but they do things that undercut the economic strength that sovereignty requires, right? If you are a, a leading European military power and you run out of ammunition in two days, you are not going to be sovereign, right? So these are important issues for the US to reach understandings with our European allies, but some of the assumptions we want to have going in, I w was also saying in a conversation that in, I have a lot of Chinese friends and, in the government, and they say the US is handicapped because we had a winning strategy in the 20th century, and we can't get over that, right? And that handicaps us. I'd say that sometimes the transatlantic dialogue is handicapped because we had a winning strategy in the 20th century. So how do we accelerate the evolution of this to something better fitted for today. Your turn. Oh, sorry. No, it is his turn. <laughs> Tim. Well, um, I want to, just like uh, the previous speakers, I want to thank for, for the opportunity to speak here. I'm, um, it's uh, nonetheless a bit of questionable honor because despite the correctly uh, uh, title that you, that you see on the screens, the only topic I'm working on is China for the last 15 to 20 years. So if you ask me what in the tech uh, sphere is the most uh, uh, severe challenge or so, I, I might be biased. Um, so for me, I look through the lens of, of China. And if that's the lens, then I think the main challenge is that we need to adapt to, to what China poses in, in the field of technology. And I'll say, of course, a few words about this, but we shouldn't adopt too much Chinese uh, uh, policies, Chinese approaches to that. Um, and I think that finding the right balance between adapting to the new situation but not adopting Chinese practices uh, is a severe issue that, um, in, in my view, uh, both Europeans and Americans are struggling with at the moment. Um, so what is China? Um, in a nutshell, and of course, we need to unpack all these uh, dimensions further, but I think China in the tax sphere uh, is, um, as a challenge, I think, a challenge in, in four different ways. First, it is an economic challenge because, yes, just like in so many other economic fields, we, we do face an uneven playing field. Um, 
Chinese tech companies simply operate under very different conditions. Some of those are favorable, others are less favorable, or, or uh, to, to some extent, of course, also our uh, ecosystems have their advantages. But it's an uneven playing field that for very long we thought would sort of uh, be a very different uh, and, 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 and uh, less important um, uh, difference between the two sides because we wrongly thought that in a country like China, innovation was not possible, creativity was simply not there, and they would always play the catch-up uh, game. And that turned out to be, to be wrong, and we can discuss a bit why that, that was the case. But sort of, so we are facing a very different uh, uh, situation, I think, with this uneven economic playing field. Second dimension, I think, is a political uh, one. We do have uh, the um, uh, confrontation here between uh, two sides. Um, I do think it is a power uh, a competition between great powers. I don't necessarily, I mean, but, but it has a values uh, dimension that is uh, driving at least large parts of it. But to me, sort of the political dimension here is one over a competition over influence, I think. The third, uh, to, in, in China, uh, poses uh, again a sort of a, a much more apparent uh, uh, threat or apparent uh, uh, force uh, in, in this, politically speaking. The third dimension is the security angle. I think um, the more we get uh, uh, into hybrid warfare, etc., the more apparent it becomes that it is extremely difficult in almost all emerging and foundational technologies to clearly distinguish purely civilian and dual use applications. So once we introduce this criterion that, for example, we will be ready and we will remain ready to cooperate with China for whatever that is not uh, for, for, for n with zero chance going to get uh, uh, any use uh, for military application, then be essentially uh, on a race to the bottom and will essentially uh, rule out almost any cooperation uh, in the technology field. And fourth and finally, I think, um, the, it's the value question, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure we are going to talk about this a lot. So what do I mean by adapting? So we need to adapt to, to, to this new situation that China is a very apparent um, challenger here, uh, a very forceful one that we shouldn't underestimate, that frankly we should also not always overestimate. Sometimes we also conflate ambition with actual achievements by the Chinese side. We also need to be careful on that. But even if we get China properly, I think it's clear that China is a force to stay and that we need to deal with it somehow. Um, and the fact that technolo technological development, uh, economics, and political goals are so closely intertwined in China does require us to adapt. But if we adopt, um, Chinese practices, then I think we are on a losing track because the Chinese political economy uh, that I've just sort of broadly described as interlinking political, economic, technological goals so closely is sort of better equipped uh, if we sort of don't play to our own strengths. Um, so they, they are better in what they do and we are better in what we do. So yes, we need to adapt, but we shouldn't adopt, otherwise we are on the losing track. Thank you. Um, so why is the U.S. obsessed with China? Well, there's a couple reasons. And in some ways, the date of the conference is significant. None of you, very few of you probably realize what it is. December 7th was the last war we had in the Pacific. I should note that in that war, only Australia and the U.K. were our partners, right? China was a partner, too. The Chinese tend to ignore that you had 500,000 American troops in China to fight the Japanese. They leave that out of their histories which is cute. But the lesson that came out of that, which continued, remember, before World War II, the American army was smaller than the army of Belgium, right? Because we didn't care. I think most Americans still don't care. I mean, Super Bowl was the national holiday, right? But the lesson that created an infrastructure, a set of institutions aimed at national security, and you can argue about whether it's gone too far or it's too much, but you created a profession, a set of institutions whose job it was to avoid future Pearl Harbors. And the goal was to avoid a position where an authoritarian power would dominate global rule setting. And that's the driver here. And that's why they're obsessed. Because she certainly, and Tim knows this really well, 
she certainly is not at all bashful about saying, you know, China's at the center of the world stage and should set the rules, blah, 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 set the standards, as Bernard said. Um, that's why we're obsessed. And the idea that we want to be a great power, I, I don't know, I'm tired of this leader of the free world nonsense, but I mean, it's, it's very popular in Washington. I don't know how seriously people take it, but they take China very seriously. I mean, I ask this because it seems to be the main topic that is on the tip of anyone's tongue and the only thing that, I mean, I mean, obviously Ukraine is high up the priority list, there are domestic economic issues up the priority list, but um, it just, it's, it's tangible that there is a seismic shift in the, in the U.S. conception of itself and conception of um, being under threat by an external power. Right, and I think that that's something that shouldn't be um, underestimated here when you look over and say, well, why, why, why this rhetoric, right? Um, so that's why I try to get, uh, dig down into it a little bit, but is, um, is, uh, is Germany obsessed with China? No, <coughs> not in that sense. <coughs> and I would make a core difference, and um, thank you to, uh, that I have the chance to elaborate a bit more on that. Look, in history, and I, I, I like history, and, and, and I'd like to learn from history, in the past, Russia, of course, was a big threat in terms of military power as it was to the United States. Russia was never a challenge to the US regarding technology, also then, I, except for nuclear power, but that was all. For the rest, Russia is like a developing country with some oil and gas, we know, and some military power, and that's it. Now, China's different, and this is a new challenge to the US. It is also a bit of a challenge for us, but in a different sense. China is close to a cutting edge of technology in many regards. Still a bit lagging behind on average, but we don't know. China is very diversified, Russia is not, regarding its potential. And China has a very smart strategy to catch up. Also where Russia is a bit rough, a bit brutal in this sense. So and this makes China so threatening and so fascinating. And modern competitions will not be fought via pure military power, the simple Ukraine stuff. They will be fought by our dominance about technology, dominance about communication systems, dominance regarding data. And this is the core fear of the United States, which is to a certain extent shared by us. So this is why the Tate and Technology Council is so important for both of us. But in the same line, US wants to dominate. And this makes a difference. It wants to dominate regarding availability of data and all that, whereas we lo are looking for a partnership on equal footing in many regards. Not in all regards, we can't do that, but in many regards. So there is some lack of trust with the US, also due to the Trump years, which still are in our, <laughs> our heads and on our back. And it is about intangibles. And this is why I feel, and as intangibles are very difficult to manage, to channel, to channel and all that because you don't know what is really behind it. It's not like, uh, like goods who are crossing the Atlantic, crossing the Pacific, you have statistics, you have data, you have everything. Um, you don't have it with all these intangibles, with knowledge to put it more broadly. And I found it so interesting what I learned when I was in Washington two weeks ago because we talked about outbound investment. And I tried to understand, I talked with people from state and treasury and then they explained to me, no, it's not about that our experts will be sent to China. No engineer now wants to go to China because it's not very funny to live there. And it's very, ob uh, very uh, uh, obvious. But they explained to me, they have, we have so many private, fund, private equity funds and so many venture capital, and they like to invest into Chinese startups, which is per se not a problem. But the problem comes here. These venture capitalists bring Chinese startups, smart people, in direct contact with experts from all over the world, and they don't meet in China, they don't necessarily meet in the United States, but they meet in, say, Singapore or elsewhere. And then you have the exchange of knowledge, which you can't control. You don't know what these people are talking about, and you don't know if there is something that will hand over to them, because it's extremely difficult to control the flow of intangibles. So this is the core fear, and we share this fear, I understand that, but again, China is, and this is where I disagree with you, I, I, I agree that it's also about values, and I, I, I prefer the US many times to China, regardless to tell, needless to tell you. But 
the US sometimes tried to exploit our position as a sandwich, you know, in Europe being heavily hit by the Ukraine war, being uh, having more problems with decoupling from Russia, being having a problem with keeping more distance from China, and they try to exploit that for their own benefit, which is fine. That's this Anglo-American pragmatism. I like it. I can handle. But we have to be aware. And again, the geopolitical dimension is something which we understand, but we are not a competitor. So this is where where the divergence occurs. So this is why we are less upset. So you see a maintenance of German, com German economic comparative advantage um, in, in, as, a, as, as a sort of status quo, right? Because what the US is worrying, worrying about is losing its, um, its edge um, and its ability to compete in international markets um, and in, in high-end technologies, yeah. right? That's why it's developing this broad set of system. And I, can, I share your concern about out outbound investment screening. We can talk offline about that. I think it's crazy. but. Or at least we don't know how to package it yet. Um, but again, you know, so, so Germany still is, believes, right, that there is a that we're still in, in a um, in a geopolitical and geoeconomic position to maintain that comparative advantage. Again, Ger Germany may, Germany's wealth is generated by multinationals that can produce at relatively low cost at right. home while generating gross national income that's that comes back from overseas, right? Right. Is that model durable right now? Uh, regarding the current energy crisis, we have to think about this model. It's not durable as a complete status quo because in the end, we will have higher energy costs in the long run and th they will remain. So we have lost competitiveness and we have lost wealth because our terms of trade have come down. So we have to rethink this model. And this is why we think the TTC is extremely important for us because we have look more into the, our competitiveness in intangibles. Yeah? We have to catch up with artificial intelligence, quantum computing, all that, and also regarding skills, international, uh, and international exchange uh, regarding skills. And so, but our core goal with the TTC is really to create what we call a transatlantic marketplace for cutting edge technologies and say green transformi transformation. So, and this is why we think regulatory cooperation is key, but this means that we have to compromise on both sides of the Atlantic, and there we found all these vested interests we have found in the TTIP on both sides of the Atlantic, by the way. Uh, and uh, so we, and, and we see that we always have to, it's, it's a kind of moving target, let's put it like that, because there will never be a kind of status quo, a stationary situation where you can define what is the uh, state of the art with cutting edge technology. It always goes on and on and on. And I give you an example of the semiconductors because I've worked on that. The US is of the view now, and this is the change from, from uh, Trump to Biden. Trump thought, oh, it's bad to have a trade deficit with China. We should do something about it. So he put tariffs on, I don't know what, you know, and a lot of toys and all that. Uh, because he thought this is, this is important, which is not. Now, the Biden administration, this is so interesting, they've identified certain small, tiny components which make a difference. And one of these tiny components is semiconductors of a certain nano, what is it, nanogram, nanometer, I don't know, I'm not a technician. But they have identified very particular tiny little things which make a difference. And they try their utmost to prevent China from having access to these particular tiny semiconductors with all uh, available methods. One being that US citizens and green card holders are now forbidden to support in any regard China's attempts to get these uh, semiconductors, be it through the logistics, be it through helping with shipping and everything, which is a completely new approach, which is very interesting. And this is also what I also meant. I don't know if this strategy will be successful, but referring to outbound investment, I'm not sure if this is obsession with this idea to meet in Singapore and all that, and having the wrong students at, your, at US universities you know, somehow being linked to China, or if this is a real challenge. I said, I don't know. I was surprised to see what state and the treasury told me. And with the semiconductors, I, I'm not an engineer, but I, I have identified this US strategy, and we have no choice but to follow because U.S. is dominating in the area of export controls. But to add a positive note, export controls and investment screening 
the cooperation has become excellent. Mm -hmm. I leave it with that. Absolutely. <laughs> can I, <laughs> I, agree can with I that. put a tiny footnote on the upbound investment? Because I was involved in that. Just this administration did, as Byrne said, identify semiconductors and tech, semiconductor technology <coughs> as a choke point. Mm -hmm. um, a review of the situation found that Chinese growth in semiconductors was dependent on foreign assistance on US from, from the yeah. US and from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And there are some US investment firms that have invested in Chinese semiconductor companies. Mm -hmm. And to help them succeed, they're improving their production capacity, their workforce skills, their business plans. Mm -hmm. Perfectly logical from a business sense, but not in the national interest. Right, but then, again, then I think it's going back to what we were saying. It's not about the actual transfer of technology. It's the um, injection of capital that allows for that development, mm -hmm. right? The capital injection that maybe we should be doing in Europe and the United States, right? It's about the restriction of the movement of capital versus mm -hmm. technology. Um, but, so, but not only means, that, I, mean, I mean, your company is not dependent upon energy prices in the same way as some of the other, uh, other uh, German ones that are, put, uh, are under challenge right now. But if you, if you hear this debate, right, mm -hmm. and, you, and you say, okay, how do, how do I maintain, how does SAP maintain um, technical eligible edge, its comparative advantage, right? Mm -hmm. what, what's the challenge for you? Um, first of all, let me give you some insight into also our operations in China. Um, we've been in the market for 30 years, and um, it's an incredibly innovative market. So the short time scale between um, idea generation and go-to-market is very short, also because of the ways um, research is being funded um, in China um, in emerging uh, technologies. And can you, can you repeat your question? Yeah, I mean, it's a question of, is about co comparative advantage. How do we yeah. um, maintain our, our comparative advantage? So, um, I mean, diversification is being talked about a lot uh, now, like from the macroeconomic perspective. And um, I mean, that's, that's a very common business strategy. And I think that's also one uh, way that um, SAP has managed to remain competitive over the years since 1972. Um, we, you know, internationalized quickly and are building on the local strength of the diverse markets uh, that we are present in. And um, that also means being present in China because a lot of innovation is happening there and we want to stay in touch with that. Um, but also, um, We've, we are seeing a lot of potential in, in Asia as a whole. Uh, some of our fastest growing markets are in Southeast Asia and how we are fostering the ecosystems there is by um, supporting startups, for example, um, engaging with the wider um, digital ecosystem that we will, you know, that we depend on to grow as well. Um, it is in our interest to strengthen partners and um, smaller companies in that space and um, investing in digital skills so that um, people are able to use our software. So these are a few of the strategies that we pursue um, to uh, maintain a competitive edge. And then of course, um, public-private um, cooperation is also essential, um, providing our technological expertise to policymakers to um, help, I mean, I mean, not help with regulation, but inform um, them and in, their, uh, in the process of, of regulating emerging technologies, which is um, important, of course. And here in Europe, um, we've seen increased public-private uh, cooperation on emerging technologies, for example, by um, uh, the Gaia-X initiative, which is a project to foster digital infrastructure for um, safe and secure data exchange across organizational boundaries, across um, national boundaries. And it's a very nice example of how um, government and companies um, have cooperated to um, create a technological basis that is in line with European values. Um, and where um, 
uh, companies can provide a, yeah, a direct benefit. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you hear you know, our colleagues talking about regulatory convergence, right? Mm -hmm. the regulatory convergence between the US and the EU, does that potentially put some of your Asia um, engagement in question? Yeah, I mean, we've <laughs> observed the trade urgence between Europe and uh, the US uh, with concern. And um, I'd like to second. Um, no, but if they converge, right? Yeah. That actual consensus. I mean, we've seen the tensions, right? But we're hoping through the TTC that they, that, that goes away. Yeah, we hope. Yeah, right? we hope that. And that yeah. I mean, that's uh, that's in our interest. We are a European company, but our largest market is uh, the US. So, it's not and it is in our interest that uh, you know the global economy is based on transatlantic standards and values, um, preferably. So we support the TTC. Um, we, um, we would love for it to have a more systematic uh, uh, stakeholder dialogue uh, with industry so we could provide our feedback in a more efficient way because at, at the end of the day, it will be te technology companies like us who will um, implement uh, what is coming out of the TTC and we're kind of lacking this dialogue right now and I think the same is true for for civil society actors. But yeah, in general, we uh, very much welcome transatlantic convergence on regulation of technology. Yeah. When you hear, so we still hear, and I, 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 I sort of think it's like a fictive, fictive conversation that Germany may be having with itself about talking about a new TTIP, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Why? I mean, not your, not your boss, but <laughs> some other ministers. Not me. No. <laughs> but so, but. So why, I mean, where, I mean, <laughs> so you were, you said you were in the, in the consulate here mm -hmm. during the TTIP negotiations. Uh, you know, I was, in, I, I was, um, I was in DC at the time. A lot of us were part of it in one way or another, right? So this, has the, the, the ship has sailed on that model, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you think about Donald Trump, he wanted to, he wanted to put tariffs on everybody. He's a 1980s man. He thinks that the, the that the future economic, economic relationships with countries are based on tariffs only, right? Mm -hmm. And, and again, a lot of what, um, you know, a lot of the discussion has been to continually reduce whatever tariffs are left, right? That was part of the trump Juncker detente, right, that when I was at the White House. So, you know, tell me a little bit more about how that dynamic has shifted, right? How the, tr the idea of, of trade convergence has shifted between, you know, the, the sort of Uruguay round concept of economic engagement versus what we've created in, um, in now in, you know, between Brussels and Washington. Um, yeah, so TTIP basically tried to, um, th they looked at existing um, regulatory confirm conformity um, across sectors and they tried to align um, existing regulations on, yeah, in lots of different industries, which is much more difficult when um, uh, then the TTC, which looks at sort of, you know, the future economy, um, the digital economy, where a lot of rules have not been set yet. And this is why I, I we as a business community have um, greater hope in, in this project and um, have optimism that maybe this time we get it right, but at the same time we are concerned about the trade irritants that we've talked about several times today already that have kind of overshadowed um, the meeting on Monday and are seemingly bringing us off uh, the path. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, our messaging is to refocus on our shared values and maybe also integrate a mechanism in the TDC that can separately take care of such um, conflicts because we will always have conflicts, close partners will always have most of the conflicts because uh, they're trying to sort out uh, a lot of details, but um, it should not hinder progress across the 10 working groups and we have to be careful, um, I think, of, you know, by putting one protectionist layer over the other for tactical reasons to put ourselves on our gridlock, um, in a gridlock that makes the strategic goal um, more difficult to attain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and Adam, you should, 
you know, Natalie just put her, her finger on the word protectionism. What is your assessment of um, U.S. measures from a, from a macroeconomics perspective so far versus European ones? I think they're pretty minimal uh, in terms of the overall economic impact. And, and we just talked about, or you just asked about, Julia, that are we uh, continuing in the direction of the Uruguay round? The Uruguay round is is done and we've achieved those goals largely. Uh, we're down to like less than 4% average tariff in the world. So I'm sure that's higher than the VAT here in Germany. It's higher than sales tax in most places in the United States. The, the tariff is not a big deal. So now we're going past that uh, and we are encountering all these behind the border uh, trade issues, uh, which raise so many more complicated social issues. Uh, in terms of from the outside reaching in and trying to reorganize the, the social relations that underpin uh, domestic economies. Why, this is why it's uh, so much more uh, contentious uh, than just the tariff uh, reduction agenda. And then you added on some question at the end, and I forgot what no, you I mean, said. Again, I mean, but again, like when you look at the economic measures, I mean, or economic or regulatory measures that both the U.S. and the Europe are sort of inching in towards or running into, or it's, oh, <laughs> it's yeah. the case may be, right? What do you think we're setting up a sustainable model? So I tend to not get uh, very animated about tariffs. A lot of people get very hysterical uh, about uh, the tariffs, but they really have, I think, a, a marginal impact on <coughs> where economic activity is happening and the level uh, of <coughs> economic activity. Um, even with the huge tariffs that the Trump administration imposed across the board and China's uh, technology products under the Section 301 um, findings, uh, you know, most of that tariff got offset almost immediately by a depreciation of the, the renminbi against the dollar. Uh, and what's left is just a, you know, a very little uh, margin wedge uh, between the, the China price and the U.S. Uh, uh, onshore price. Um, the difference is not so big as to really uh, change the, the distribution of, of trade patterns. And we see this in, in the US trade data as well. It didn't have a big uh, impact on where trade flows are coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, but, I mean, Tim, you, you said you were, the, you were an adherent to the great power competition camp, right? And I thought maybe I'll ask you guys all at the end what we think of that. But um, when, you, when you see the development of broad scale subsidization in certain areas, um, uh, you know, just a, a new era of industrial policy. Do you think that's necessary? Do you think that's what 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 we need to do? Uh, yeah, we need a smart and clever industrial policy. Um, that indicates already that I'm a bit skeptical that what we are doing is actually uh, that smart. And let me maybe give you an example uh, from the European Chips Act that is being praised uh, all over uh, this continent now. So what are we doing here? Um, we're reading headlines, we're looking across the Atlantic, and we tend to think that uh, the Americans do know their job. We're just looking at their recipes and think they work for Europe as well. I mean, the truth is um, the actual sum that we attributed uh, in terms of investment to the European Chips Act was not derived from us sort of uh, considering different policy tools. Uh, it didn't start from sort of a proper analysis, uh, then thinking what are the right measures, and then the third step, what do they actually cost, which I think would be sort of the logical step to do. But we first looked at what are, what are the United States actually investing? Um, and we need to match that somehow. And from that and a couple of other negotiations in Europe, we sort of started with the sum and then thought about what to do with it. Second, I think we are uh, not focusing enough sort of on specific ecosystems. We need to understand that there will, won't be sort of one recipe for a number of emerging and foundational technologies that we can apply to each of them and then sort of make ourselves more resilient. The CHIPS Act has actually started I think from the observation of a chip shortage, that's the problem here is resilience in the supply chain. Um, 
Jim has referred to sort of the value differences between both sides. This is, both of these may be absolutely valid concerns, but they're not the same concern. We can think about sort of um, national security concerns. To what extent is um, uh, actually sourcing uh, hardware or software from China uh, turning into um, a national security issue. If for, for the CHIPS Act, by the way, if that had been the main concern, we would have properly thought about uh, 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 the back end, uh, packaging uh, uh, and, and testing, actually. Because that is, I'm also not an engineer, what engineers tell me is where it's the easiest to build back doors into, uh, into chip in, in, in the process of chip manufacturing. This is hardly being mentioned in the CHIPS Act. It is mentioned in the beginning. It wasn't, then it came in a bit more. But it tells you this is also not really the, an, uh, an appropriate means to address national security issues. And I think fourth, it's a technological competitiveness. So it seems to be <clears throat> that the fact that we are simply investing here a lot and uh, focusing very much on what uh, is cutting edge, indeed, uh, seven nanometer uh, chips and below, the question is, who are then uh, the end consumers uh, of, of those products? Do we have sort of the industrial ecosystem? What do we build in, in, in Europe, in Germany? If we have an Intel uh, uh, fab here in, in Magdeburg soon, um, this will produce chips that are, uh, that will surely contribute sort of a, a, a tiny bit to uh, strategic autonomy of, of Europe because we do, we are less dependent then from sourcing from elsewhere. But I mean, the main industry uh, around that would require chips is, is automotive. And automotive is not needing the most cutting edge chips. Actually, they would require a company like Elmos um, uh, to be uh, at the forefront, cutting edge, uh, being sort of able to uh, increase uh, its, uh, its um, capital and, and being sort of able to, to, to properly compete here. Um, so yes, we do need to, to uh, get the state involved somehow and very targetly sort of see sort of understanding ecosystems, understand where can we sort of intervene for the sake of national interests or of European interests. Um, uh, if we rightly sort of identify sort of what precisely is the interest that we are having from sort of a public perspective that the market will not fix and then think sort of what's the right instrument to address that. So in a very targeted manner, yes, but simply sort of investing somehow because there is something going on that is somehow related to, to uh, strategic autonomy, I think it's not, it's not the pro appropriate way. And then we get to the point specifically when things get politicized, uh, where uh, we sell, I, I read on Twitter, I should mention Hamburg port here, where we, where we sell uh, stakes in Hamburg port, but where we forbid uh, a, a really uh, non-sensitive uh, investment uh, by a Swedish company that is uh, owned by China into uh, one uh, fab uh, of Elmos here. So, and, and actually, his ministry, uh, uh, many other institutions had got both decisions, I think, right. And then we have sort of politics intervening, seeing the headlines, uh, playing sort of a political game, and then uh, we end up with what, what we do. So if we sort of try to take out all the politics out, uh, sort of think more properly, sort of what do we want to achieve, uh, how, in, in what ways is the market not fixing that and then sort of very targetly intervening. That I think is, is the right strategy. So we do need the state, but not in the way we're doing it at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think the thing about markets not fixing the problem, right? This conception of, we now realize that markets do not provide ultimate, uh, ultimate economic efficiency in the way we conceive of it, right? Um, certainly not the way I read my trade textbooks when I was in graduate school. Um, but I mean, so but you say you you've been you've been doing this for 20 years, right? You, you're a China expert for 20 years. Why, I mean, you probably saw this coming before governments did, and before I mean, again, if you think if if I think about this the debate about the questions that we're having today, I, it's about a five-year debate, right? Mm -hmm. It's now the center. It's all we're talking about right now. But what what was the trigger, and why why did it take so long? 
Well, first of all, let me start with one sort of positive note, and again, reference to Hamburg Port here. I started to have the conversation about a potential Chinese investment into Hamburg uh, Port with the German government, even though I was based still in Sweden, four years ago for the first time. It was not that this was a new uh, issue that came on everyone's table. So it's not always that we're so <laughs> ill-prepared. It's sometimes the dynamics that sort of uh, take shape of, of, of things. It's not that people in our ministries were so stupid and dumb and were only uh, uh, running into this uh, last minute or something, as has been uh, said by some of the politicians, but only because they don't care doesn't mean uh, also the ministry officials don't care. So, but put that sort of aside, why has it become such sort of uh, issue? I think at least for um, Europe, it has the, the 5G discussion and the question whether to allow Huawei in or not has, I think, been a fundamental uh, game changer. Um, uh, and so it were concerns, I think, originating in Australia, but then sort of uh, being brought to Europe, uh, mostly through the US. I think that has been the trigger for us. And then I think people started to, uh, to realize, well, this is not a one-off topic. This is not just 5G. This is not just mobile infrastructure. This is a broader uh, issue. And again, I mean, there were plenty of people uh, sort of understanding this, but if you ask sort of what was the trigger to make this sort of publicly visible, uh, bringing it onto the agenda of politicians, I think it was the 5G discussion. It was 5G. Mm -hmm. um, audience questions, we have about a half an hour left. Please. Thank you for an incredibly interesting uh, discussion. Um, I have two questions, one for Tim and one for everyone. <laughs> so I w was wondering if you, Tim, could develop a little bit what you said about uh, that we, uh, that China's better at doing China things than we are. Uh, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, there's a parallel discussion around that on reciprocity when it comes to, um, you know, journalist visas and that we shouldn't outdo, we shouldn't out China China when it comes to those things because it will not uh, improve, uh, you know, human rights uh, if, if we don't uh, allow Chinese journalists, whether they're state media or not in Europe, just because China doesn't allow uh, European journalists in, in China. Uh, but so I'm wondering what you are uh, referring to when you talk about uh, that we shouldn't outdo China. Uh, and then the other question is a few all. Um, if you were to sort of integrate human rights, human rights by design when it comes to uh, new technologies, what is the one area uh, that you would uh, see to, to be crucial? What, what's the one thing you would each uh, want to do? Tim, you want to take the first one and then we'll move into the second? Sure. Um, I would, uh, why shouldn't we, or in what way is China doing better the China way? Um, well, I think for that it's useful to understand why China became innovative uh, despite us expecting that China is not creative um, and can never be creative in, in this uh, authoritarian system. I think it's mainly three factors. The first is uh, China was never so, had never sort of uh, 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 fully protected its market, but it always never fully opened its market. So it was, I think, a semi-protected market. Um, I think always that the um, introduction of the Great Firewall and its role is uh, a very uh, illustrative example because, I mean, we saw the um, Chinese internet being shielded through the Chinese firewall primarily through the lens of censorship, uh, information control. And I think this was from the Chinese perspective, yes, a desired effect, but it was, own, but if that had been the case, <coughs> I think, the Chinese would have um, cut off the Chinese internet completely. I think the main purpose of this semi-protected market um, and this semi-protected uh, internet sphere in that case 
uh, was actually to allow some uh, uh, enough ideas in to, to prosper, but also shield uh, Chinese tech companies enough from competition. So, so I think it had more of an innovation and economic uh, uh, aspect to it uh, uh, than, than just sort of information control and censorship. Um, the second uh, element, I think, uh, was interaction with the West. We've been focusing a lot on stealing. I think we've very often forgot about learning, um, that the Chinese learned a lot from us, um, reverse engineering, but also because um, Chinese who worked in the Silicon Valley elsewhere returned not just with specific technological knowledge, but also with knowledge about how innovation ecosystems work. So that, I think, was a second element. And the third, and that is, I think, where China is particularly specific, I think, is that um, let's take the example of uh, five-year plans, that there has always been sort of a macroeconomic or macro-technical signaling, but without sort of providing very specific guidelines that would have cut off uh, innovation and creativity. It was sort of more a signaling we want to get to A, and therefore we signal by means of five-year plans uh, of macroeconomic planning that we uh, want to mobilize the necessary resources for that, and we want to uh, also allow for enough deregulation for this to happen. So it was sort of more opening up space for innovation. And if you look, and if if we focus sort of on, on the third element here for a second, I think um, what is necessary to understand is that China has been competing on scale and not on efficiency. And I, and I absolutely don't see us uh, sort of being able to compete on that. I don't see sort of our willingness to pour so abundant resources into that to allow for such inefficient solutions. And also, I don't see that we are so far behind that we actually need to change course on that. And first and foremost, I also don't see sort of how this very close linkage of us being able to signal um, uh, and sort of adjust in this very close relationship between innovation and uh, public actors. Um, I'm speaking too long, but just one uh, final example, and very briefly, maybe. So if we look at a field where I've been studying quite a lot, which is technical standard setting. Technical standards are being developed privately driven here, and China has, despite its state-directed approach, also allowed for a lot of private actor involvement there, because they also saw that they actually need that. But the secretariat, so those that actually lead national standard setting in China, are research uh, institutions that are part and parcel of Chinese ministries. We simply don't have that. There's someone sitting there who, who wears two head, heads at the same time. He's a ministry official and he is a researcher. Um, and it requires sort of a complete rethinking of science and how we want to drive uh, research and innovation in this country. Of course, we hand out public funding, but then there's independent research. And if we don't want to radically break with that, um, then I don't think that we should copy paste. You have those. Uh, close linkages where you have people with dual heads uh, in China in so many uh, cases, in so many instances, that um, I think the, the ways are shorter, it is closer aligned. So they are, they're quite efficient and quite good in what they're doing, uh, but the system is, is uh, simply fundamentally different. And that's why I said, so one of the worries uh, that I'm having at the moment is that we become too Chinese uh, now that we rightly identify China as a challenge, but that we ourselves become too Chinese. Would any of you else like to respond to that? Respond to? Either Tim or the question. Oh. Well, I think the, you, the second question on the... Yeah, well, whatever. Yeah, either okay. way. So I was in China uh, a few years ago at their big global internet conference, and they were showing me the they had me meet with the executives of some Chinese AI company, the CEO. And they had some really cool stuff. Um, but I asked the Chinese CEO, well, aren't you worried about the risks of artificial intelligence? And he said, let's not talk about risk. Let's talk about opportunity. And so I think I'd like to see that to be one of the changes in the discussion. There's an element of protectionism. We've talked about that. There's an element shared transatlantically of technophobia, right? So how would you how would you 
refocus the discussion to emphasize the opportunity as well. People talk about the risks of technology, but I think the benefits still outweigh the risk. When you, and for human rights, um, is freedom from hunger important? Is freedom from disease important? Where do you balance them? And I, I, sometimes they seem to be left out of the discussion. Um, I can share a bit of, um, about what we are doing um, on human rights and emerging technology. Um, I mean, back in the 70s, uh, the company didn't have any human rights specialists or people with a, an ethics background, um, and that changed, of course. Um, they developed guidelines for the ethical development um, of AI, but you can't only rely on internal specialists since um, it is more difficult to say things that are unpopular to the to the business, so we have an external advisory council um, on AI ethics consisting of representatives from industry, academia, civil society. And uh, they look at new AI services, for example, that we want to integrate in our solutions. And they say no sometimes. So we had a case recently um, for a software solution in, in, in production, so it was for um, a customer handling dangerous goods, and the solution was meant to recognize people on the production floor to warn them if they enter the, the dangerous zone. But the council found that you know this facial recognition could be misused by unjust regimes, and therefore um, it was not implemented. And these are things that every business can do. We are not uh, required to have such councils, but um, it is better for us to have this external view and to ensure um, this kind of sustainability in, in our products. Mm -hmm. Also a good way of anticipating what uh, governments may ask, right? Yeah, yes, that, that's very important. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Yeah, please. Um, from Taiwan. And this is the second time Taiwan's mentioned. Normally in the context, Ukraine and Russia. And the second context is, uh, you, uh, is semiconductor, for good or for bad. Okay, uh, um, I would like to trace a bit about the uh, history of semiconductor. If we, if we go back to get an irregular run, and especially in the context of U, U, uh, EU or EEC, uh, that's a case, uh, US and Japan, they reach uh, this uh, voluntary uh, uh, export agreement, which U uh, US force or try to uh, convince Japan to export the semiconductor to a minimum uh, volume, which could, would not prevent or undermine the economic prosperity of US uh, semiconductors. And those, uh, in those days, the semiconductor came into Europe so US, uh, the EU filed a campaign against Japan in the GATT uh, area. So this is uh, the EEC minimum uh, export price for semiconductor. And it's uh, about 1980s in, say, uh, when semiconductor is a not profitable enterprise. So that's why, and after that, uh, that's why, and also semiconductor is highly polluted, and it demands a lot of uh, electricity, energy, something. So that's why a semiconductor st uh, start phasing out in Japan, then it come to Korea and Taiwan. And that's also when a uh, semiconductor, they, they start leads this idea of fabulous, uh, which you also can also be called as contracting uh, manufacturing which is uh, uh, TSMA, uh, TSMC is very good at it. It basically provides the cheap service to those uh, fabric uh, semiconductor, or especially these, uh, how should I say that, for these uh, IC designers, they don't need to uh, uh, produce their chips for themselves. And this is uh, what the US is good at with. So I do agree uh, what uh, Tim said, the need for chips or semiconductor in the US, in, in, 
in EU, EU is different. For European part, it need this not high end, but in the US, they need a high end, and especially for uh, de defense uh, industries and for US defense. And so my question is, when we talk about uh, semiconductors, what um, the EU has different needs, and they have uh, if, and we look into the European chips as that's a uh, one key provision saying that those uh, chips uh, which receive subsidies in in Europe they cannot be subject to exterior uh, application of uh, foreign laws and foreign regulations. In this context, European Chips S is end mean against US. <coughs> so when it, uh, when it comes to technology sovereignty or technology se economic uh, security, in fact, the e e Europe is aiming against US instead, instead of aiming, aiming against China. So my question is, do you, uh, you know, it, with a view to preserve economic uh, security or technology sovereignty, do we see any uh, feasibility, really, I mean, uh, for US and EU to work together? Mm -hmm. Because I think, if I understand correctly, even it, in the context anti coercion Act, it is against you against US, but not against China. So, and the second question is, uh, relating to the human rights issues, we tend to believe technology would be benefit and should have no difference to any countries. But I would say this is a fallacy. Technology is used, especially something like AI or surveillance technology. It is used in a way much different in, in authoritarian countries than in Europe. So the following question is how to design a policy instrument to prevent those, those emerging uh, technologies being used as an instrument to suppress human rights or something. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I guess it's a two-part question, right? So how do the US and the EU actually um, work in parallel to um, not uh, you know, use economic coercion or anti-economic coercion instruments against each other when trying to build up domestic capacity, right? And then, and, and then again, a little bit more about um, the development of, of fundamental industries and, um, and regulatory policy. So maybe we'll, we'll start with yeah, you. Yeah, I, I can briefly um, yeah. answer from a political point of view. I mean, I don't like the a notion of European sovereignty too much because it can be misinterpreted. I understand sovereignty as the freedom to act. Many people in Europe will think European sovereignty means that we have to do everything on our own. That is having 100% of value added in certain value and supply chains, everything made in Europe, which is rubbish, to be clear. We cannot afford it. We, it is a perfect program into poverty because our wealth relies on interaction with our neighbors. Our wealth relies on international division of labor on a broad scale. So when we define sovereignty as the freedom to act and do our utmost to, re to keep this freedom to act, it's fine. When we understand it as producing everything, say in Germany, in France or elsewhere, I would say it's the wrong path. And this very much goes along with uh, what uh, Tim has said, that is not follow the Chinese path, not step too much into a state-run economy because then we, were on, we will be on the losing path because in the end, a, a state-run economy also means losing our freedom, uh, losing our freedom to decide, our private freedom to decide. Then it will be done by bureaucrats. And also, and this also refers to a question, um, there's a tendency to overstretch the notion of national security. Uh, and we see it now also with the US, we see it also here in Europe, because you can define everything is in the interest of national security. And this reminds me of the discussion in 2009 when we had the systemic uh, relevance 
and, and suddenly a, a German autobauer named Opel was systemically relevant, which it never was. And now, of course, each and every company shows up and says uh, what we do is, in, is, in, in these, uh, is important for our national security. And then, of course, we need exemptions from this or that, which also refers to the CHIPS Act. And the European CHIPS Act, there's, of course, tendencies to expand the European CHIPS Act to all kinds of, of, of industries, which is dangerous because we have very well established state aid control in the European Union. And uh, if we return to that each and every member state can do what it wants in order to subsidize its own national industry, forget about the European Union. So th this is not a step forward. This is my general answer to your question. Hmm. I like to sort of phrase it sometimes as the distinction between national economic interest or the interest of welfare, state welfare, and national security. And I agree, it's a very, um, well, it's, it's icy. As I said, I don't deny, I don't deny the, the, the idea of national security. I only have said there is a tendency to overstretch it and to mm -hmm. use it for different purposes. Yeah. yeah, and if I may add, I mean, if we take the transatlantic partnership seriously, then maybe we would more often think about transatlantic interests. And yeah. I think both the EU and the US could do better uh, with not um, hurting each other with their individual economic policies. And I don't even think the IRA was meant to hurt Europe. Um, it did. Maybe it would have been better to consult with uh, partners beforehand. The EU, on the other hand, is sometimes intentionally hurting uh, American tech companies, and we also have to be honest with that. Um, there's a new cybersecurity certification uh, process being developed that foresees 30% um, ownership, European ownership. So. A cybersecurity certificate is being made dependent on um, ownership when it's actually, it should be purely technical standards, right? So we in Europe also have to be honest uh, with ourselves uh, sometimes when we criticize our American partners. But overall, as I said, both sides could maybe use um, venues like the TTC better to consult with each other. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, maybe. Please go ahead. And then there's a two finger right, Tim, but you go first. Oh, no, 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 no. Go yeah. Tim, go ahead. So the, the, the goal, I think, on both sides of the Atlantic is to uh, reduce the risk of dependence on China and Russia because they have proven to be partners willing to exploit their economic strengths for political purposes in ways that uh, pursue goals that we would not support. So when you think of what China attempted to do to Australia or Korea, they could do it to you. Right? So it's not to end globalization, it's to reduce the dependence on these two countries. And in this, the Huawei story was significant. Huawei grew out of a very predatory Chinese policy that involved uh, exceptional ex es economic espionage, uh, non-compliant loans and subsidies that went contrary to the WTO. Uh, the Huawei story in some ways is the, it, Huawei started out as the poster child of Chinese industrial policy and now it's the poster child of why people worry about China. But the question, for a minute I thought you were French when you were asking about could we get a transatlantic deal. Uh, I think it's quite possible. There's a history of partnership. There's a history of shared values, right? The dilemma we have now is that for reasons relating to security, which can be overstated. Um, the US, at least, has decided to um, renew its industrial policies, to build technologies that it thinks are crucial for national security moving forward. And this does give competitive advantage, not just to US companies, but to European companies or Japanese companies present in the US. But managing the tension of this industrial policy uh, that has not been here for 30 years. Um, managing that tension is, I think, part of what we have on, on our agenda here, which leads me to how do we get a, a new, and TTC is a step in the right direction, a new transatlantic trade and technology agenda that focuses on identifying the issues where we have disagreements. But I'm, I'm ultimately confident that with perhaps one exception, we will be able to reach that agreement. 
there is a degree of hostility. Speaking now from the U.S. perspective, I don't know what Adam thinks. At times, there does appear to be a degree of hostility from Brussels that's unwarranted and a degree of suspicion. But I know that my colleagues in Washington would lecture me if I beat up too much on that and say that, no, ultimately, we're so similar and our interests are so closely aligned that we will be able to reach a deal. But we have not yet identified the steps to reaching that deal, starting. But that's, I think, where we need to focus. So, you know, what's the alternative? I mean, do you want to go it alone? Neither of us would be better off. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not uh, the right one to sort of uh, lay out a transatlantic uh, agenda for cooperation and what the prospects are. But Jim wanted us to be provocative after lunch. So let me uh, drop one provocative uh, note here in a, in a transatlantic <laughs> conference. I mean, the fact that I agree that, I mean, this is uh, a systemic competition between China and the West over sort of how do we uh, develop economically and also the underlying political system. And if that's, but the fact that there is a strong value uh, underpinning, that's by, by, uh, sorry to say, but I don't think that it, it's best served if we just think of French oring, how we do stuff with partners we like because we share the values, etc., etc. In the end, this will be to a large extent also an economic competition if we stay sort of attractive and more attractive to our citizens. And that requires us to be less dependent on China, certainly, but that it's, it's really a lot about diversification and not necessarily just working with friends and allies because things the hell need to remain relatively cheap. Prices are going up everywhere at the moment anyways. So we need uh, to make sure that our economic and uh, political model remains attractive to our citizens. That is sort of a part of this uh, value confrontation. So it may be counterintuitive, but the American, I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't align and cooperate across the Atlantic, but this is in the end about diversification and not about French shoring. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we have a couple more questions. I'm, I'm, how am I on? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you uh, both ask, each of you ask a question very, very quickly in 20 seconds. My first question is, how are we on time? Uh, thank you to this panel. Uh, this was a very stimulating and perhaps provocative talk. Uh, my question is for Mr. Lewis directly. Um, uh -oh. You mentioned before that your colleague uh, in China had uh, commented that the U.S. and Europe had handicapped themselves because they had winning strategies in the 20th century um, but have been unable to move past those strategies. What do you think, uh, or in your eyes, what is that between the U.S. and Europe, specifically on the transatlantic relationship? Why hasn't it been able to develop or come up with a new winning strategy, I would say? And I should note the source of that was a senior colonel in the People's Liberation Army who works in intelligence. So it's not someone who, it just wasn't a random remark. Uh, he was reflecting internal discussions. I don't want, I wondered that, did we, we got sort of fat and lazy, didn't we? I mean, when, uh, particularly in America, where, um, you know, we were so pleased with ourselves from our resistance to the multi-decade threat of, uh, communism that we kind of slacked off a little bit and we kind of let other things and reasonably so i mean we cashed in the peace dividend in the early 1990s cut r d spending why bother we didn't need to compete with anyone so i wonder how much of it now is driven by the change in the international security environment which i would not define as great power competition to beat uh, this again it's a competition between two different systems it's a risk to our security. And we would be more comfortable with European partners than with others, not excluding Japan and Australia, of course. So I think we just got fat and lazy, and now we're kind of catching up. I would add to that, I think. I mean, there's a, a certain hubris at the end of history that we <laughs> assumed uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union that our institutions, our way, were the only way and the right way, and that, that uh, that event, uh, 
he confirmed that. And so why do we have to think about an, a different way to do things? Right. Capital markets could handle it very quickly. Peter Behrens from the Europa Colleague Hamburg. Very briefly, I, under, I understand you uh, to mean by China, mainland China. Now, I think, to my understanding, Taiwan does have the cutting edge in semiconductor and, and nanotechnology, not mainland China. Taiwan is said to be one year ahead of mainland China. So if if uh, I understood you, Mr. Lewis, to say that the Biden administration wants to prevent China, mainland China, to have access to Western technology, semiconductor technology. Now, how about the possibility of mainland China to get access to Taiwanese technology by using force, military force? No way? Is this something you don't factor in? It's so impossible. Yeah, yeah, because it's very simple. I mean, can give a very simple answer. In case China invades Taiwan, I mean, let's take it, all the engineers will be gone beforehand together with technology because it's not about shipping big uh, machinery across the Pacific. It's quite knowledge. They'll be gone. That's all. So very simple answer. Also, also we're, we're further ahead than you think. I mean, not just the U.S., but Taiwan and Korea. Uh, the Chinese were hopeful that they would be able to achieve parity uh, by the end of this decade before the U.S. export controls went into place. And now they've had to extend their expectations out into the mid-2030s. So we, we, the Taiwan issue for me is not so much that they'll invade because, you know, that's exactly right. The invade for what end? The issue is more... How do you, if you look at the Chinese chip industry, it's largely built on Western inputs, not just of capital goods, not just of technology, but human capital. This was the point right. you were all making later. And if you look at SMMC, SMIC, for example, or uh, YMTC, um, Taiwanese executives, right? Uh, so I think that's, that will be a political choice for Taiwan at some point. We're attempting to extraterritorially resist that. No, you don't think so? No, let, me, let me briefly add that don't <clears throat> overestimate the role of Taiwan because, again, there's a supply chain behind the ability of Taiwan to produce. And that is uh, fed by, uh, among other companies, by ASML in the Netherlands, uh, by the German mm. companies Trumpf and Zeiss. I mean, I'm right in this business. So <laughs> even if you get the engineers from Taiwan and you keep them in Taiwan, there'll be no supply chain anymore. Forget about it. It's and Chinese will, China will never follow the strategy because it's not, it's, it's, it's not there. No, they have a long time horizon. And I mean, this is a core difference between Russia and China. I mean, China is, in this regard, mm. is quite smart. They rarely use open force. Oh, make a joke. Oh, I was just going to say, I wish Trump would change its name because it has painful memories for some of us. <laughs> There's an F on the end. <laughs> Tim? Yeah. I, I agree with everything. Uh, that, that has just been said, maybe with one exception, but um, uh, I mean, what we shouldn't underestimate is now sort of the trouble that China and the rest of the world would be in mm -hmm. if, uh, if China actually invaded Taiwan, not because uh, China would gain all that uh, uh, technological capacity, but that capacity would essentially be gone. So, so, so it's, an, it's a horror scenario, but it's not as simplistic as the Chinese just get yeah. taking over. That, that I think, uh, is important to understand. Uh, you, you said one, one aspect, and there I slightly disagree. I'm not so sure that the Chinese are having time. I'm not so sure they are so self-confident anymore. I think there is a lot more hesitation uh, in, in, in recent months, in recent years, it, I think it has always been a sort of more skepticism uh, in, in Beijing around, which is why I'm getting more and more concerned about uh, the Taiwan issue and whether the Chinese might have a shorter time horizon that we think, which is also why I found uh, the uh, unofficial or, or non-public strategy from, from the ministry uh, of economics and climate action, really interesting to read. They have sort of a time horizon. 
uh, for 2027. I don't want to necessarily subscri subscribe to that, but I do think that there is a significant risk that that time horizon is correct, but not because the Chinese think they can take over. Uh, that has sort of broader strategic, also symbolic, nationalist uh, reasons. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to gain, I think, for Xi Jinping uh, uh, if he if he wants to take Taiwan. But I don't think it's it's the it's the same. I mean, on that front, I fully mm -hmm. agree with what has been said. I think you're all on, um, you know, just in closing to note that like the you're delineating what I think is is often mixed up, which is military goals, right, and technological goals and economic goals. And as we get sort of wrapped up and spiral upwards, right, at least from my experience in Washington, you, they said these are conflated, yeah. right? So I think um, it's been very useful for um, in this panel to really, from all, all of your expertise about how we outline that strategy and keep level heads about this stuff um, and delineate our policies clearly and transatlantically. Anyway, um, so um, we're, we're over. Thank you all very much. It was so cold. Yeah.
check. Eins, zwei. Uh, can you hear us here from the... Because I, I, for, for now I can't really hear you. I need to find my headphones first. <laughs> Ich bräuchte tatsächlich mal das Handy, weil ich nicht weiß, wo die Videokonferenz zurückkommt. Das hat hier nicht. Und ich weiß im Moment noch nicht, warum. So, could you please say anything? Oh, yes, yes, oh. now I can hear you, yes. And uh, you can't see me because we're just um, sending out the logo, but now you should see the, 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 the uh, more or less empty room, and you can hear me, okay. And then we're good to go. Um, test works. Okay, see you later.
Mr. Moore, nice to make your acquaintance. You're, you're muted. Yeah, I know. We've been doing this for three years and we're still muted. muted. How are I, you? I know. I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing very well. Where are you joining from? I'm I'm in Berlin. I, I broke my foot over the weekend, so oh I couldn't travel. Uh, sorry. Well, it me? happens, you know. And how about you? Where are you joining from? Uh, Washington. I'm in D.C. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not, I, should, not I, was, too early. yeah. I was actually planning on coming in person, but um, I had uh, immigration things to figure out. So hopefully next time. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And hopefully next time I won't break my foot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, what were you doing? Football? No, I was running. I had, I had a beautiful run through the forest, 17 kilometers. And then 200 meters from the hotel, I tripped over a curb on the, on the road. Yeah. So. Eesh. Eesh. How long did it take you to do 17 km? Uh, well, it was the altitude. There were a lot of hills. So mm. I did an uh, hour and 50 minutes altogether. So. That is still uh, impressive, even with hills. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. yeah. I, I used I, to I, run, I, but I, I can't. Hoping... In 20, yeah. yeah, 2016, I got hit by a car back in Liberia. So now I walk. You know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now I walk. Yeah, things happen. And then, yeah, you got to enjoy the things you can do when you can do them, right? Absolutely. And then, uh, <laughs> but now you enjoy that. I mean, you, there's some great walks in D.C. that you can enjoy, too. Oh, though. definitely. Definitely. So I live in I live in Bethesda. Are you familiar with Right. That? And there's a trail where you can walk on a trail from Bethesda back to D.C. It's about... Cool. Yeah. Each way is about nine miles each way. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not not bad at all. Mm. Oh, that's that's be it's a beautiful country. I, I don't know it very well, but I've visited a few times uh, oh, goodness. Uh, so, with friends. It is. It is very beautiful. And the thing is also, it's like it's a continent sized country. So, mm. you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you can have all kinds of landscapes. So I, uh, I went to undergrad in Kentucky and Kentucky isn't one of the wealthiest states, but mm -hmm. it has a lot of hills and mountains. And in the fall, it is probably one of the most beautiful places I've ever been because when the yeah. leaves change, it's just, it looks like a picture. <laughs> you know, like, sure. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, when I'm not, uh, I mean, as a Canadian diplomat, I go back to Ottawa, and we've got that sort of the rolling hills and the, yeah. the leaves in fall, a little yeah. bit uh, earlier than Kentucky would, but uh, uh, it really is something else. Now it's just cold and snowy, so that's, uh, <laughs> My goodness. which is its own, its own beauty, but uh, yeah. Well, that is just, you know, what I always think about Canada and just the adaptability of humans. So I know a lot of um, Africans who've moved to Canada over the last, say, two decades. Mm -hmm. And I mean, these are people who would complain that it was cold when it was raining back home and they moved yeah. to Canada. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> um, yeah. it, it, it's, uh, but, but yeah, I think on the, just as an aside, on the immigration question, I think Canada is probably the star performer best in class um yeah just Thank both you. in terms yeah. of you know the people to bring but also in integration you mm -hmm. know um, uh, yeah it, it, it's incredible you're a star player um alfonso well, davis you know it, yes this is that's like, right this yeah. is a kid who was born in refugee camp in ghana you know like i mean yeah. it, it's it's and and, and yeah there are many canadians with a story
feel like I should wave to the folks online. Can you see us? All the drinks are for me. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back after the coffee break for the last session of our conference for the last panel, which I think will most likely combine many of the questions we've already been discussing. When uh, William Jefferson Clinton was running his presidential election campaign in another world and in another time, there was, I think, if I remember correctly, that famous slogan, it's the economy, stupid. I think we need to add today it's the environment stupid and of course it's also trade stupid and it's human rights stupid and it's so many other things that we would like to talk about this afternoon and I'm very happy that we have assembled wonderful experts for this panel. I unfortunately have to start with one apology. Nina Scheer, a lawyer, political scientist and excitingly also a musician who had agreed to be on the panel, unfortunately has to excuse herself. She is in the middle of a meeting and of intensive debates, and of course she is excused because she might already implement what we, what we are talking about here, and so she might be ahead of our discussions and debates. I'm all the more happy to welcome here live and in presence Samantha Cross being the director of the uh, Energy Security Initiative at the Brookings Institute. And I, I'm also, you know, very happy and I learned yesterday that you have some German experience, you know, spending time in Berlin uh, with the joint fellowship by the Brookings Institute and the Robert Bosch Foundations. You are a great expert in also international energy politics and if we talk about environment and trade, of course, energy and energy security is a very important aspect. It's the big elephant in the room that we need to talk about. Thank you very much and welcome. My pleasure. I also very much like to welcome Mr. W. Guide Moore. He is a senior fellow at the Center for Global Politics Development. He has been serving as uh, the uh, Minister for uh, Public Work in Liberia and he is very experienced in like policy, in policy making. He has monitored many programs. He is, I think, both familiar with science and politics. And I think you will enrich our debates from your specific perspective. And we are very grateful that you took your time and we welcome you here to our panel virtually. Uh, welcome in Hamburg. Thank you so much. And last but not least, I welcome Andreas Weichert, serving as Minister Councillor for Commerce and Economy Issues at the German Embassy in Canada. So we have another kind of, you know, international perspective in the transatlantic version, which reminds us that, of course, if we talk about transatlantic relationships, it's not only the United States of America, but it's also uh, Canada, and of course we uh, had also to look at the Latin American world and the South American world, which is also, you know, to some different extent, partner countries and sometimes also difficult partner countries on the other side of the Atlantic Oceans. We are very, very happy that we can enjoy and appreciate your diplomatic experience also in this afternoon's panel. Um, Mrs. Cross, if I, if I may start with the maybe most obvious question given <coughs> that panel. We are talking about, you know, trade policy instruments that can complement international economy and international environmental protection and climate mitigation. I think that's the really the tough question, you know, what kind of, you know, real world infrastructure, what do we need? Do we have instruments at hand to kind of, you know, 
reconcile these two maybe biggest issues we face in, in the 21st century, economy and ecology. Because if you look at, you know, the last generation activities and everything, the ecological catastrophe seems to be so threatening that, you know, it might be above everything, but we all also know that without economy we can't survive. So you have the perfect recipe or at least some challenging questions for us. I think the perfect recipe is a difficult thing to ask for. I, I wish that I did. But, I, but I, what I think I want to do is back up the question for just a moment mm -hmm. and point out that what we need to do in order to deal with the climate crisis is a complete remake of our energy system, basically the circulatory system of the entire global economy. And so we need to remember that. And so when we ask trade policy, what can trade policy do to encourage this transition? Um, that is a very, very big role for trade policy to take on. And so as I speak, let's keep that in mind, that we're trying to change the basis of the entire global economy, and that it's a lot to ask specific trade policies to do. But with that in mind, I feel like a lot of more punitive policies are getting attention right now, um, particularly here in Europe, the, uh, the CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. When I spent time in Berlin mm -hmm. last year with the Bosch Stiftung, um, I, I couldn't have a conversation without it coming on back to the CBAM. Um, and I understand why Europe is so excited about that. It is not just intended to reduce the emissions of, project, of, of products that the European Union imports. It also has some additional um, goals on the side that I think are less talked about. An important one being to export European carbon pricing policy. Um, if you have a carbon pricing policy that looks like that in the EU, you're not subject to the CBAM. Um, however, I have to say that mechanisms like the CBAM are going to have a really hard time doing much to decarbonize the industries they care about the most. Um, many of the most carbon intensive industries are also very difficult to decarbonize for technical mm -hmm. reasons. Um, if you look at things like steel, cement, um, ammonia, petrochemicals, those have some very thorny decarbonization issues, which I can go into offline if anybody's curious. But these are also um, high capital cost, low margin industries. And so it is very difficult to make decarbonizing those industries <coughs> bankable, particularly in the developing world. And it's going to require more than something like a CBAM. Um, my suggestion, and we can talk about this more later if you like, would be more market making as well as these punitive type measures. Mm -hmm. um, making sure that you're creating demand for these, these products and lasting demand for these products that then makes the upgrade to produce a low carbon version of those products bankable. Maybe a follow-up question. You mentioned the kind of you know market-based instrument as an alternative to regulatory instruments. Would you see that as a more effective mean that be you know using market-based instruments, trying to really implement ecological strategies, climate change protection mechanisms in in, in trade systems? And would you have maybe kind of you know some examples for that kind of market-based instruments and mechanisms that could provide good incentives? I think there's a place for both mechanisms, actually, uh -huh. because what we're trying to do is quite difficult. And because the, the, the mechanism mm -hmm. here in Europe, the CBAM, is, is, is carrying additional weight, not just trying to decarbonize industry. It's also trying to replace the free allowances that many industries in the EU get right now. And so it's carrying that weight as well. So you're going to need policies like that. But you see, um, in my own country, in the U.S. government, mm -hmm. for instance, um, governments contracting for lower carbon cement, for instance. Um, cement is a very carbon intensive um, material, and it's not just carbon intensive because of its energy use. CO2 is released as a chemical part of the process, so it's a tough one to decarbonize. But the government is working to create markets for low carbon cement to, in turn, incentivize companies to do that. And so I think I think you need both of these, and both of these policies are carrying different portions of the load, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. No, absolutely. I, I could not agree more. Uh, Mr. Moore, if we are talking about that kind of, you know, instruments and maybe also mix of instruments to bring together economy and ecology, what, from your perspective, what be, would be your expectations? What should both 
the European Union and the United States of America may be ideally due to have an effective impact on that kind of, you know, global architecture of a climate change aware trading system. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here and thanks for having me. I, I think I wanted to expand the conversation slightly and say that, you know, as we think about the transatlantic relationship in the past, we've actually thought about Europe and North America, mm -hmm. but much, much of the Western side of Africa is, is in the Atlantic. And so when we're thinking about a transatlantic relationship, we have to ex be more expansive in what we mean by that because Africa itself shares the Atlantic. So on the question of on the question you posed, I want to go back to the first speaker's point that we can't be only punitive. So, uh, for example, uh, um, Gabon is trying now to sell carbon credits by preserving its forests. And, but the, the amount of carbon credits it's bringing to the market is basically roiling the markets because of how much of Gabon is covered in forests. But uh, was it yesterday, uh, two days ago, and the EU passed a law that basically is an extension of that sort of targeting scope three emissions. So anything being imported into the, into the EU that's tied to deforestation. So on the one hand, we have a punitive measure for deforestation. Mm -hmm. This is good because we need to preserve the forest but Gabon struggles to sell its credits for preserving the forest. So one of the tools that we can have here is a mechanism that allows countries, say like Gabon, to be able to sell their credits if we have policies like the EU one that punishes countries for deforestation. But it's not just the EU. The U.S. recently sanctioned um, loggers in Brazil that are, that are def uh, carrying out deforestation in, 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 in the Amazon. So I think uh, to the first speaker's point, it has to be a combination because of how complex the, prob the problem is. It has to be a, com a combination, a suite of tools, so to speak, of both sticks and carrots, of regulations, but mm -hmm. also policies that, so that sort of encourage that. The next thing that I would say here is that <laughs> we have to be more collaborative in what we do. So when the French president landed here, in, I'm in Washington, by the way, mm -hmm. when, the, when the, pre, the French president landed here uh, a, a couple of days ago, the first thing he said was that even though CHIP and the Inflation Reduction Act were meant to be domestic policies, they were actually having significant second order effects on European firms and fracturing the Western relationship. Same thing. If European uh, um, policies, which are meant to be domestic in nature, begin to have an impact on places outside of Europe, then those things have to be formed mm -hmm. in partnership and in collaboration so that it is not having third order effects that essentially have an, 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 an opposite outcome of that which it was intended to do. So th those, those are my, 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 my first comments on, on the question. Thank you very much. I think you also emphasize that we need some kind of mix of instruments like regulation, make it market, market incentives. You have been talking about sanctions, which of course also play an important role. Mr. Weichert, I'd, I'd, lang, <coughs> I'd like to come back to the positive incentives, that kind of, you know, initiatives that without sanctioning, without maybe hard regulation, could try to uh, kind of, you know, enrich trade instruments by uh, climate protection clauses, climate protection mechanisms. And I'd also like to learn more about your perspective on that and maybe also kind of, you know, negotiation practices. If you talk about, you know, international trade agreements, what role does climate protection actually play at the negotiation table? Certainly, thank you very much. And, and it's uh, also a pleasure to, to be uh, here in my living room in Berlin, rather, but be nicer to be in, in Hamburg, of course. Of course. Uh, but uh, well, it's always I, I nice to be in Hamburg. The, broke my foot on the weekend, <laughs> and I would have loved to be there, but that's the way it is. So I sit with my foot up, and uh, and we'll have the virtual conversation. Um, one point of clarification: I am a Canadian diplomat based in Berlin. Uh, I, I believe you you flopped the countries oh, sorry, in yeah. your introduction. No, no, that's uh, no apology. It it, it can happen. Uh, because my very Canadian name uh, sometimes confuses uh, <laughs> I, I, I was mistaken by that, true. But uh, 
but looking at the positive side, first of all, I have to agree with what uh, both of the uh, the other uh, panelists have said to, to this point. I, I mean, key thing is uh, it, any any way forward on the trade and climate issue will have to be done in collaboration to be effective, and it will have to include many parts. Some of them may be punitive. Some of them will be positive. Some of them will be demand-inducing. Um, I, I, I actually broke my foot on a trade mission earlier this week where we were discussing some of these uh, precise issues of how do, we, how do we push new technologies in, for instance, uh, carbon-neutral concrete uh, so that people will be willing or able to pay the higher cost that Initially, new technology always costs more. So how does uh, the trade policy help? How does the uh, industrial support policy uh, help these companies to, to develop uh, new solutions that are good, good for the climate, but then also supported through freer trade? Um, you, you asked how uh, how can a trade agreement uh, where where does this fit on the negotiating mm -hmm. table? You know I will talk about CETA. I, I mentioned it in my tweet. Uh, I was very pleased to be in the Bundestag uh, on the first of December when they uh, took their vote to ratify CETA, and we look forward to the German Parliament, uh, the Upper House, the Bundestag uh, ratifying, and and then maybe the rest of the the uh, European countries who haven't done so yet. CETA includes uh, a, a chapter on the environment, on mutual goals. Um, if I can back up for a moment, the purpose of a free trade agreement or any trade agreement is to provide a foundation for companies to trade. Uh, we want to provide companies with some certainty of how they will be handled in their trading relationship in another country, in another environment. Um, the CETA agreement is, is, I think we agree between the Europeans and Canada, the gold standard for future trade agreements. It includes protections mm -hmm. for the environment, for labor and others. We're talking environment today, so I'll, I'll, I'll stay there. It has a whole chapter devoted to climate protection, to the, 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 the fact that Europeans and Canadians agree on the need to meet our Paris uh, goals, that we agree on the need for freer trade to support innovation and collaboration between countries in Europe and in Canada to quickly develop better solutions uh, towards a cleaner environment. And as, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Samantha, uh, it's all about energy. If we can't fix the energy problem, we, we won't achieve anything. Um, so. So I think CETA leads the way in how a free trade agreement can go. It's, of course, not the only possible uh, trade policy device. Uh, we have, uh, with Germany and with, with some other countries, uh, energy agreements, uh, energy accords where we commit to working towards uh, changing the energy mix, towards going uh, to, to greener supply of energy, uh, uh, both in trade. We have uh, not federal level, but provincial level agreements in trade where we commit to uh, cleaning up ports, mm. cleaning up transport between, across the North Atlantic. Um, this is a problem on the energy scope, but not only, not only energy, but uh, overall environment and health of the oceans. How do we get stuff from America to, uh, and, and I say America by North America here to be clear, um, to Europe? How do we get European and African goods that cross to the Americas? Well, a lot of it's on ships. If we can't power the ships in an energy, uh, a, a climate friendly way, if we can't have the ships crossing the ocean in an ocean friendly way, which mm -hmm. uh, that, that, then we're nowhere. So uh, I think it's terribly important that we, we, we look at instruments which, which encourage that collaboration in a, in a positive way, not a punishing way. Uh, thank you so much. I will get back to the instruments in a minute, but I also would have a follow-up question for you. Uh, 
concerning CETA, and, and you said that it's been maybe a blueprint for modern uh, international free trade agreements, including environmental issues, including human rights issues, labor issues, and so on. And I was also wondering whether you, from your experience, could, could tell us whether you believe or not that that inclusion in particular of uh, climate change issues, environmental issues, might also gain stronger democratic support for free trade agreements in the future because we have seen that we had so hard debates when it came to CETA, when it came, I think, even, even worse when it came to TTIP because public support is not as strong as we hope to be, at least as some hope to be. And is there maybe also some chance for a democratic reconciliation if we say these trade agreements are to some extent also green deals? I would hope so, because I'm an optimist. <laughs> um, CETA has been uh, provisionally in force for just over five years. Mm -hmm. In the EU, it's created 700,000 jobs. Trade is up by over 35%. Um, I, I, and, and it's not damaged the environment. It's not caused a, a, a race to the lowest common denominator of, of labor rules. Um, the, the partners have continued to have legislative control over how they want to legislate in environment and, and in labor uh, areas. Um, I would hope that evidence will speak for itself. Uh, maybe we have to encourage it to mm -hmm. speak for itself. Um, as uh, as uh, nations and uh, trading blocks look at uh, new FTAs with other areas. Um. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, listening to that first round of comments, you know, I think I need to add another. It's the dot 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 stupid. It's the energy stupid. This is something which I also really learned from, from these debates. And that brings me to my next question for Samantha Gross. Is kind of, you know, short term energy protection, making sure that we have sufficient energy in particular in these times of crisis, is that something that we can connect to and maybe reconcile with sustainable energy supplies. I think in public debates, at least in Germany, there is that kind of, you know, some people are very upset that we do not have Russian gas anymore because there is the fear that we will see a decline of wealth and of economic power and others hope that that might be the big turnaround for really greening the energy sector. And that would be my very question. Is that turnaround really feasible? Is that something we are about to do? And what are the kind of, you know, again, infrastructural requirements if we want to reconcile sustainable energy support and short-term energy security? Right. I would start with that with, by saying that short-term ener energy security isn't necessarily incompatible with long-term sustainability and with making the energy transition. However, the events of the past um, year or so have made that more difficult. Um, going back, Russian gas was a very attractive transition fuel for Germany and mm -hmm. for the rest of Europe. Um, particularly when that gas was inexpensive and it was shipped with infrastructure that was already in the ground. And so that looked like a great option. And uh, there were certainly security concerns raised, including by my own government. But I understand why that looked like a good option, um, particularly when you're using that gas to phase out coal on the way to a zero carbon um, electricity system. This makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. However, now we have this problem that you need to feed the energy system you have right now because it can't re be transformed instantaneously. But you've lost this really important source of gas. And that Russian gas, in my opinion, is not coming back. Um, even if you wanted to buy it, Gazprom will never again be a reliable supplier of natural gas. It's over. And this is something that the world and Europe mm -hmm. all need to deal with. Um, so when you're thinking about infrastructure, you need natural gas right now, particularly in this country where the primary uses of natural gas are heating homes and industry. And neither one of those is particularly easy to, play, or to replace. Industry, you're using it because you need very high heat. In homes, you'd have to turn over all those homes' furnaces. I have a friend who lives in Berlin who's on a six-month waiting list to get a heat pump in his house. 
So this is not going to happen quickly. So what you need to think about doing is how can you get more gas into the economy right now in a way that's future friendly? Something I hear a lot is, oh, we'll just convert that, some of that infrastructure to, to use hydrogen later. Mm -hmm. um, that is a possibility, but I want to raise a, raise a big red flag of engineering mm -hmm. from this. And my background is technical, and every time anybody hands me a microphone, I remind people that you can't just put hydrogen through a natural gas pipeline. Um, hydrogen is a tricky, tiny little molecule. Um, it is much, much more prone to leaks than, than um, methane is. It also um, is hard on the metallurgy of a pipeline. You need a very specific metallurgy to ship hydrogen. And so there are some real issues here. If you have a hydrogen leak and it happens to ignite, it burns very hot with an invisible flame. This is stuff you need to be very, very careful with. And so as you're thinking about, we'll just use that for hydrogen later, mm -hmm. make sure that the engineers are in the room and make sure that that is actually feasible. But I don't think these need to, these need to be at odds. It's just thinking about both, how do you deal with the energy system we have today while transitioning? It's walking and chewing gum at the same time. Um, I think that is a, is a very good point to follow up with a question to, to uh, Mr. Moore. The very issue of independence, you know, I think has many facets. If we talk about, you know, energy independence, we talk about the circumstances that are related to natural sciences, how we can gain and create independence. And um, also, of course, the political independence from, from the bad guys all around the world, and in, in particular autocratic states and the uh, Ukraine war taught us a very hard lesson. So, Mr. Moore, if, if, you know, from your perspective, we needed advice, you know, how to establish energy independence, you know, what would be maybe elements for a reasonable mix? And I think also if I hear all the concerns that it might be from my perspective, but I'm in that regard a complete lay person, it might be a smart idea to have a really a portfolio mix so that you can replace one thing by the other in case there is the next crisis coming up. But what is your perspective on that issue? Like how can we become independent even though we see these many dependencies we, we hardly can escape. So thank you. And I think I would just agree with Samantha again. A part of it is how do we construct the energy mix in terms of the, the portfolio? So I'll give you an example. Last week, supposedly the UK produces about 16.4 gigawatts of, of, of wind. And for some reason last week it was reduced to 0.4. 16 gigawatts went offline. That intermittent nature of, of renewables means that there has to be something that generates our base load. At some point, we have to have a conversation about what constitute that mix mm -hmm. so that we're energy independent. Um, so uh, the conversation has to include nuclear. At some mm -hmm. point, we're gonna have a conversation about nuclear as a, as, as a part of this energy mix. I know, um, I mean, we're having this in Germany, so the nuclear question becomes a, a a tricky one, but it's, it's, it's a nuclear it's one in the literal sense. <laughs> I, I, I definitely think that it makes sense. But more importantly, I think we have to take into account the true cost of what the transition looks like and for energy independence. According to the World Bank, the, to, to achieve the Paris Agreement, we're going to need about 3 billion tons of minerals, bauxite, lithium, cobalt, coltan. And, and on that question of minerals, just before I, I address that question, I want to come back to rare earth minerals, where China supposedly mm -hmm. now has about 90% of the market on yeah. rare earth minerals. The problem isn't because rare earth minerals are actually rare. Rare earth minerals are just really dirty when it comes to the extraction and the processing. Absolutely. And for years, we have agreed that if China is willing to internalize the cost of doing that and sell it to us for cheap, we're fine with it. And so because of that, China has built a significant lead in, in, in processing that. It brings me back to the 3 billion tons of minerals that have to be processed for us to be, achieve net zero. The environmental cost of processing that mineral is going to be very, very heavy. So are we willing to pay the true cost of what that means? So, and we think about, uh, and, and then 
most of those minerals are going to be in places so for example you know chile and argentina but also a lot in say guinea bauxite in guinea or lithium or, or cobalt and coltan in the democratic republic of congo how much of the benefits of the extraction in our way to net zero accrues to the populations in the places where we're going to be extracting those minerals so back to your question i think one that energy mix has to be a combination of, of things. The final thing that I would say is for a while, European and American governments were pushing this, no financing for any form of fossil fuel. I think that we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. There are certain things for which right now we still need some fossil fuels, especially natural gas. And again, I keep coming back to Africa because that's where I'm from. Mm -hmm. More than 50% of the population of the continent is involved in some form of agriculture. That agriculture is large, largely unproductive because of the limitation of inputs. If we're going to produce synthetic fertilizer, we need natural gas. So there are certain things for which we have to keep natural gas in our energy mix if we're going to have a, a, a mix that allows us to be independent. And the final thing that I would say is that my, 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 I remember my undergraduate professor saying to me, he was quoting a, a, a European general or, or diplomat saying that the whole purpose of NATO was, you know, to keep Germany in check, <laughs> to keep the Russian out, and to keep the Americans in. And for some reason, even though we had an, an Atlantic uh, uh, alliance that, was supposedly, that supposedly saw the Russians as the existential threat, somehow it made sense to Europe to depend on Russia for its energy. You know, I mean, we're, we're mm -hmm. moving forward now, but it's important for us to understand that. As we move forward, energy independence might be depending on like-minded countries, depending on allies. So if we have a grid, so maybe other countries in Europe are supplying that grid that are able to produce energy more cheaply than others. But we have to think about the security implications as we build our uh, uh, energy mix and one that allows us the amount of freedom and, and, and independence that would be possible going forward. Uh, thank you so much because uh, uh, I'll get back to you in a second. Um, I love your definition of NATO and I'm also very glad that you mentioned the rare earth minerals because to some extent I believe we in Europe are rather naive. We are very happy about, you know, electricity cars and say that is perfect for the environment because we don't smell the dirt and we don't see it. It's happening somewhere else and we are not exactly sure what happens and how it happens. And of course we might, you know, in a couple of decades feel as guilty as we now feeling if we kind of, you know, burn all fossil energies. And I think that is a, that's a very important, very important remark. And you gave another buzzword at the end of your remark. You know, energy security depends on like-minded countries. But is that a realistic perspective if we also need, you know, for our support, for our supplies, countries which may not be, at least not perfectly, like-minded? That, that is something I think we may be about to find out. And I know we've talked a bit today about the, the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States. And one thing that the act does is it encourages the mining and processing mm -hmm. of, of various yeah. critical minerals in the United States and also in countries where we have free trade agreements. Um, we're really hitting on one of the important parts of the transition and another thing I say every time anybody puts a mic in front of me and that is the green energy transition does not in, is not necessarily without environmental problems Absolutely. nor is it without no. emissions or environmental damage. It involves us building things. If we're going to switch to an electricity powered economy, which is what we need, um, we need a larger electricity system and one with a very different shape than the one we have today. I also want to follow up on one of the gentleman's comments about um, the idea of energy independence mm -hmm. versus energy interdependence. Yeah. An electricity system with a lot more renewables on it is quite variable. You spoke of the wind drought that, we, that you saw in the UK recently. Um, that is an argument for a very wide, very interdependent electricity system because weather is, is local or regional. And that allow, it makes it easier to balance the system if you have a very wide grid because um, 
stating the obvious, the weather's different far away. And you may be able to have wind and solar operating in one place when they are not in another. And it makes it easier to balance the grid. So we will continue to be energy interdependent in a greener, low carbon world. Um, it will just look quite different and we will be dependent on different things. Absolutely. Coming, coming back for a second to that dependency issue and the like-minded states and the question to Andreas Weichert again. Uh, Germany uh, needs to supplement, you know, uh, Russian gas and what we did and then we also discussed, of course, very controversially is getting gas from Qatar, getting gas from Saudi Arabia. And at the moment, there's the big debate here in Germany about our typical German hypocrisy. You know, we boycott the soccer championship. Well, now we don't have to boycott anymore because our our team is out anyway, but we felt so guilty. We're not watching, you know, the, the soccer games because they've been that doing very bad things, human rights-wise and so on. And of course, that's very problematic. But at the very same day when the German team is protesting, Qatar announces the gas deal is sealed and you in the future will receive a certain amount of gas and so on. From a Canadian and Northern American perspective, how smart is that German move to now rely on Qatar and Saudi Arabia and countries like that? Or is it maybe not a smart move, but a necessary one because there is no reasonable alternative? What would be your perspective on that kind of you know, German policy? Which I think is in, in particular tricky for our Green Party because the uh, Minister of Economy is a member of that party and he has to be a bit more pragmatic maybe um, than the program uh, he, he, he was elected for. So first I'd have to say that uh, as a Canadian I feel Germany's pain. Uh, we of course exited the World Cup uh, a couple of days before <laughs> Germany did. <laughs> And we don't get to come and play all that often, so it, it, it's even more painful. Um, I'm also sad because Germany's out, because it, now who, who should I watch? I'll, I'll, I'll figure this out. Um, interesting point. Um, and I guess I'd start with, uh, you know, if, if, if any European government had 15 years ago said, gosh, we can't buy all this cheap Russian gas, mm -hmm because, you know, someday it might not be coming. We better go and find some different, more expensive mm -hmm. uh, energy. They would have been voted out of office fairly quickly. Um, so, yeah, in hindsight, it, it, it wasn't such a great idea, but here we are. Um, I think one would want to avoid repeating the mistake of relying on any one player to supply a large proportion of the energy requirement. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me on the Qatar deal. It, it is absolutely of necessity that Europe needs to find a replacement for Russian gas. And quickly, this winter looks like we'll be okay till mm -hmm. February, March. I'm a Canadian, I have many sweaters, but, <laughs> but still, this is not by itself, that's not a solution. Um, next winter may be harder. So uh, I, I think Germany and other European governments need to move quickly to find alternative sources. Uh, because I agree with, uh, with Samantha that, that the Russian energy is never coming back. That's uh, no one will ever rely on, on Russian gas again. Um, and that, that can't be. So I think the way forward is not to go in any one, not, not to go back to taking it all from one country. And, and I think that's the direction that uh, Mr. Havoc is trying to go yeah. in in Germany, um, you know, and then and then advance, uh, as we've already discussed, advance the uh, the move towards alternative future fuels, which address the uh, the climate issue. Um, when Mr. Uh, Schultz and Mr. Havoc had come to Canada in August, we signed a, a, a an intent to to create a hydrogen alliance. Mm -hmm to push the hydrogen, uh, the possibilities of hydrogen forward. Um, it's very ambitious. We'll see uh, how things pan out, but we, we already have uh, collaborations, new collaborations between Germany and, and Canada to see how we can push this along uh, faster than we might have before. Um, 
never never miss the opportunity to use a good crisis for for something useful so i i, I think, think that's, that's a very important and a very comforting remark and using the opportunity um, my next question would be and also maybe you want to start samantha um, if we want that green transformation of trade law do you think the g7 format is a form which would help to do that that maybe from a transatlantic perspective, but widening that, that to the G7 states, that would be an ideal place to try to green trade? In a word, yes. I mean, if you look at the very large um, institutions that the world mm -hmm. is dealing with right now, the WTO, the UN process through the COPS, um, these are thorny, difficult, consensus-based organizations that have a really difficult time getting anything done. Um, you look at a group like the G7, you're with a group of like-minded countries with similar goals and similar economic situations who can agree to do things. Absolutely. And so I, I am very optimistic on, on trade, on climate action that, um, that takes place in these smaller groups. They have the ability to, to work from a place of common interests. They have ability to try things and see how they work before subjecting them on the rest of the world. I think there's a lot to be gained from working in those smaller groups. Um, I only see one drawback for that, which I think I'd be really remiss if I didn't bring up. And that is when you do this work specifically in these smaller groups, you are sort of by necessity neglecting the developing mm -hmm. world. Um, we saw that a lot at the agreement, that, at the meeting that recently mm -hmm. took place in Sharm el Sheikh. Um, I very optimistically told all kinds of news outlets that don't worry too much about what's happening in the negotiating room, the action's on the sidelines. And that's the way these meetings are. But the flip side of that is the developing world, the people yeah. who really need help the most. That action is in the negotiating room where things are thorny. So apart from that one giant challenge, I'm delighted to see the G7 take a lot of these issues on because they can. Yeah. And they have enough agreement to, make things, mm. to actually make things happen. Yeah. No, I think it's a very important remark. They can, they have the institutional infrastructure. But your last remark, like take into account the developing world, that I think is also a very tricky question because I think if we want to make that kind of you know, green transformation work, industrialized countries need to support the developing countries. And that would be my next question to Mr. Moore. Uh, what would be ideal instruments to do that? The German Chancellor brought up the idea of a climate fund. Is that something that you give kind of money? Or is there maybe also needed maybe more? Is there manpower? Is there inst infrastructure support? Is it only money we are talking about? Or is there some kind of maybe a need for a more intensive, really, partnership, including personnel, including know-how, and so on. How can G7 countries really support the developing world in enforcing that environmental law standards, environmental protection, climate protection standards? Yeah, I think on that question, uh, you know, um, one would be the recognition that for a lot of developing countries, the question isn't, about changing the source mm -hmm. of energy, right? In, in most of the developed world, the conversation is moving yeah. away from, from dirtier sources mm -hmm. to cleaner ones. Across much of Africa, it's basically access to energy. Absolutely. And so in those places, mm -hmm. we, it is my view that we have to make allowance for some of the poorest countries to be able to, at least as they're ramping up per capita energy use, to use some uh, fossil fuels, especially natural gas. I think making that allowance is one of the issues. The second one is I would step back and think about think about the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic at its beginning. One of the ways that, at least from the U.S. government side, one of the ways the U.S. government was able to spur innovation in vaccine development was a, a pool mechanism, mm -hmm. an, an economist call a pool mechanism, which is Operation Warp Speed. Now, normally, these would be an advanced market commitment where a government, prompt, where we, we create a market for a product that does not yet exist. But basically, the U.S. government, through warp speed, created an advanced purchase agreement. If you create a vaccine product that gets authorization for emergency use, we will buy this amount. Mm -hmm. Imagine if the G7, all of the countries in the G7, created a massive fund 
that then said, if you were to create a technology that would do this, this would be available. I believe that is a, a mechanism that still exists, that is there. The, the Inflation Re Reduction Act tries to do that. It tries to do that on the domestic level. Imagine a combination of both Europe, the United States, of Japan, creating a pool of fund that promises that if technology is able to develop these performance criteria, this is how much is going to be available just as we did with the vaccines. So I think it is a combination. And the third and most important thing is the sharing of technology with developing countries. Mm -hmm. So for example, the deforestation law I was talking about yesterday, it targets um, oil palm, it targets cocoa, it targets coffee. But we're talking about countries where up to 60% of national revenue comes from co cocoa and yeah. coffee. And so if there is no technology trans uh, uh, transfer for these countries and they're facing these high hurdles to try to access the, U the, the, U the EU market, you can imagine then it is almost as if the EU policy is intentionally impoverishing people. And so as we think about these mechanisms, it is important to Samantha's point that as much as a, a smaller forum like the G7 gives us a lot of flexibility and agility, we should also take into account that, you know, between now and, and 2050, uh, I mean, more than 50%, about 50% of the increase in human population is expected to occur in, in, in Africa. If that is happening, then the demand for the economy for Africa to grow to accommodate those numbers is going mm -hmm. to be really, really big. So as we try to become greener, we cannot ignore the development initiatives and imperatives of countries in that part of the world. Thank you so much. I I find also very interesting, and there is a debate also going on in Europe, to refer to the COVID-19 mechanisms and to see whether one can make use of the instrument that have been developed there for uh, climate protection. Mr. Weichert, is that from your perspective also something one should follow up is the kind of, you know, economic impact Western countries have shown when it came to the invention and the distribution of a vaccine. Is that something that could be a kind of a blueprint for how we could structure a climate fund and kind of implement climate protection instruments in international trade? Yes, I, I, I certainly think that we need to look at these, uh, these mechanisms. It's, it's, um, it's well and good for, for Europe and, and North America to have agreements and, and have uh, secret handshakes, but we won't achieve uh, the climate objectives if we are not taking into account uh, the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, an anecdote, uh, you know, of course, with, with social media, one is in touch with many, uh, many people from one's past. And I, I I find it interesting when I when I see some uh, from my uh, old small town and they say, "What's the point? What is the point of all, all this climate uh, stuff? Uh, Canada does uh, one or two percent mm -hmm. of uh, global emissions, and uh, any change we make won't make any difference." China, we if we can't do it with China, if we can't do it with uh, Asia, if mm -hmm. we can't do it with Africa, then there's no point. And my argument to that is always, well, there is a point because we need. As an industrialized G7 nation, we need to show the leadership that things can make a difference, that things can be done. Yeah. And we have to do it in such a way that brings along those that may not have the, the, uh, the, the resources, the, the, the um, economy, uh, economy resources to do it themselves. So the creation of a fund that recognizes uh, recognizes efforts to reduce uh, carbon emissions. Um, United States last week and in the context of the visit there was the, the big debate at least in Europe about European anxieties about American uh, the, the American government subsidizing American companies who invest in green technologies and that could be detrimental you know for a balanced trade regime between Europe and the United States of America and of course here I find we argue in a way of a dilemma because on the one side we endorse all these kind of subsidies because we want to invent new technologies we want to make possible transformation but on the other side we are kind of afraid of the economic disadvantages that that, that might create you know 
you know, if you had to advise, you know, negotiators and, 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 and cooperation partners in both sides of the Atlantic in that regard, what would your advice sound like? You know, I'll say a, a few brief words about the IRA and how it came about. And hopefully we can, you, you can take something away from that. Um, one of them is that, as, as we talked about in the last panel, um, people in Washington are absolutely obsessed with China. China does industrial policy. Mm -hmm. There is a reason why China is the world leader in solar mm -hmm. panels and absolutely crushing the market in um, critical minerals and particularly in critical minerals refining. Um, in order to diversify the marketplace and, and, to, and to provide these kind of materials, not just for our own economy, but for Europe and other places, it is important that these markets be diversified. And the US doing some industrial policy is a way to make that happen. Um, we are in a world where a huge country is doing serious industrial policy, and it's very difficult to operate in that world without doing some of that ourselves. Um, I will say that there are parts of the policy that perhaps weren't quite as well thought through or negotiated. Um, I've had a lot of people in my office recently, not just from Europe, but from Asia as well, giving me an absolute earful about some of the um, IRA's provisions. Part of this happened because this was a strike while the iron was hot moment for US politics. It needed to happen, it needed to happen right then. And so could things have been done slightly better? Yeah. but. I'm very grateful that the law got done. I understand how it got done the way that it did. And I also need to say a little something about US politics here. And that is we're getting an earful from the Europeans. We don't like these subsidies. Um, we can't do a carbon market the way mm -hmm. you can politically. We just can't. So because of our politics and the way this law needed to pass, we needed to do it with a lot of carrots. That's the way we were able to get work done politically in the United States. Um, and now we're catching hell for it. And as an American, something I feel like it's important to say is we had to do something, mm -hmm. and these are the tools that we have. And so as you work with us to try to find a way to work transatlantically within the structure of this law, realize that we had to work with the toolkit that we had. And I, as an American, am kind of grateful that we did. Thank you very much. And then also to, to expand that question a bit to Mr. Moore and Mr. Weichert also, that kind of, you know, green subsidies as a mean of, you know, transformation and also support supporting maybe trade policies, would you, would you think that's an adequate mean or is there also a shortcom shortcoming to that green subsidies? Mr. Mo. Well, for every, every, I mean, all of us who've been in policy, we understand that for every policy, there are trade-offs, right? And yeah, so of course. Ultimately, the way we design them, if we have the time, is to be able to limit the second and third order effects, especially of those trade-offs. I should say, though, that, you know, what is the internet whether it's GPS, whether it's chip making and mm -hmm. everything that's come out, it's come out of significant amounts of research money from the U.S. government through DARPA, through U.S. universities. And in a way, the IRA was, was supposed to, was, was in that, in that, that, that tradition mm -hmm. of, of significant financing from the federal government to, to research, to spur innovation. Obviously, as Samantha said, it could have been done a, a better but part of it was, you know, made in China in 2025, frightened people here in Washington, right? China dual circulation that saw China replacing the United States at the center, as the center of global trade. It, it, so we, as, even as we think about the international implications, one has to think about the domestic implications too. Second thing is, but that's not new, right? You have in Germany, you have a made in Germany industrial 2030, HMK. I mean, every country does some uh, form of industrial policy. I, as, as allies, though, I think it's important that industrial policies, the second order effects, are not as destructive for the rest of the world. And so maybe there are things that we can be, can be done now to try to limit that. But I think, you know, because of the, I, I, I would say this, between, 20, end, uh, between the end of 2019 and, say, the end of last year, we had spent, I mean, globally, over $10 trillion because of COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. That is how big the threat was. And because our perception of the threat was that big, we were willing to spend $10 trillion in a three year period, more than $10 trillion. The climate crisis is greater than COVID, but simply because it is, it is gradual 
and because the effect is not felt immediately as it were, we're not spending as much. So when we think about the kinds of subsidies that are required, imagine that we spend over $10 trillion around COVID alone and we're facing a crisis significantly greater than COVID. We're gonna need more of those. They have to be smarter though, so that the outcome is not as destructive as, as what we intended to be. Thank you very much. Mr. Weichert, would you see a chance, uh, talking about industry politics, to a chance to develop a cooperative transatlantic industry policy, or is competition just too big, our national interest just too big to really do that in a cooperative way? Well, gosh, that's, that's uh, something to think about. Um, no, that was I my think, intention. I think we can. <laughs> I, I, thank you. No, that's good. Um, I, I, no, listen, we're, we're like-minded. Uh, that word's been, been mm -hmm. brought out yeah. already. Our Deputy Prime Minister spoke uh, fairly recently, I guess about six weeks ago, about how important, uh, you know, given what's going on in, in uh, Eastern Europe, given uh, Russia's uh, war of aggression, that it's time to... to do more with like-minded states. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the, the, the problems Europe has had with, with IRA is the lack of consultation. Yeah. Fine, there's a timeline, mm -hmm. it had to be done the mm -hmm. way it is. I, 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 I'm not, the, not an expert with that. I think the best types of trade policy that we can develop going forward that support both the trade and the much more important climate elements are going to be those that we work on collaboratively. Um, and, and I think that's, that's obvious. Those are the ones that uh, bringing partners in uh, from other parts of the world to, to work together, maybe a, a, a three-way partnership mm -hmm. to address a specific problem that helps. Uh, those will be the policies that I think will really help us get over the finish line. Um, you had asked uh, me earlier whether I thought the inclusion of climate objectives in trade agreements mm -hmm. could help sell trade agreements. Yeah. I, I'd put that on its head. I, I would hope that trade agreements can sell the importance of the climate objectives. Um, as Mr. Moore just said, this is a much bigger problem than what we've been dealing with uh, medically for the last three years. And yet the urgency is still missing. Uh, in a lot of the population, how do we how do we get them on board um, to support some of these decisions? To to support the idea that well we're going to subsidize uh, certain activities uh, in a certain way. I, I think the example Mr. Moore gave of, of uh, some of the innovation and the research. There's a whole lot of research that developed great things that would never have happened if there were not. Uh, programs to encourage research and research partnerships between uh, countries, not just within countries. Um, I guess the last thing I'd say about subsidies, uh, which was your original question, not to me, um, the bad policy gives subsidies to people for doing what they were going to do anyway. Um, and, and one hopes that future collaborative development of, of uh, industrial policy and trade policy, if there are subsidies involved, that we're going to use them to change behavior in, in the climate sphere. I very much like the turnaround saying that, you know, it's not only the question whether, you know, uh, greening could make uh, trade agreements more attractive, but the other way around, the international trade also can shed a light on the high importance of climate protections regarding the actors who might not be that aware. And I think maybe there is also a certain degree of short-mindedness in Europe because we have the big climate demonstration and, you know, Fridays for Future and Last Generation and so on and so forth. But sometimes we believe that, you know, people all around the world would react in the very same way. But if we honestly look at our own population, it's not the majority opinion that they would, you know, run for the climate and only the climate and therefore I think that way kind of you know of mutually learning and and sending the message how big the crisis is is something of utmost importance however I think we already spoke quite a lot and I'd like to open uh, the round of questions to the audience yeah Mrs. Oud you'd be the first please
Thank you for an excellent panel, very enlightening discussions. I'd, I'd like to continue on the topic of um, dilemmas, dependencies, and trade-offs. And it's a question for any and all of the panelists. Um, namely, um, the fact that we depend on rare earth elements from uh, China for production of solar panels. And uh, John Kerry, the US climate envoy, he was a journalist at the COP26, raised the question um, to him about uh, whether he had raised uh, the issue of, of human rights and forced labor uh, from Xinjiang in the solar panel industry with his Chinese counterparts. And his very unsatisfactory answer, in my view, was, that's not my lane. My job is to be the climate guy. <laughs> so I was wondering what would be a more satisfactory answer to that question, uh, to that dilemma? Um, do you, what would be your advice for EU and US policymakers and businesses to address this dilemma if we get very concrete about solar panels uh, specifically? Uh, I mean, of course, the long term answer is we need to reduce our dependencies, but what's a more short short term um, uh, measure that you uh, could see to address environmental and human rights crises at the same time uh, or is it a necessary trade-off that we need to do um, so that's my question maybe we start the other way around mr weichert you'll be the first to give a comment on that question sure um, from a policy side one, one can, with domestic industrial policy, address that. Uh, Germany has a supply chain law since last uh, June, uh, which requires the company buying the solar panel here to consider what's happened up the supply chain through, uh, through the factories in, in China. Um, that's one way. Uh, Yes, I'll, I'll say diversification. I'll put a pitch in for Canada. We have all the same rare earths. We, we, we look to develop those uh, once we can find a good way to get them out of the ground and, and uh, a clean way to enrich them. Um, but, uh, but that would be a policy address that, that Germany is, uh, is working uh, with uh, that uh, could be adopted if it works. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Well, I think a part of the story for the expansion and uptake of solar is a German one. Uh, for mm -hmm. a long time, the German government subsidized it and actually made it competitive in a time when it wasn't, uh, it wasn't competitive and it was very expensive. So that was you know, intentional government mm -hmm. policy that led to that outcome. So I think that's one of the ways to be able to do it here. Again, it comes back to this thing that, you know, the extraction and processing and enriching of minerals is a very environmentally dirty process. So one is investing in ways that we can, because eventually um, if our trade agreements are going to match our values, then, then it will come with cost, <laughs> right? So, Absolutely. you know, if, if we want to continue to have cheap solar panels, cheap uh, electronics, then whether we like it or not, even if we pay little for it somewhere else, some, at the back end of it, someone else is paying more for it. So I think uh, the way to address that would be through uh, um, industrial policy, like, like, uh, like Andrea said. A very important point. Thank you for that. There is no free lunch argument, which we sometimes tend to forget. Samantha. I'll just add, I completely agree that industrial policy is the right way to do this in the longer term. And I think we're moving in that direction, um, which I am grateful for. Um, but in the short term, this is awful. This is one of those just wicked problems in that um, a lot of the world's solar panel supply um, is connected to that region of China. And I honestly do not know how to make that moral trade-off 
between the need for those panels now to reduce emissions into the environment and the fact that, and the forced labor that it's occur that's occurring there. Um, it's very flip to say that's above my pay grade, but it, it's deeper than that. I don't know how to make that trade off, but I am at least grateful to see us putting the policy in place. Yeah. None of these minerals are rare, and I'd like to think mm -hmm. that if we do them in our own countries, we can do a better job. Yeah. And so that we're moving in the right direction, but I do not know what to do with the situation we're in now. Yeah, maybe that is also an answer that we got to live, you know, every generation maybe with a certain amount of dilemmas. But I think it, it, it's also a first step to be aware of the, the, the dilemmas and not to hide in total hypocrisy. The next question is from a colleague from Australia, Shakat Alam. We are very happy to also have that voice of, you know, also being a neighbor of China. And China was, you know, talked about quite often today. The floor is yours. Thank you for your question. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to ask this question. And, and it's a fascinating discussion. And, and it is so many interrelated aspects, um, uh, the climate change, development, environment. Uh, um, I, I would like to make a few comments uh, for our discussions and wanted to reflect on the issues that we are discussing today. These are not new, and, and I think we, we refer to a couple of men, um, dimensions that we need to uh, open this dialogue between uh, different, uh, you know, uh, agencies, policymakers, and institutions uh, like WTO and uh, UN and environmental institutions. Actually, it was part of the Doha negotiation, uh, and that mentioned that there should be more, you know, uh, the, the relationship between multilateral environmental agreements and the trade agreement should be. Um, examined in, and to make them mutually uh, supportive um, so that they don't have a conflicting policy objectives. Referring to the trade itself, I think we are trying to get some of those solutions outside of the institutional framework, which is sometimes the problem. Uh, because I think within the WTO, if you look at that, they have some um, options to deal with those challenges. You know, in WTO, they have provided provisions, and, and I refer to get Article uh, 20, which is often considered as an exception, um, to, to promote or, or address environmental issues, social issues, you know, labor standards or human rights. However, those um, articles were interpreted so narrowly, you know, hardly any um, environmentally motivated um, the measure uh, could actually pass through different sort of conditionalities. And we have so many cases in the WTO. Uh, we have tuna dolphin, shrimp turtle, you know, um, the gasoline case and beef hormone disputes and so, so on. Um, but I thought the, 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 the systemic change, if we could look at this subsidy within the WTO context, you know, we could address some of those um, uh, problems we are talking about, the green sus subsidies, and, and if we have, if we could expand uh, the scope of get Article 20 exceptions, you know, including, you know, the environmental goods and services um, in that one and, and allow differential treatment, you know, to, to address climate change. Um, that could actually resolve a lot of these sort of uh, contested issues within the WTO. Um, and the second uh, comment I would like to make that I think we discussed about that you, um, Professor, you mentioned that uh, what can we do for the Global South in this transition? Is this a mm -hmm. special fund? And uh, uh, Mr. Moore also responded to that. I think within the WTO framework and also other frameworks, there are options for developing countries, which they are asking for market access. And they're asking for the sort of preferential treatment or whether it be it in the GSP, mm -hmm. Uh, context or other contexts, they also had provisions for technological assistance and financial transfer. And that has not been actually implemented um, within the WTO agreements and treaties. So I have um, two questions. One is um, that we have seen the great initiative like CEDA, um, and, and it is outside the WTO, we have seen that they are incorporating environmental and social provisions in the trade agreements. It's, it's a great uh, example.
But my question is that the extent to which the trades happening beyond CETA and beyond WTO through bilateral uh, investment treaties or trade agreements, how much of those agreements you think that incorporate this sort of environmental impact assessments or social impact assessments in their framework? Uh, and is it something that we can regulate? So that is this one question. And second question is, do you think that for the global south, um, is there any better way that we can integrate them? We talked about the partnership. We talked about that we need to um, take into account mm -hmm. their perspectives and values. But how best we can integrate them into sort of trading system, you know, so that we see their uh, priorities, we see their values and their challenges. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much also for including the WTO perspective, which I also had in mind, but I was asking the G7 question. WTO could have been another obvious candidate. And maybe this time we start with uh, Mr. Moore, but also, of course, the other panelists are welcome to give comments on that thought. And then I've seen another question, and, you know, and there is a number two. I think if we then start collecting these questions, we will be ready for a final round. But first, Mr. Moore. So I, 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 I'll try to be quick with this. One is we, we, you know, we talk about an international system or the international order as if it is natural. It just grows mm -hmm. like an avocado tree. This system, this order was created at the end of World War II to preserve the inner, to, to, so that we would not go to war anymore. The European Coal and Steel Commission evolves into the European uh, Union and everything we have to do with the European project. So. What, what, what we know then is that as the circumstances around us changed, we built new institutions to accommodate those circumstances. Climate has become a way, climate has become such a big part of our lives in a way it wasn't in 1945. So institutions that were built in 1945 were not built mm -hmm. to tackle the, the climate question. So it means as we think about going forward, what is the WTO, the UN, all the international financial systems like you know, World Bank, IMF, and the European Investment Bank, we have to deeply think about, are they still fit for purpose? Do we have mm -hmm. to make changes to them so that they can accommodate the, 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 the crisis of our time? And, and on the question of whether you know, the environmental and social um, protections that are in the uh, CETA, if, if they have an impact on trade that occurs outside of that. Look, GDPR was targeted for Europe, but GDPR ended up affecting the entire world if mm -hmm. your data was going to be processed through European or if you were going to have access to the European market. So there are times when standards developed in Europe end up becoming global ones because of the, the pull of the European yeah. market. And so I think... Uh, uh, whether it is practiced now, I, I think we're, it's on the right track and we should continue to go down that path. Thank you. Some comments on your side? Or? Yeah, I'll just add a really brief comment. I'm not a trade economist, I'm an energy geek, and so I'm just going to answer one part of that question. And that is sort of how to integrate the, the global south better into the economy. And, the, question, and the, the answer to that is they need access to modern energy services. There are nearly a billion people um, in the world today who do not have access to electricity. There are about that many people who cook over, um, over, over wood and dung and natural sources. Um, these people need access to modern energy that will allow them to participate in the economy. And this is the reason why I get asked fairly frequently, you know, as we solve the climate problem, is the world going to use less energy? And um, I say no. Depending on the audience, I had an expletive. Um, the world needs to use a lot more energy because all of these people need access to energy to participate in our global economy. They deserve to have better lives. They deserve to participate in the economy. And that involves energy. So we have this dual problem. It's not just that we need a, a zero or very low carbon energy system. We need a bigger energy system because a lot of these people don't have modern services now. And they need them to participate in the global economy. Thank you so much. Andreas Weichert. Yes, thank you. Um, I guess to the question of how can the CETA uh, as, as a, a trade agreement encourage uh, some of these uh, terms in, in environment and, and, and social, uh, uh, sorry, labor protection, um, I guess there's two ways. One, one from the Canadian perspective 
that's our template. If we start down the path of negotiating a new free trade agreement, we're starting with the template of what we negotiated with the EU. Um, so that would be one way in which these protections will be propagated from our side. And I think the EU is also looking at the text quite closely and using it when it's starting new negotiations. So in that way, it is spreading simply by virtue of having been negotiated as a uh, gold-plated standard for what a free trade agreement that is um, comprehensive and inclusive can look like. Um, I think the second way that it, uh, that it achieves this purpose is um, EU and Canada uh, is this reasonably decent amount of trade going back and forth. As that trade becomes more sensitive to the objective of uh, 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 preserving the climate of, of achieving our climate goals under uh, uh, under under Tokyo uh, under Kyoto, um, that will make the difference uh, outside of the trading block as well, because the more you trade in a good, the cheaper it's going to get eventually. If you've got the demand, we talked about demand at the very beginning of this session. If we create the demand for for a carbon neutral concrete, if we create the demand for more electrical vehicles. That's not going to be limited to the trading block that has a free trade agreement. It, it will go beyond that. Thank you very much. Before I open the round for last questions, I would like to make an interim remark. I, as a lawyer, learned quite a lot from the combination of natural sciences expertise and political expertise. I think that's exactly the combination that we do need for these talks to, to also make a strong statement for science-based political debates and discussions and what Mr. Moore said that you know our investment in the future is also an investment in science. I think that could not be emphasized enough that is really so important and also to have the natural scientists at the table and have their expertise that we are not kind, you know, in, in lofty rooms talking about things which do not have to do anything with empirical grounding and therefore I appreciate that so much. Thank you so much for being here and having you. Now the last questions, please. You are first. Uh, thank you very much. My question goes to Mr. Moore and uh, Mrs. Gross. Um, <coughs> following your um, views, would you agree that we are here in Europe and in Germany in particular living with a basket full of little lies? <laughs> uh, I, would, I would become more precise. I mean, talking about solar panels. I mean, sh shouldn't we thank China for uh, providing us with so many cheap solar panels that helped us to uh, have solar uh, energy and have a considerable um, uh, rate of solar energy both in the US as well as in Europe? Uh, and, 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 and shouldn't we say thank you to China to do all this dirty exploration? I know that our companies mm -hmm. withdrew from exploration because there was so mm -hmm. much pressure from, from politics. Uh, shouldn't we uh, also uh, say um, that regarding our great goals for 2035, 2050 and whatsoever, forget about it uh, due to the current developments and also uh, regarding the transformation of uh, uh, liquid gas into uh, hydrogen. I mean, I know your arguments. So why is there no uh, other public opinion? Why is there so much propaganda on our side? And, all, and, and I would like to add another thing. Is it a smart strategy then to match subsidies, foreign subsidies by domestic subsidies using taxpayers' money and all uh, bureaucrats heading in the same direction? So where will we end in this regard? And, uh, um, and my, my final remark goes um, to the Article 20. I mean, I contradict you uh, completely because uh, I have looked into dispute settlement. I know a lot about appellate body decisions and in the past, in the WTO, there has been a very smart balance between divergent arguments. So everything has been discussed very deeply. So it is a very complicated system. It's a slow system because it's a careful balance. But don't underestimate the ability of the WTO experts to balance arguments. So if you overstretch, and the same goes with Article 21, Article 20, and say everything is fine if it's uh, for social justice or for environmental reasons, you can forget about global trade order, to be crystal clear on that, because you find any argument to do something in politics, and you say it's, it's for social reasons, it's for environmental reasons, and you can invent any kind of protectionism. So I very much warn against overstretching Article 20. 
Thank you very much. I, I like your little metaphor of the little lies in the basket. That's a perfect euphemism for hypocrisy. Wonderful. Please. Thank you. Um, I'll speak now as uh, Secretary General of this French NGO, Energie franco Monde. And as I heard some, I think, skeptical remarks which were reinforced now by the representative of the German um, Ministry for Economy, Climate and Energy. Um, and what Ms. Mrs. Gross said about hydrogen and Mr. Weichert about the next winter, which will be very difficult. Um, 2019, before the pandemic, Dr. Greichen, who was then the head of the think tank um, Agora Energiewende Berlin, is now the leading Council of the current minister gave a presentation which was a um, hydrogen orgy. And me, as a simple engineer, I didn't quite believe it because already the goals for 2020 Germany didn't meet. These were then goals for 2030. So I don't know if they want to answer uh, Mrs. Gross or Mr. Weichert, but don't you? think that a lot of these uh, policies are a bit of dreams and isn't Germany now hitting the, the hard um, reality? One has to remark that Qatar, I think, will give 2 or 3 percent and that only in a few years. There's also this very interesting project from Quebec um, that would be um, interesting to hear probably a view about Mr. Weichert, but it will not replace 55% of gas from um, Russia. Well, the French position, I will not go on that. It would be, have been nice that Mr. Macron would have been probably sort of the spearhead of Europe. What I read was he was mainly representative of France, but that is another subject. We are in Germany now, so if they would... Um, be so courageous to answer in Germany this German question, I would be very happy about that. Thank you so much. And that, I think, concludes our question session. I'm now very happy. Maybe we start with Mr. Moore, Mr. Weichert, and then Mrs. Gross last, but definitely not least. Mr. Moore. So I'm just going to, I'm going to respond to the little basket of lies as, as, best, <laughs> as, as best as I can. I think the order we built after 1945, Europe by and large outsourced its security to the United States. And in that process, um, Europe sort of became tied to US national, uh, national interests, whether Europe wanted to or not. And since 2019, the national defense strategy saw China as a, as a peer competitor. Consequently, if the US um, and, and once the US sees China as a competitor, then it becomes a zero sum game. And more often than not, Europe is going to come along with the U.S. Maybe kicking and screaming, but you know, Europe comes along with the U.S. And so that's the, the, the rhetoric you're talking about about China, and I think that's it. So that's the first point. The second point, though, is that for global public goods, you know, yeah. responding to a pandemic, mm -hmm. a climate issue, there should be areas that allow for collaboration or for cooperation. China is just 1.4 billion people and they have to live in the same world that we do. And so is, there is no climate solution without the contribution of the Chinese. And so I think as we think about this problem, yeah, there are spheres in which China is a competitor to Europe and the United States. But I think in the pursuit of achieving global public goods, we ought to be cooperating with China. Thank you so much. I think. It's also very important to mention the whole idea of global public goods, which would open a totally new room for debates and discussions and maybe in our next conference in two years, we also can have that on the agenda as a follow-up. I think that would be a wonderful idea. Mr. Weichert. You got to unmute. You did, Andreas. <laughs> So somebody had to do that once, right? There, there we are. I slid it in at the tail end. Um, I, I, in a way, I just have the, the easy piece. I don't need to tackle WTO reform. So uh, I'll, I'll just talk about energy reform and hydrogen in two years. Um, 
The short answer, no. We, we, 55% of energy in uh, replacement by 2025, that won't happen. But if we don't try now, it won't happen in 2030, and it won't happen in 2035, and it won't happen in 2040. When hydrogen started becoming a big topic again, and I would say two, three, maybe four years ago, I am a curious individual. I jumped on the internet and I thought, I wonder if I could convert my car to hydrogen. And I actually found a do-it-yourself manual with parts you can buy at your hardware store. Uh, and I downloaded it because I thought that's really cool. Um, I was surprised though, because the front page of it said, hydrogen, convert your car to hydrogen fuel of the future. It was dated 2004. So it's been the fuel of the future for a very long time. And maybe now is the time when we grease the wheels a bit and actually do something to make it the fuel of the future. Um, the hydrogen uh, agreement that uh, Canada and Germany signed tries to do that. Um, we will deliver the first green hydrogen to Germany in 2025. Uh, we will certainly try very hard to be doing so. Um, once it's running, then then scale up. Uh, but if you don't if you don't get it started sometime, it's never going to happen. I think that's a wonderful remark once it's running. But I'm quite happy that I don't own a car if I hear that story because I would not be able to convert it from anything in anything, <laughs> let alone hydrogen, whatever. From a natural sciences perspective. Okay, I think I might be about to make myself rather unpopular, so I'll <laughs> ask you to hold your rotten fruit until the end. Um, I'm going to start with the hydrogen smaller portion of the question and then move outward. Um, it is really helpful whenever we talk about hydrogen to say what hydrogen is and what it is not. Hydrogen is not a fuel. Hydrogen is an energy carrier. It's like electricity. It's not like gasoline. You have to make hydrogen for something else. You don't go out and mine hydrogen or drill for hydrogen. Um, thus, because you're making it from something else, if you can use that something else more efficiently, you should. In the case of green hydrogen, it is made from electricity. Um, green electricity, renewable electricity. If you can use that renewable electricity, you should, always, because it costs energy to turn that green electricity into hydrogen. Hydrogen has qualities that are useful, which is why we talk about it all the time. Um, it acts like a fuel. You can ship it, you can burn it, you can store it. And for those reasons, it can be a way to store electricity or you can use it in applications where you need something that looks like a fuel. So when I hear hydrogen is the future, I feel like it's somebody looking for yet another silver bullet. We fixed the problem, we found the world's smallest molecule and we're good to go. Um, there is no silver bullet. If there was, we would have shot it already. What we have is silver buckshot, and, and um, hydrogen is one piece of that silver buckshot. An important one, but still only one piece. Um, the other thing that makes me rather unpopular is I think there's some truth in the whether you're talking about a basket of lies or whether you're talking about, um, you know, dreams. I do see a lot of wishful thinking in German climate policy. Genuinely, I do. I, I gave a talk when I was living in Berlin last year um, where I talked about what I liked and didn't like and the advantages and disadvantages of the American and German approach to climate policy. And at least at that time, I got there's an advantage to the American approach. But the advantage is that Americans are practical. I realize I'm, I've, I've lived and worked all over the world. I'm an incredibly practical person, and I'm very, very American. Um, Germans have such trust in technology and such trust in their engineering profession that they're just like, we can promise something and the engineers will figure it out. <laughs> and, and I hear that from German policymakers. Literally, we have the best engineers in the world and they'll figure it out. Um, I'm concerned about that. And I'm also concerned about the German focus on technological purity. I see some potential technologies being eliminated because the German public, and, and it's okay to be opposed to technologies. Nuclear is incredibly controversial. I don't. I, I understand that. Um, carbon capture and storage, I hear in this country. Oh, we don't want that. It creates waste and we're anti-waste. Well, at some point, if you're fighting the battle with several technologies tied behind your back, you're raising the level of difficulty while trying to meet, meet an incredibly difficult goal. 
You can choose to do that if you want. But do realize that it is making the problem more difficult and that, you know, when it comes down to it, the political situation in my country is a real mess, but I do appreciate our fundamental practicality. And I would like to recommend a little bit more practicality to the German public and its policymakers as they work towards their lofty but necessary goals. And um, before the rotten fruit starts flying, I think I'll stop. No, thank you very much. It's been an incredibly wonderful and insightful panel. I'm also very happy that we had some controversies and that everybody is agreeing on everything. I think that also gives proof that this is really a scientific conference. I thank you very, very much. And, you know, if I had to summarize as a lawyer and being the total layperson, the panel, in one sentence, it would be the sentence, whatever we get started with, it's not the silver bullet. Thank you so much and enjoy a wonderful evening back there. And everybody else is very much invited. Unfortunately, you can't join us tonight to the Senate reception at 7 o'clock in the uh, Rathaus in the town hall. We are looking forward to your participation. It will be an interesting evening of getting together and there will be another speech which I think can sum up and round up the, I think, rich results of today. Uh, thank you again from my side and also from my side to all those who helped to organize. Thank you to all the panels. Thank you to our esteemed speakers, to all the staff who made it possible. If you have to leave, have a wonderful evening. Hopefully see you back in two hours at the Rathaus at 7 o'clock. Auf Wiedersehen. Farewell. Bye-bye. Au revoir. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.